Now it's time to download and install an ID. Enter our discourse I'm going to use an ID called IntelliJ ID, which is an ID made by a company called JetBrains. Now you may be wondering what is an ID. An ID is, stands for an integrated development environment. And it's basically the tool that you're going to use to write a code in. And IntelliJ ID is like a text editor, but a very sophisticated one because it has a lot of features like highlighting our code, showing real-time errors and suggestions. You can run and compile your code just by a few clicks. In other words, it's making the process of writing code easier and better. Therefore, let's download IntelliJ ID. So I'm going to open my browser. And in the search bar, we type IntelliJ ID. Press Enter. And we click on this download link. And on the downloading page, you're going to see two options. Ultimate, which is paid, so you need to pay in order to download it. And Community, which is free. And uh, the difference is that the Ultimate has more features and Community has less features, but Community is not for our purposes. Also, pay attention on the left-hand side. When I'm currently recording this video, the latest version is 2021.1.2, which was released on the 1st June of 2022. And if you look at the system requirements here, if you click on that, you will see that this IntelliJ ID only works for a 64-bit version of Windows. So if you have a 32-bit version of Windows, this will not uh, work for you. Now, if you have Mac OS or Linux, uh, you should download the particular version for your system. And uh, if you don't know how, just uh, tell me in the comments and I will make two separate videos and I'll show you how to do. Now, I'm going to download the community version for Windows. So click to download the community. Now, our downloading, our downloading is starting on the right and side on the top and if you have a different browser you will see this in a different place so once the downloading is finished just open this file I'm gonna close the browser now because I don't need the browser and the installation will start immediately now it's asking us if you allow this app to make changes to our device click yes here we need to click on next this is the folder location where IntelliJ ID is going to be installed. You can keep the default location or you can change it if you want. I'm going to keep the default location. So I'm going to click on next. And here I'm going to check this box to have a desktop shortcut. I'm going to click on next. Now I'm going to click on install and IntelliJ ID is going to be installed on my computer. As you can see on the left hand side, IntelliJ already appeared. Now let's wait until the installation finishes. When the installation finishes, just check this Run IntelliJ ID Community Edition and click on Finish. Now IntelliJ, IntelliJ ID is going to open. Now it's asking us if you want to import IntelliJ settings. So if you had the previous version of IntelliJ ID, you can import the settings here. But I'm going to click Do Not Import Settings and click on OK. Now IntelliJ ID is going to open. And uh, this is the welcome window of IntelliJ ID. And here on the left hand side, click on Customize. Go here where it says color team, so you can change this team because the default team is this dark team. I'm going to change it to light because the IntelliJ light team is better for tutorials. But you can keep the dark team uh, if you want. And uh, in a separate video, I'm going to show you how to add more teams, not just the ones provided by IntelliJ ID. Now, click back on projects. Click on this plus button where it says new project because we need to configure the JDK now. And now here we have JDK and we have in red... In angle brackets, we have no JD, no SDK. And now, here we need to add the JDK. And JDK stands for Java Development Kit. SDK stands for Software Development Kit. So, Software Development Kit is the Java Development Kit, no matter how you call it. This thing contains the tools that IntelliJ IDE needs in order to be able to compile and run our programs. Because without them, IntelliJ IDE is like an empty text editor. So it needs those tools in order to be able to uh, work with our uh, particular programming language, which is Kotlin. Now, to download the JDK, and we use uh, Java Development Kit because uh, Kotlin and Java are interoperable. And that means that we can use the existing tools and library which Java already has in our uh, Kotlin project. So we click here on this No SDK and click here where it says Download JDK. Now, on this window, we select version 17, not version 18, because this is the latest version 18. We choose version 17 because this is the version which has the long-term support. And that means that it will receive bug fixes and updates for several years to come, without you needing to switch to a new, vo new version when uh, that new version is uh, released. For the vendor, we choose Amazon Corrector, and uh, the, 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 I'm going to let the default location. So I'm going to click Download to download the JDK. Now the JDK is going to be downloaded. Now the JDK has been 
installed and it's uh, installed on our uh, IntelliJ ID and now we can create our projects but I'm not gonna create a project so I'm not gonna click on create I'm gonna click on cancel and in the next video we're gonna create our first project and uh, we're also gonna talk about uh, a little bit the JDK and the JVM so see you in the next video now it's time to download and install an ID and throughout this course I'm gonna use an ID called IntelliJ ID which is an ID made by a company called JetBrains this is the same company behind the programming language that we're gonna study throughout this course called Kotlin now you may be wondering what is an ID an ID stands for an integrated development environment and it's basically the tool that you're gonna to use to write our code in and IntelliJ ID is like a text editor but a very sophisticated one because it has a lot of features like highlighting our code showing real-time errors and suggestions you can run and compile your code just by a few clicks in other words it's, make, it's making the process of writing code uh, easier and better so to download IntelliJ ID just open the Ubuntu software program you go to search we type IntelliJ ID and we choose the community one so we choose this one we click on install and now IntelliJ ID is going to be installed on my computer now IntelliJ ID has been installed uh, on my computer I can close this and as you can see on the left hand side uh, it, uh, it appears so let's click on IntelliJ ID to open now IntelliJ ID So we have IntelliJ ID Community 21.1 and this is the default team, the light team. You can change this team by going to customize and click here to choose another team but I'm going to keep the light team because this is better for tutorials. I'm going to click to create a new project. I'm not going to create a new project but I need to configure something and only from here I can. So here we have in red no SDK and what uh, is this SDK? SDK stands for Software Deve Development Kit and JDK stands for Java Development Kit and this thing basically contains the tools that the IntelliJ ID needs in order to be able to compile and run our programs because without the, the JDK it's like uh, an empty it's, it's an empty text editor it, it, uh, so you need to provide those tools in order to be able to work with our uh, particular programming language now JDK stands for Java Development Kit and this thing, Java Development Kit, contains the tools that we need to develop and run our programs because IntelliJ ID it's, it's empty, it needs the tools to run and uh, it needs the tools to compile and run our programs and here we need to add uh, those tools and you click here where it says download JDK and we select the version 17 we select version 17 and for the vendor Amazon Coreto we choose version 17 because this is the version which has long term support and that means that it will receive bug fixes and updates without you needing to switch every time they release the new version without you needing to switch that new version you can choose the version 17 because this has the long term support click on download and now uh, the JDK, the Java Development Kit is going to be added to our uh, project it's going to be added to IntelliJ ID so now it's downloading, it's installing All right, so now IntelliJ ID has been installed to our computer and we can, we can create now a project but I'm not going to do that, I'm going to click on cancel because we're going to create a project in the next uh, video. So see you in the next video. Now it's time to create our first project and there is a tradition in programming that our first program should be to output the text hello world to the console and this is what we're going to do in this video. Therefore I'm going to open IntelliJ ID, you should open your IntelliJ ID. On the left hand side make sure to have project selected then click on this plus button to create a new project and here we have a few options the first is the name and here we need to name our project we need to give a name to our project and uh, the name of the project should start with a capital letter and if it has multiple words every word should start with a capital letter so I'm gonna call this uh, and, and this uh, way of naming is called the uh, Pascal case so I'm gonna call this uh, this project hello world and uh, also you should not have Y spaces in uh, your name next we have the location and this is where uh, the project is gonna be created you can change this location if you want but I'm gonna keep the default location next we have language and here you can you here you need to select the language on uh, which this project is gonna be cre created so um, we select Kotlin if you Java is selected just select Kotlin for the B system we select IntelliJ 
and uh, next we have the JDK, the Java Development Kit. And uh, if for whatever reason it says here in angle brackets no SDK, just click on that and go down here of down of two options. It should say detect JDKs, and uh, you will uh, see the JDK down there. You're gonna see Amazon Corelto version 17. Just click on that and it's gonna be added here. Next we have this add sample code, and what this is gonna do, as the name implies, is gonna generate some code for us but i don't want to have that code generated uh, now because i want to that type that code myself and uh, i want to explain that code and in the next video we're gonna check that to generate the code for us so i'm gonna click on create now to create the project And here we have the tips, you can keep the tips activated because it's uh, uh, useful uh, information, but I'm gonna check this, actually I'm gonna just close it. Here we have uh, those windows which says there is a, pl there is a pl plugin update installed. I'm gonna close this. So what we have now on the left hand side is called the project pane. And here we have some folders which IntelliJ ID generated for us, but now I want to I want to show you how to check for IntelliJ updates because in this way we'll have the latest features throughout this course. And to check for IntelliJ updates, you go to Help, and to go down here where it says Check for updates, and here you can check for IntelliJ updates, and you will see a window down here, and if there is an update, it's gonna say that, 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 that there is an update, and you can install that that update. But now it's saying the that you already have the latest version of IntelliJ ID and plugins installed because we have the latest updates. But it's good to check for this because in this way we'll have the latest updates throughout this course. Next, check if you want to check for Kotlin updates, so for the programming language Kotlin, you go to Tools, Kotlin, and go here where it says Configure Kotlin Plugin Updates. And if there is a new update, you'll see it here and you click on Install and that update is going to be installed uh, on uh, IntelliJ ID. So there is no update because we have the latest updates. I'm going to click on OK. Now let's focus on the left hand side. And if you don't see, if you see something like this and you don't see this in this expanded form, just click uh, on this greater sign uh, sign in front of his SRC. SRC stands for source. This is where our source code is going to go. Then click on this greater sign in front of main and make sure to have the folder Kotlin selected. On this folder Kotlin, this is where we're going to add our code, but first we need to create a file. And the file is the thing where we're going to put our code. So we right click on this, go to new, and here we select on the right hand side, we select Kotlin class file. Now, we need to give a name to our file, and I'm going to call this file main. You'll see the reason for this uh, later. So I'm going to call this file main, the name also should be in Pascal case, so it should start with a capital letter, and if it has multiple words, every word should start with a capital letter. And for the, from these options that we have here, we select file, because we're going to create, as I said, the file. Now press enter. Now the file was created for us, as you can see in the folder uh, Kotlin, now we have main.at, we have the file, and also the, it opened the file for us. Let's uh, click there. Now, if you don't have the file open, and if, uh, and if you have something like this, just double click on the file and the file is going to be open for you. Now, here, now we're going to type some code. Now, you need to type exactly what I type. So, type fun. So, while I am typing, as you can see, IntelliJ is trying to help us and is giving us some suggestions. So, it's saying, do you mean fun? That, uh, and if you want to fill in that for you, just press enter, because I want to... To, to type that fun keyword. Fun and it also added the space. So fun space, then you type main, and next we need to put parentheses. And as you can see, this play button now appeared. I'm gonna explain immediately why. And uh, we put the left parentheses, and when we put the left parentheses, the right parentheses is gonna be added automatically. So we put the left parentheses, and the right parentheses was added automatically. Then we get outside of the parentheses, we press space, now I'm going to add curly braces and again we put the left curly brace and the right curly brace is going to be added automatically because IntelliJ is helping us. Now we're inside the curly braces and now we press enter. 
and uh, it uh, added the curly brace on the third line and, and also indented this line for us. Now let's talk about what we have here. Now what we have here is, is what is called the main function. And the main function is the entry point of our program. So every program that you create, it, it first needs this entry point in order to be able to compile your code. But let's take uh, each part of this main function individually to talk about. So first we have this fun. And fun is the keyword for creating a function. And uh, you can use fun keyword to create your own functions, but we're going to see that uh, in, uh, in future videos. Next we have main. And main is the name of this function. Functions can have uh, different names, but main is a special one, as I said, because main is the entry point of our program. Every, every program that you create needs, needs uh, a main function in order to be able to run your code. And in fact, if I change the name of this function to fun uh, main, let's say A, the play part button immediately disappears because now uh, we don't have an entry point and our program can't run. So this is a special function and functions can have different names as I said and as you'll see when you're gonna create your own functions that you can create, uh, you can give different names to your functions. Now, next we have parentheses we have, and we have parentheses because um, Functions can uh, take parameters and can do some work with that with those parameters, but our function doesn't take any parameter. But we still need to provide uh, the parentheses because they are part of the syntax. And you can think of the syntax like the grammar rules that you need to 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 respect in a specific uh, language in order to be to be uh, to under to be understood to be understood. And uh, in the same way, this is the syntax in the programming sense. It's like the grammar rules in which the compiler, as you, you will see what is the compiler uh, later, the compiler needs, uh, enforces you to respect those syntactical rules, which is uh, to have parentheses for a function, in order to be able to understand your code. Because if I delete the parentheses here, now we have an underline which says uh, expecting parentheses so it's uh, it's it it you need to respect uh, the, syn the syntactical uh, rules in order for your code to be uh, to be understood next we have curly braces and we have left curly brace and right curly brace and this is called the body of the function so this is where our code goes so this is also called the code block because it's the block of code it, this is where our logic our uh, our uh, this for our logic, our lines of code go. They are we define them inside the, the 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 curly braces. So this represents the body of the function. And let's add some code. And I'm gonna type print line here. So because we we need to output something in the console. So we type here print line. So we type print. And while I'm typing, you should see a suggestion. And we have the suggestion print line. And we select the first one to fill in for us. And now we go inside the parentheses of the print line and we put double quotation marks. And inside the double quotation marks we type hello world. Now we need to we need to run this code. And in order to run this code, to compile this code, we can do it in uh, two ways first. We can click on this play button that we have here. Or you can right click and uh, you can go here where it says run main that kt and the code is going to be compiled. And uh, let's do it from here first. So I'm going to click on this play button to run our code and we're going to see the console opening down and you're going to see the text hello world, hello world outputted. So the console opened and we have hello world. We have the text that we type inside this uh, thing that we have here. This is also a function. And we have this code outputted now in the console. The console opened. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna close uh, the console to explain what this print line is. This print line that we have here is a function also, but is a function which takes some uh, which takes input, and the input is this text. And this function, the, its job is to take whatever you pass as the input and to output that in the console. So this is what this print line is doing and this is a function that we didn't create we didn't type free, uh, fun print line and uh, 
uh, then we call it. This is a function which is uh, built into Kotlin. Uh, the Kotlin. This is a function which is already built by the Kotlin programmers. So we just uh, call that function inside our code and you can use it. You, need to, you don't need to create this function. So this is the this is what this print line is doing. So it's taking whatever you pass inside the parentheses and it's outputting that in the console. So this is our discussion uh, about uh, the first program, which is to output some text uh, in the console, hello world. And uh, now I'm going to show you that, uh, and now I'm going to show you an illustration to understand what is, uh, what is uh, the JDK, the JVM, and uh, how Kotlin and Java achieve this interoperability because uh, Kotlin and Java are fully interoperable and that means that you can uh, you can have a Java project to which you can add Kotlin code and you can compile that code and everything to work fine and also I'm going to explain what the what the word compile means and for that I'm going to bring an illustration here so this is the illustration and uh, let's talk about what we have here First, we have Kotlin source code, and Kotlin source code is the code that we wrote. Is this code that is um, meant to be human readable? So this code is w the code uh, that we, as humans, can understand. We can uh, write this code, we can uh, read this code, but the computer doesn't understand this high-level, uh, high-level uh, code that we wrote. It needs something. It needs it needs machine code. It needs binary code in order to be able to understand. And this is where uh, the JDK comes into action. So our Kotlin source code, again, this code, which is meant to be human readable, then it's when when we uh, press on that play, play button, on that, and when we press on that play uh, button, on this button, and the code is compiled, what uh, happens under the hood is that that Kotlin source code is, is uh, taken by the Java development kit, the JDK, and through the Kotlin compiler. So the Kotlin compiler acts like a translator. It takes that high level uh, human readable uh, and uh, writable code. It converts that code then into what is called Java bytecode. And this is uh, not the final step, as you can see in this illustration. This, this is just the intermediary step. This is, is not uh, uh, converted uh, into machine code. Then, this Java byte code, it's uh, taken by the JVM, so it's, it's sent to the JVM, and the JVM then takes that Java byte code and converts that Java, that Java byte code into, into something which a machine, which a specific machine, can understand. But let's let's first explain why uh, why uh, Kotlin uh, why uh, the JDK takes this uh, Kotlin source code and then it converts this so Kotlin source code into Java byte code and this uh, is, is doing this because different processors and dif different operating systems di uh, need different instructions in order to understand your code so if uh, we are not uh, will not have this uh, Java byte code so uh, if uh, we had, uh, we will uh, compile our code on a specific platform. That code can run only on that specific platform. But because our Kotlin source code is taken by the JDK and through the Kotlin compiler and it's converted into Java byte code, and the Java byte code then it's it's uh, it it's send it to the JVM and JVM stands for Java Virtual Machine and the JVM then because different platforms and different uh, operating uh, uh, different platforms and different processors need the different instructions the JVM is the one which uh, is doing the hard work of, of figure out figuring out what kind of instruction that specific platform uh, Need. So it converts that Java by code into machine code, let's say, which a Windows platform can understand. Then the same thing happens to Linux. Uh, the, the, J, the JVM receives the same Java by code and then it converts that uh, Java by code into machine code, which a Linux platform can understand. And then it's doing the same thing um, to a Mac OS. So, the Mac OS, is, the JVM is gonna uh, is gonna receive the same Java byte code, and it's gonna convert that Java byte code into machine code which Mac, Mac OS can understand. So this is how uh, 
Kotlin and, and Java can achieve this, call, this thing called uh, write uh, once and run everywhere. This is because the, the work of uh, converting that uh, machine code in, which, which a specific platform uh, can understand has shifted from the programmer to the uh, platform which has the which implements that JVM. So we just wrote our code, we run our code through the JDK, the JDK converted uh, that code in Java bytecode, and then the platform which has the JVM uh, installed uh, is doing the work of converting that uh, Java bytecode that we wrote into something which that platform, that specific platform, can understand. So. And this is why uh, Java and uh, Kotlin are fully interoperable. So you can add uh, co you can add Java code to an existing Kotlin uh, program, and vice versa. You can add uh, you can add uh, uh, Java you can add Kotlin code to an existing uh, Java program, and that is uh, that is possible because uh, the JDK is gonna is gonna convert through the compiler all of that code into the same Java bytecode and then that code is going to be run on the JVM and the JVM is going to convert that into machine code and that code is going to run on a specific platform. So this is how uh, Java and Kotlin and this is why Java and Kotlin are, uh, are fully interoperable because they, uh, they, are co they are ultimately converted into the same Java bytecode and uh, you can also achieve this uh, right once run everywhere because uh, that code then runs on the JVM, Java Virtual Machine, which is doing the hard work or uh, figuring out uh, what kind of instructions a uh, specific platform needs in order to understand uh, that uh, code that we wrote. And uh, in this way, that hard working has shifted from us to the people who implement the JVM. So this is how uh, the JDK and the JVM works under the hood. And if you find uh, this confusing, don't be. This, this is just a relaxed discussion about uh, uh, how the JDK, what is the JDK, and what is the Kotlin compiler. Because I said our code, uh, I said previously that our code is compiled. When I said that, this is actually what ha was happening. Our code was taken by the JDK, and through the JDK was converted to Java bytecode. Then it was um, sent to the JVM of uh, which is on my uh, Windows, and then that is converted into machine code, and then we see in the output, uh, hello world. So this is our discussion about uh, the first program, how to create the first program, hello world, and this is the additional discussion about how the JDK, how the Kotlin compiler, and how the JVM uh, works. So see you in the next video. So in the previous video, we created our first program, and uh, even though it was a simple program, you should celebrate because uh, you created your first program. But if you want to make your program to do something useful, you need to store data. And in order to store data, we need to use variables. And this is what we're going to talk about in this video. Therefore, I'm going to open IntelliJ IDE. I'm going to create a new project. So make sure to, that on the left hand side you have project selected. Click on uh, this plus button to create a new project. I'm going to call it variables. It should be in Pascal case if it has multiple words. Language we have already Kotlin selected for the build system IntelliJ. And also make sure to have the JDK selected here. And now I'm going to check this add sample code because this is going to generate the code that we typed previously, respectively the main function and the print line to and the hello world. Text is going to be now auto generated for us by because we check this uh, box add sample code and it's going to add the code automatically for us. So I'm going to click on create. Now our uh, project is ready to go and uh, as you can see here it generated some code for us and this is similar to what we did in the previous video where we created our, we created our code uh, ourselves but we have some additional code and uh, I'm gonna delete this additional code because it will make things confusing so I'm gonna delete this part. Sorry.
I'm gonna delete this part and also uh, you have may, may have noticed that uh, here in uh, inside this parenthesis we, now we have these args array and string we can delete this too because uh, it will uh, make thing, things confusing and we're gonna talk about uh, what are the uh, arrays and all of that in the next videos now I'm gonna all right now we're ready now let's uh, run this code to see to see what is happening it's gonna output uh, that text like uh, it did in the previous video you should open the console in a short moment and indeed it opened the console and it output the text hello world like it did in the previous video so I'm gonna close the console now also let's expand this SRC to see the file that it was created automatically for us uh, this time and um, let's change this hello world text to print uh, another text let's say let's print uh, type your name there in my case it's Alex so I'm gonna run this code and it will output uh, my name in the console all right so it uh, output it hello Alex like uh, we typed here but um, it's uh, what we have here is pretty pretty inflexible it will a better way to be to to do that it, it will be to have something to store this name and then refer that uh, that thing here to call that thing here in this way to be uh, a bit more uh, more dyna dynamic and uh, to do that we need to use uh, variables and variables are uh, are like some uh, containers which can hold data values and uh, let's see how to create a variable okay let's uh, put the, the the code below above our print uh, ln statement and uh, if you don't know what a statement is a statement is a complete uh, instruction of execution now to create a variable we just type the keyword var which stands for variable all right next we need to give a name to our vari a variable to be able to refer it later to call it later and I'm gonna earn the naming convention around the naming uh, variable is called is called camel case and that means that uh, the first uh, letter in the name if it has multiple words so start with a, with a lowercase letter so I'm gonna type user and the next uh, word name with a capital letter all right next we need to provide the ty type of the variable what, and that means what kind of data this variable is going to hold is going to store to do that we need to put colon and next we need to say what type of data is going to store what what uh, data is going to store and uh, w we want to store text and um, to store text we need to type here string and string means that this variable is going to store uh, a, sequ a sequence of characters or text now we need to assign a value to this variable and to do that we put we put here equals space and uh, because we explicitly said here that we're going we're gonna to put text text or string we put a double pair of quotation marks and, and we type Alex all right so now we create our variable we give it a name a type and uh, with, we've also assigned a value to this variable next we need to refer this variable down here um, and to 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 refer the, that variable I'm gonna delete this text first and to refer the variable we put dollar sign and after the dollar sign we start typing the name of the, the variable user and as I'm typing the IntelliJ is giving us some suggestions and it says do you mean this username um, variable and it also has this V here for variable so I'm gonna press enter to fill in that for me and if I uh, run this code you'll see the exact uh, thing uh, 
happening here it outputted the text uh, hello alex but this time we didn't type the text directly here we 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 store that text in a variable and we call that variable in uh, in our uh, println i'm going to add a space here to make things more clear now what we can do is to change the value of this variable by uh, adding uh, below of our variable typing the name of the variable again user name equals and now we can assign a new value to this variable and uh, let's put let's put john here right let's run this code to see what happens now now this time when this uh, this instruction is going to be called it's going to print the, the new value of the variable which is john so as you can see down here it outputted the text hello john so we can change the value of the variable after we assign uh, a value to it but what you can't do is to is to type here username equals five and uh, if you hover over here it says integer literal does not conform to the expected type string and in other words it's saying that we said explicitly, explicitly up here that it's going to store only text and uh, down here we try to put um, a whole number an integer and that is not going to work because kotlin is a lang language which is uh, which is called statically typed and that means that it, it it will check the types of the variable at compile time not at run time and that means it that it, you, you cannot uh, run your code if you assign uh, a value to to a variable which has a different type that than the than the type uh, that you specify specified when you declare the variable this is why you get this warning here and if i delete this now let's delete this all right okay the next type of variable that uh, also actually not the, ne the next type the, ver ver the next way of declaring a variable is using the keyword val so if you declare if you declare a variable as val val means that we cannot change its value after we assign uh, a value to it so if you try if you try to assign a new value to our variable like we did here up here it will not work so uh, let's actually let's actually just uh, change here let's put val okay and and after i did that you, you it immediately underline in red username and it says val cannot be reassigned and that is because if you declare if you declare a variable as val you cannot change its value later it will uh, you can put a, va a value to that variable only once and uh, that's all you cannot change the very the, the value of the va variable la uh, later so let's ch change this back to var to have the ability to change the value now let's look at another type of variable so i'm gonna type var again I'm gonna call it age. I'm gonna put colon to specify a type here, and now we're gonna use another type, which is int. And int stands for integer or for whole numbers. Now we need to assign a value to it. I'm gonna call. I'm gonna put um, I don't know ten or uh, I don't know twenty twenty two. All right. So what we have now is a different type. Up here we have string, and that means that we're gonna we're gonna store a sequence of characters. And down here we have integers, and that means that we can store um, only only numbers, only whole numbers. And there are different uh, type of numbers which we're gonna look uh, in the next video. And if I try here to change this, uh, to change this uh, first, uh, first let's uh, let's actually let's actually print this. Uh, hello alex let's type your age is and here you put dollar sign and we call uh, the name of the variable we type the name of the variable age so we press enter to fill in that for us 
and if you run this code now it says hello John your age is 22 so it's now it's using the value the values of this variable in our uh, println and we can change for uh, the variable also the its value because it's declared as a var not a val so we can put here age equals let's say 25 and if you run this code the change is uh, reflected immediately in our code so now we see hello John your age is 25 what uh, we can't do like in uh, the previous uh, example with the username here we cannot put a string we cannot put hit Alex because we said explicitly here that this is gonna is gonna hold only integers only whole numbers so I'm gonna delete this let's put it again to 25 and the error error disappeared all right now uh, let's look um, at what we have here because we have this underlines this uh, uh, great uh, light out of our types and every time uh, you see something like this uh, that means that IntelliJ is trying to say something to you and if you hover over here actually let's hover over over the type it's, it says explicitly given type it's redundant here and that means that uh, it does not need to we, we don't not we don't need to say explicitly here that is gonna hold a, a sequence of characters it's gonna hold string because it knows this it can because it Kotlin has something which is called type inference and that means that it can infer the type of the variable by the value we assign to it in our case we assign some text so if I delete the type here now it's still working and if I uh, as you can see if I uh, if I put here if, let's say if I try to put here username sorry username equals to 3 it's still uh, treated as a string because it infer it it it, it infer the type uh, by the value you assign to it and uh, similarly this uh, this uh, thing uh, applies to to our uh, int type so if i delete this it's still working it's still treating the, it's still treating this as a as an int so if you try to put here age equals to a text i don't know we, again we have this error error in the it says type mismatch require int and found string and that means that it's still uh, it's still treating this uh, variable as an int because as i said it has something which is called type inference and it, it can infer the type of the variable by the value you assign to it all right this is uh, our discussion about variables there are more types of variables and we're going to look at that uh, other types in the next videos and uh, collectively they are called data types okay you can remove this space if you want so i'm going to end this video now and see you in the next video all right so in the last video we talked about variables and you saw there that we can store different data in our variables and we look specifically at the string data type or type for storing sequence of characters or text and at the int or integer data type for storing whole numbers. In this video, we're going to look more closely at the integer data type and also going to extend our understanding to three more data types for storing whole numbers. And those are the byte, the short, and the long. So let's open IntelliJ IDE. Make sure that on the left hand side project is selected, click on new project. Let's call this project integer type in Pascal case, select Kotlin, IntelliJ, add sample code and then click on create, create a project. Alright, so now our project is going to be created. We wait a little bit.
All right, so we open the file main.kt for us. Now here you have some code, but I'm going to delete this code because you don't need this code. And those that you see here are called comments. We're going to look at comments in a separate video. So let's delete this code. And we have our print line there. We can delete the, this also. And you can keep uh, here. Those are called uh, parameters. We're going to look at parameters. We're going to talk about functions. But you can delete those if you want to make it uh, consistent with the last video if uh, you want. So it will work the same. It doesn't make a difference. And in the previous video, we had uh, this code val name of type, so colon, string, and we're going to put equals, and we assign a value, double quotation marks, Alex. Then we had another variable called val, so also val, because we don't want to change its value. Let's call it age of type int with uppercase uh, e i equals to 23. So this is the, the code that we had previously. And we had, uh, we had a print line down here, which uh, output the, the values for those variables. So let's add a print line here. Let's say hello dollar sign name your age is dollar sign age. So now if you run this, let's click on this uh, run button here, run main.kt, and we have uh, a pop-up here which says there is a new version of uh, Kotlin plugin available. We're going to click to install this, but uh, let's see the output first. And to get hello Alex, your age is 23. Let's put an exclamation mark here. Let's run this again. So the console opened and the output is hello, hello Alex, your age is 23. So this is the code that we had uh, previously. And uh, as you can see here, those types are gray out because they are uh, redundant because the compiler knows what type these variables are by looking the at the value that is assigned to them. So now if I delete, if I hover over here on this gray out string, it says explicitly given type is redundant here. So we can delete this type here. And we can also delete it here because if you hover over here, as you can see, it's gray out and it says explicitly given type is redundant here. So it's redundant. I know already what type this variable is. This is what it's saying in other words. So let's delete this, and now if you run our code, we get hello Alex, your age is 23, so everything works fine. And if you hover over uh, the name of the variable, you're going to see that val name, and you have colon string, so it's inferred the type to be a string. And here if you hover over, over the age variable, you see, you see that we have a val age of type int. So it knows what the, the type is, very, the variable by looking the, at the value that is assigned to it. And if you try to assign here, let's say age equals to uh, to something, we can because first this is uh, a val, and second uh, this is an int, not a, not a, a string. So if I change this to var, now I don't get to hear that warning, but if I hover over series it says type mismatch required int found string so he's saying do you you made this variable of type in then we int so you want to store whole numbers and uh, you try to assign a text to it, so it's that that is not gonna happen i'm not gonna allow it so this is basically what he's saying now let's install this plugin because it's good to have the latest updates throughout uh, this course so let's wait a little bit you can hide the color the console Let's click on restart to activate plugin updates. So click on restart. Our project opened uh, again. Now 
let's click on configure because it says that uh, Kotlin not configure let's click on configure actually let's wait a little bit click on ignore we have a problem now all right now let's delete the variable uh, name which is used for storing the the text and we're gonna look closely at the integer uh, data type here so let's delete this code so let's, now uh, here should have an underline uh, uh, or uh, it will, this is in red now because the variable doesn't exist so we can't uh, call it here so let's delete this and we can keep your ages actually I'm gonna change it because I'm gonna give a different name to this variable and uh, let's call this variable now number now let's think about what is this integer data type that we've uh, used here uh, we know that is a type so it's a data type for storing whole numbers but uh, how big the whole number can be or how small the whole, the whole number can be there is a range is there is there is no range so actually there is a range so there is a minimum and maximum value which can be stored in a integer data type and to get the minimum and maximum value which is can be stored in a integer data type i'm going to type here val integer max value equals to and i'm going to type here int dot max value now this is going to give us back the maximum value which can be stored in a, in a, in an integer data type so if i press shift control p on this as you can see this uh, thing that we have here int dot and max value we're gonna see what uh, what this in what are what is this in the future videos when we're going to talk about object oriented programming but for now we need to know that this line of code is going to give us the maximum value which can be stored in an integer then i'm going to type val to get the minimum value so minimum also integer min value equals int dot min value and that is going to give us the minimum value and now let's print those in in the console so let's output those in the console i'm going to type integer max value colon i'm going to put dollar sign not here so here dollar sign integer max value let's press ctrl d to duplicate this line of code i'm gonna type integer now mean value it's equal to integer mean value so we choose this variable now now if you run this We get integer maximum value and have two billion one hundred forty seven million forty eight three thousand six hundred forty seven and this is the maximum the maximum value which can be stored in an integer and this is the minimum value which can be stored in an integer next let's see what happens if you attempt to put a number which is bigger than the maximum or the minimum value so i'm gonna bring down our variable number and i'm gonna assign the maximum value which can be stored in an int so i'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna paste it here now we have an underline because this is a val so let's change it to var and uh, so this is the maximum value which can be stored in an integer now if we increase this by one so if I put 48 at now at the end there you have an underline and it says the integer literally does not conform to the specific type int and now you may be wondering uh, why because uh, this is an integer so it's a whole number so why don't uh, why is saying that the integer literal does not conform to the expected type int this is because this is now a bigger number than the maximum number which can be stored in an integer which is this number below here and now we try to put a bigger number and it can't it can't uh, hold this number it's too big it's bigger than the maximum value allowed just to be stored in an int you need to use a different uh, data type for uh, storing this number for storing a number bigger than the maximum value can be stored in an int and for uh, that i'm going to use uh, in the next videos as you'll see a long and with a long you can store a bigger number than th those maximum and minimum values that's defined here the long data type has a uh, has a much bigger uh, range as you'll see now i'm going to end this video here and see you in the next video
Now it's time to look at the next data types that we can use for storing whole numbers, and those are the byte, short, and long. Therefore, I'm going to go down here, and I'll type val. I'm going to start with the bytes. I'm going to byte. I'm going to type here byte max value equals to byte dot max value. That, but now let's also put the explicit type here. So let's put here byte. Then I'm going to type val byte mean value of type byte equals to byte dot mean value. Then I'll add two print lines here. I'm going to type print line. Let's put it here. Print line. Let's type byte max value. Let's put colon dollar sign byte referring the variable max value. Let's press control D. Byte mean value equals byte let's change out this variable to mean value now let's run our app to see what to get in the output what is the minimum and maximum value which can be stored in a byte and as you can see we have integer maximum value so we have uh, the numbers from the previous uh, video and byte max uh, value is 127 and byte mean value is minus 138 and as you can see this is are much smaller than the integer uh, uh, types so let's now look at the next data type and that is the short so i'm going to type here val short max value let's define the explicit type short equals to Let's type short max value and val short mean value of type short equals to short mean value. And let's add the print line here. Print line short max max value. dollar sign we're referring the variable now and as you can see they are grayed out and IntelliJ ID when it tries to sell something to you it's uh, sometimes it's uh, graying out the the thing that it wants to tell something about and some other in other cases it highlights with a certain color so this is good to have in mind now I'm gonna type here short max value control D short mean value and let's change now short mean value to refer the the dot variable and as you can see that is gray out because it's not if you hover over it says uh, variable short mean value is never used so short mean short should be here now if you run this We get short max value 32,767 and minus 32,768. This is the minimum value as you can see here. Now, let's look at the next uh, data type that can be used for storing whole numbers, and those are the long. And let's hide the console. So I'm going to type val long max value equals to long max value val long mean value equals to long dot mean value let's add the print line here I'm gonna type long mean value dollar sign long 
long max value should be here. Let's press Ctrl D and long min value now. Again, the long min value vari uh, variable now is gray out because it didn't, didn't call it. So let's call it here, long min value. All right, now let's run our code to see what is the minimum or maximum value which can be stored in a long. And as you'll see, the long is the data type with the biggest range. As you can see, the long max value is this number that we have here, and it's a very, very big number. And the long minimum value is this number. So as you can see, it's much bigger than the integer uh, data type, the long. So in cases that where the the integer data type uh, can 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 no longer be used because uh, it exceeds the maximum value you can use a long but most of the time you will be working with integers and uh, uh, sometimes in specific uh, scenarios you'll use byte or short but most of the time you'll work with uh, the integer now let's create a variable so let's take let's delete this to show you something so I'm going to type here val my number and uh, to declare a long uh, variable you can declare it and but first let me show you let me show you something so if I put here equals and I put 28 and if you hover over this uh, variable it says that it's a val my number of type int and now you may be wondering why uh, it uh, inferred it to be an int because this value can easily fit in any of those types that we looked at and this happens because the default type which is inferred so if no type is specified explicitly is an int in uh, Kotlin so if I don't type I don't specify an explicit type here ad, after I name the variable it will uh, treat this variable as an int even though this variable can uh, this variable this number can easily fit in into a long, into a short, into a byte. So if you want this variable to be a, a byte or a short or a long, you need to explicitly declare here byte, let's say. And now if you hover over, it's a byte. And uh, if you want to make it a short, you type short here explicitly. Otherwise, otherwise it, will, it will infer the default type to be an int. And uh, also for a long and for a, for the long there are two ways you can define here the type you put colon you define the name of the variable colon long and uh, if you hover over now this is a long but uh, there is another way and it's uh, by adding a l suffix at the end of the 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 value so if i put an l suffix here and it says use L uppercase instead of L lowercase and this is because that can be easily mistaken for one so you need to put an uppercase L at the end and now if I hover over as you can see uh, while my number is of type as you can see they're long because you put the L at the end and now if I type here a number which is bigger than the maximum value which can be stored in an int as you can see put here this number let's delete because it's too big Now if I look here, as you can see this is a long now. It show we had that underlined red because we exceeded the long also this why it was in red. So it automatically inferred this to be a long because it's bigger than the maximum value which can be stored in an int. So this is good to have in mind uh, uh, in uh, your uh, coding uh, journey. So I'm gonna end this video here and see you in the next video. Now it's time to see how we can store floating point numbers and those are numbers which have a fractional part and we're gonna look specifically at the float data type and at the double data type but before it starts our discussion let's see the amount of space each data type occupies so let's start with the byte a byte occupies 8 bits and we say that a byte has a width of 8 and the short can store a larger range of numbers and occupies 16 bits and has a width of 16. An int has a much larger range, as you know, and occupies 32 bits. 
The point here is that each data type has a different size. It's not particularly relevant to you to know those numbers, but you may encounter it as a question for an interview. Now, let's create a new project. So let's close this project. Click on new project. Let's call it float and double. And let's click on create. Right now, our project was created. So let's hide the project pane because we don't need the project pane. And let's delete this code because we don't need this code. Also, the parameters that are defined here. Now, to declare a floating point variable, I'm going to type here val because I want this variable to be immutable. I don't want to change its value. It's going to be called my number. It's going to be in camel case. And I'm going to put equals 2.5. And now if I hover over here, as you can see, the type which was in fair is a double. But look what happens if I put here for the type float, let's say. Have an underline. And it says the floating point literal does not conform to the expected type float. So what is saying is that this is considered to be a double and here we we said that the type should be a float but the default when you are dealing with floating point numbers the default type which is inferred by the compiler is the double so in order for this to work you either put here an f it can be an uppercase f on or a lowercase f and uh, this is how you solve it. So let's create also another variable here. Val. My second number. Equals to. 2.0 let's say. And uh, let's put here the F. And for the double we don't have a, a, a letter to add it as a suffix. So you can put here D or D because it don't have such a thing. Now, as you can see here, this is gray out. And every time you see something that is gray out or is highlighted, that means that IntelliJ ID is trying to tell you something. Now, if I uh, uh, hover over here, so let me hover over, it says that explicit given type is redundant here. And it's redundant because we put an F here, so it knows that it's gonna be a float. But again, the default type, which is gonna be inferred, if you don't specify, uh, a type either by using the f as a suffix it will be the double because the double is the default type which is inferred let's press ctrl alt alt l to format the code now let's print our variables in the console so let's add the print line here print line and let's type here my number equals to dollar sign my number Let's type end inside the quotation marks and my second number equals dollar sign my second number. And as you can see, my number is a float and my second number is a double, as you can see here. So let's use my second number. Let's output those in the console to see what we get. So we get my number 2.5 and my second number 2.0. And let me show you something. If I put here only two, but I, I, I add an F at the end, so a lowercase F or a, an uppercase F. And if I run this, We get my number is equal to 2.0, even though we didn't, we don't have here 2.0, because we added here an f as the suffix. It will, uh, it will show us also the fractional part, which is zero, because so. And uh, then we have my second number, which is also 2.0, but this is a double, so this way. And uh, the difference is that 
uh, floating point number has a smaller smaller precision than a double and uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve if you want uh, more precision you'll use a double but if you don't uh, want uh, uh, more precision you use float depends on the on the on what you're trying to achieve with uh, with your code next let me show you what happens if i put here only two and if i run the code can you guess now we get my number 2.0 and my second number equals to 2 because now we didn't specify uh, the, we didn't put the fractional part here this was not treated as a double so it only has output it to but if i put here double so th the explicit type now we have a problem because if you hover over it says the integer literally does not conform to the expected type double and this is because uh, as i said in uh, the previous video the the default type which is inferred for the whole numbers is an int so it's saying here that this is an integer and we declare a double so make this number that you assign to me into a double so you need to put the fractional part like 2.0 and the error disappears and this also becomes redundant now you can delete this so this is uh, well, good to have in mind now i'm gonna end this video here and see you in the next video Alright, so far in our videos we only dealt with data types that can store numbers, but there are two different data types for storing a different kind of data. And uh, what data you may be wonder, you're gonna see what data in this video. So let's create a new project, make sure that on the left hand side project is selected, and here we have our previous project. Let's click on new project. Let's give it a name, let's call it char. So this is the data type that we're going to use and boolean in Pascal case. Language Kotlin, build system IntelliJ, make sure that we have the JDK 17 here. And also going to check this add sample code to generate the main function and the code for us. So click on create. You can close this. Right, our project was created. Now let's delete this code because we don't need this code. Let's also delete the parameters defined here. And let's also hide the project pane because we don't need the project pane. So let's create a variable. I'm going to type val because I want this variable to be immutable. And we're going to look first at the char data type. So I'm going to type here my char value in camel case of type char is going to be equal to and now I'm gonna, if I put here double quotation marks we have an underline because if you hover over it says type means much requires char found string so in a, with, with a char we cannot use double quotation marks what you need to do instead because within a char you can uh, only store a single character which can be a number a letter a symbol like an exclamation mark or point and we cannot put the double quotation marks you need to put single quotation marks for a chart so if i put now single quotation marks and i put here let's say the letter d now uh, the, the error disappear because now we have a single character in our uh, single uh, quotation marks now let's print these values i'm gonna add the print line here print line and we can print this in two ways. So I'm going to put the dollar sign, so the placeholder, my char value. Let's run our code to see the output. All right, so we get the letter D output in the console because this is the value of this variable. But there is another way to output this in the console, and you can remove the double quotation marks. You can remove the dollar sign, and you can run this in this way and it will have the same uh, output so we get also the here output in the console and as you can see the char is gray out because uh, 
uh, like the previous uh, type, previous previous data types, the type can be inferred. So it can it sees that this variable uh, is a is a char, so it no longer needs this explicit type here. So you can delete the explicit type. You can let it like that. Now if you hover over here, as you can see, my char value is of type char, so it inferred the type to be a char. So this is the char. And uh, now you may be wondering when you're going to use this. This can be used, let's say, that you want to store the last key pressed by a user or, uh, uh, I don't know, something, uh, a, a letter from a, from a name. or uh, In that case, you can use a char value. Whenever you want to store a single uh, character, you can use a char. Now, let's look. Let's, let's now look at the next data type, and that is a Boolean data type. So I'm going to type here val my in camel case my boolean value and a boolean value we're going to put colon boolean a boolean value can only store two th two things true or false so we can put here there you can put here either true and let's output this in the console so let's uh, add the print line here so if i put my boolean my so my boolean value now if you run this because this variable now has the value true we're gonna see true in the console output it so we get true being output in the console because this is the value of this variable that is referenced here in this print line Again, for this uh, variable, you can also delete the explicit type because uh, it can infer the type by looking at the value that you assign to it. And you can also put another uh, uh, value here, which is false. So now if you run this, you get, as you can see, false. And you can put those in a single print line. So let's uh, delete this. Let's put double quotation marks. Let's type my char value equals dollar sign my char value and and my boolean value equals dollar sign my boolean value So now if you run this, we get my char value D and my boolean value equals to false because those are the values for our variable for our variables. Again you can delete the explicit type here because you can infer the type. So if you hover over now, as you can see this is now a bool my boolean value of five boolean, so it knows what value it has. And uh, now you may be wondering where you're gonna use the boolean data type. And uh, the boolean data type is gonna be used a lot in your code, in your programming, and it's gonna be used uh, specifically in conjunction with the control flow statements. And uh, we're going to look at the control flow statements in the next videos. But uh, to give you an, an example, there is a control flow statement called if statement. And with an if statement and a Boolean uh, value, which can be true or false, you can control the flow of the program because the flow of the program is by default from top to bottom. So in other words, every line of code is read one by one. And what you can do with a Boolean uh, value or a Boolean expression is that you can break this flow of the program by imposing a specific condition so only if that condition is true uh, a particular uh, block of code is going to be executed so you're going to use boolean values a lot in your uh, programming actually there is no program that you can I, you, you can build without uh, using the boolean values and control flow statements now let's do a recap of uh, all the data types that we learn so far so we learn about byte short int and long for storing whole numbers then we re we learn about the floating point uh, data types we know that was the float and the double and we also learn about the char and boolean 
and uh, we also learn about the string data type which is which is a special data type because is uh, it has what is called class support and uh, the the other uh, the other data types uh, are also called so the bytes short long int float uh, double char boolean are also called are also called primitive data types and this is um, because uh, of how they are stored in memory and uh, they're not like they're not actually uh, primitive data types in my opinion because you can uh, you can uh, uh, you can use them as uh, classes but we're going to talk about this in in the section about object oriented programming for now what you need to understand is that these are the data types that we're going to use and in the next video we're going to see the operations we're going to look at operators and operations that we can do with those data types so i'm going to end this video here and see you in the next video so far in our videos you only saw how we can store data in our variables how we can store different data in our variables and we looked at different data types for storing different data but if you want to make your program to do something we need to do some operations therefore i'm going to create a new project i'm going to call it operators select kotlin intellij jdk add sample code and then click on create all right our project was created let's delete this code because we don't need this code let's hide the project pane Let's delete the parameter here, args. Next, I'm going to declare two variables here. val x is going to be equal to 5. And val y is going to be equal to 3. Then I'll type here val result. And in this variable result, I'm going to put the sum of the 5 and 3. So I'm going to type here x plus I. Then I'm going to print the result. Print line. Result equals dollar sign result. And I'm going to get 8. Now let's run this to see that we get 8 in the output. So we get result equals 8. So what uh, this uh, opera operator is doing is adding, is sum it sums the value of x and i, which is 5 and 3. And those, uh, and um, the, the objects which are affected by an operator, in our case x and i are uh, uh, the objects affected by an operator, are called operands. So here we have two operands, x and i, and the, 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 operation, the operator is plus. So they, this, those are called operands. This is good to have in mind. And uh, if you put here directly 5 and 3, this, those two are also going to be called operands because they are affected by the uh, operator plus. So if you run this, also get 8 but let's put x and i here now let's delete this code and let's uh, add let's look at the next operation that we can do in a uh, kotlin so i'm gonna add here a print line and i will type here put quotation marks x plus i equals i'm gonna put dollar sign curly braces x plus i then I'm going to post control D four times and I will change this to minus this to multiplication dividing and uh, an operator which is not so well uh, known as outside the programming context is called the modulus operator and the modulus operator is going to give us the reminder of a division so let's change now here uh, those two here minus asterisk for multiplication dividing and modulus and this thing that we have here in curly braces is called an expression and, a, and uh, an expression is a construct 
which evaluates to a single value. So if I press, uh, if I press here Shift Control P, not on the entire string. So let's try here Shift Shift Control P. As you can see, if I select x plus i, we have this pop-up which says that is an integer. So that returns an integer, and that is because it sums their value and it returns this value here. So now if you run this. We get x plus i 8, x minus uh, uh, i we get 2, which is correct. You get x times i 15, because 5 times i is 15. x divided by i is 1, and uh, you don't have the the reminder, because uh, this, uh, this, this expression is an int here, is an int, so it will drop the fractional part completely. It will not show the fractional part. And x modulus i is 2, because uh, 5 divided uh, by 3 is 1 with a reminder of 2. So this is what the modulus operator is doing. Now, if you want more precision and you want to see what is x plus uh, x divided by i, you can, you can uh, declare one of those variables as either float or double. So I'm going to put a 3.0 here to make this a double. Now if I press shift control p here, let's go here, shift control p. Now, as you can see, this is a double, because we put here 3.0, then the entire expression inside the curly brace is going to be a double. So now, if you run this, now we get 8.0, 2.0, 15.0, and get 1.666 and then get 2.0 so as you can see now did all of those uh, expressions inside the curly braces are of type double because we added here 3.0 so this is a double and the entire expression is converted into a double so we have more precision now so and if i put this uh, and i put here an f for float as you can see you'll see uh, less precision here so if you run this As you can see, a float now has a, a, a smaller precision than a double because now if you press Shift Control P to see what kind of type is this expression, so we select X or I, so we select X minus I. As you can see, it's a float now, so this is why you get only the, you get a smaller precision than the double. So let's delete this. Next, let's look at operator precedence. So I'm going to type here print line quotation marks, I'm going to type here 3 plus 3 times asterisk 4. Then I'm going to put equals, I'm going to put dollar sign, curly braces, I'm going to type 3 plus 3 times 4. So now, can you guess the result? Let's run our app to see what we get. get 3 plus 3 times 4 is 15 because first is doing the multiplication which is 12 and then it's adding 12 to, to 3 and we have 15 but you can control the you can control the the precedence of the op of the operators by putting parentheses so if i put parentheses around the 3 plus 3 times 4 now we'll have a different result so now if you run this so let's wait we get 24 here down because now it's first because we put parentheses this has precedence over the multiplication it will do first what is inside the parentheses so we have 6 and then the 6 is going to be multiplied by 4 and we get 24 now sometimes uh, in your programming you will want to uh, add a specific value to a number and uh, in order to do, to do that, there is something, uh, uh, there is a shorter way to do those things. So let me show you what I am trying to say here. So sometimes you want to add, let's say, 2 to a variable. What we can do is we can type here, let's declare in the, again the variable val result. And uh, let's put equals to x plus x plus i. And let's go down here. Now, what I can do here, I can type result 
equals to result plus two. So let's say that you want to increment a variable by two. You can you can do it in this way. You can type a result so the variable and this mathematically is incorrect because result is not equal to result plus two but this operator equal in programming is called the assignment operator so it assigns what's in on, on the right to the variable that is on the left so we are assigning now the result plus two which is uh, we have eight plus two which is going to be ten and uh, let's add a print line here let's type result equals to let's put the sign result now let's do the same thing for the next operation so i'm going to type here result plus result equals to result plus minus sorry two so now we are we are subtracting for the result so which has the value now uh, uh, I think uh, let me think about 10 it will subtract 2 to the, to the, to the, from this variable result and it's gonna assign this value into the variable result that is defined here so let's add a print line here let's put result equals to dollar sign result then I'm gonna type result plus equals not this plus we're going to look at that uh, immediately result result times two print line result result equals to dollar sign result and let's copy this for the division and the modulus so let's put here division and modulus now let's run our app to see what we get in the output so first we get 10 because we are adding to the variable result which has the value x plus i which is 8 we're adding here 2 and we're assigning that that uh, the value of that expression in this variable result then we output the, that in the console so we have 10 then we have 8 because previously now the variable has the value 10 and we subtract 2 so we have we have uh, 8 then we well we have well, we, we have in here result equals to result times 2 so we are uh, and here is uh, 16 because we have 8 now and 8 times 2 is 16 so we get 16 here then we have uh, result divided by 2 and we get uh, 8 because 16 divided by 2 is uh, 8 then we have the modulus modulus so the reminder of uh, 8 divided by uh, 2 is 0 so we get 0 here and now let me show you the interesting thing as you can see this is underlined and this is underlined because there is a shorter way of writing this because those uh, things are so uh, so often used in programming uh, they they created created a shorter way to write the same thing so if i click here replace with plus and equals now we have the same thing but we have the we have this abbreviation written in this shorter way so let's let's do the same here replace with replace with the same here and the same here Now, sometimes you'll want uh, in your code to increment a certain variable by only by one, and you'll want also to decrement a variable only by one. And for that, we have a special operator, which is called the increment operator and the decrement operator. And to do that, I'm going to type here x equals to zero, but let's change that to var. And I will type here print line x plus plus. Then I'm going to put dollar sign curly braces. And here I'll type x. And to increment a variable only by one, we put plus plus. 
and this is called post fix incrementation and the next one I'm gonna add a print line here let's press ctrl D we have also prefix incrementation and there is a difference between them a very important difference which is gonna show different results okay this is called post fix incrementation because what this will do when this uh, line of code is gonna be executed it will output the value of X in the console and only after the output is done is gonna increment the value by one so you'll see in the output zero even though here it's incremented but now because it's post fix incrementation the variable will have the the value one next this is prefix incrementation what the prefix incrementation is doing is the opposite it's incrementing first the variable and at the same time it's outputting its value so we previously we had one because incremented this by one but as i said uh, it will first output to zero because it first outputs the value and then it increments the value and um, this variable now x has the value on and when it, this line of code is going to be executed that is defined here plus plus x now this will be incremented by one and it also going to output in the console the value which was incremented which is in this case x and that variable is going to be two so now if you run this code let's right click run main.kt We got the expected result, but let's put an equals here. Equals, equals, let's run it again. So we have zero and two as expected. And uh, there is uh, the same operator for decrementing a variable by one. So I can type here print line print line x minus minus equals to dollar sign x minus minus so this will decrement the variable by uh, by one but again this it will be the same uh, like uh, the previous it will be a, a post fix incrementation let's press ctrl D and plus plus so not plus plus uh, minus minus i here but it's before the variable so it's going to be prefix decrementation now and now you'll see the opposite you'll see 2 and 0 so let's run this so get x minus minus 2 as expected and then we get minus minus x zero let's also explain this to, to don't make things uh, confusing so this variable now has the value 2 from the previous uh, uh, incrementations that happened here and when it comes down here to execute this line of code now the because you, here we have uh, post fix uh, decrementation the first the, va the value of the variable the variable is going to be output in the console which is 2 so it's going to be output 2 and then it will decrement it by 1 so now the x has the value 1 when the next line of code is executed now it will decrement the value again by 1 and now it's going to be 0 and it will output this value in the console and now the resulting value is going to be 0 so this is what you get here uh, this is why you get here 0 and 2 and here 2 and 0 all right now i'm gonna end this video so now it's time to look at comments and comments are notes that you can add to your code and uh, they are uh, ignored by the compiler and usually they are they are used when you want to add some uh, description about the code so what uh, you want to indicate what the code is doing because you may wrote uh, some code and you come to that code a few e weeks later and forgot what it's doing and by putting comments you can uh, you can see specifically what that code is doing and in, in Kotlin we have two types of comments the first is so called end of line comment and uh, to add an end of line comment we put two slashes and here we put uh, our comment let's say here we are doing Op operations so this is an end of, end of line comment and this is uh, a text which simply says here we are doing operations 
and this is uh, as I said an end of flying comment the next comment that you can use is so called the block comment and to use a block comment we put slash asterisk and uh, now you can press enter or uh, you can uh, put uh, asterisk and slash to add, to, to add the, the, the next uh, to, to close this uh, comment and you press enter and as you can see it added automatically this uh, asterisk and slash or uh, you can type this yourself and here you can put some text which can be some uh, it, it, it can be something which you, you're gonna say what the code is doing so so those are the two types of comments that you can use in Kotlin the end of line comment and uh, the block the block comment and you can also use comments to disable some code so if I put two slashes here now that line of code is gonna be ignored by the compiler so this is our discussion about comments see you in the next video Alright, in order to introduce the next operators that you can use in Kotlin, I first need to introduce a control flow statement. Specifically, I'm going to show you how to use the if then else statement expression and we're going to see later why it's called the statement expression. And uh, we need to use a control flow statement because those operators can only work in conjunction with a control flow statement. You can use them only in conjunction with a control flow statement. So I'm going to declare a variable here, it's going to be a val it's going to be called is active and I'm going to sign true to it right then I'm going to press enter and on the next line I'm going to type if and wait for the suggestion we have parentheses you can press enter to fill that for us and inside the parentheses we define our condition and then we put curly braces so I'm going to put the left curly brace I'm going to press enter and the right curly brace is going to be added automatically so inside the, those parentheses we define our condition which can be either true or false and if this condition inside the parentheses is uh, true the code inside the curly braces uh, the code inside the, uh, this, uh, the, the block that is defined by those curly braces is going to be executed if this condition is false the code is not going to be executed so I can type here if is active and now I'm going to use the equals to operator so I'm going to put equal equals so look uh, at the difference. This operator that we have here is a single equals called the assignment operator because it assigns what's on the right to the variable on the left. This equal to operator is is uh, an operator which ch checks to see what that what if the operand on the left is the same as the operand on the right. So if I'm going to type here, it's active equal true. Then I'm going to type I'm going to type S O T for shortcut for the print line and I'm going to type the condition is true so now if you run this and we get the output the condition is true because it's active has the value true and here with the double equals we check in to see if this uh, the what is inside the in this variable it's active it's equal to true and it's equal to true because it has the value true and it outputs in the console the condition is true but if I change this to false so now it's not equal to true it's active has a different value and if you run this we get nothing because uh, the condition is false and the code inside the curly braces of the if is not executed but what we can do in this scenario we can add an else block so we can put here else so if the condition is false do something else so I'm going to type here SOT then I'm going to type the condition so this else part is going to be executed only if the condition inside the if is uh, false so I'm going to type the condition is false. So now if you run this, now we get the condition is false as you can see here because the if uh, first checks to see if the if uh, the condition inside the parentheses of the if is true and it's not true, it's false, and then it executes the block of code of the else because the else is executed if the if if the condition inside the if is false, and this is called the equals to operator. Now let's uh, b but before we, sh I'm going to show you another operator. 
here let's hover over here because it says that you can simplify boolean expression so what we can do is we can delete this equals equals to true and you can simply put when you have a boolean uh, variable you can simply type is active and this is equivalent to checking is active equals equals true because now if you run this the output will be the same so if you run this get the condition is false and if I change this to true and if I run this now we'll get the condition is true you get the condition is true let's put a single no let's delete the yes there let's run it again And we get the condition is true so is active without uh, equals equals to true or equals equals to false it's active is doing the same thing as having equals equal true so you check to see if this is uh, if this variable has the value true it's an abbreviation of uh, of uh, what we had previously next let's introduce the next operator and that is the greater than or equal to operator and I'm gonna create here a variable val my number is gonna be in camel case the name I'm gonna go assign here 5 I will delete this variable it's active because I'm not gonna use this now and now this is in red because it doesn't exist and I'm gonna type here if my number my number and now I'm gonna introduce the next operator is greater than 4 so what we are checking now is is the value assigned to my number variable greater than 4? Let's run our code to see what we get. Let's actually change the text to um, the number is greater greater than 4. So let's run this. So what we have in the parentheses is going to be evaluated to true or false. In, in this case, it's going to be true, and we get the number is greater than four. Now, if I uh, put here five, so if is my my number greater than five? No, it's false. So it's going to say the condition is false. So get the condition is false. It's executing the else part because the if check failed. So this is false. Let's press uh, Shift Control P on this. As you can see by looking at the pop-up boolean there, this is a boolean uh, expression. So it evaluates to true or false. And uh, if I put here greater than or equal to five, look what happens now. If I run this code. Now we get we get the number is greater than four. Why? Because now we have a, di a different operator, and this is the operator greater than or equal to. So our number is not greater than five, but it's equal to five. So it evaluates to true, and it's executing the code inside the curly braces of the if, so, which is this uh, print line. And uh, when we when we have a single uh, line of code, we can omit uh, curly braces, so we can delete curly braces and you can uh, execute the code so let's run this to see that we get the same output but use this only when you have uh, a single uh, a single line of code when you have multiple lines of code you'll always use the curly braces because if I put here curly brace so let's press ctrl z actually to have what we had previously now let's uh, delete the else because I want to show you what happens if you don't uh, put curly braces and you have multiple lines of code. So let's say that I want to to have this condition to be to be uh, to false. So let's put now my number is greater than five, which is not 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 true. My number is equal to five, and I want both those lines of code to be skipped. So I don't want this code to be 
those, those lines of code to be executed. So if I press Control D multiple times here, and uh, with curly braces, now if I run this, and the code is inside the code block, how it's called. This is how it's uh, standard called the code block. So if the the lines of code are inside the curly braces, they are part of the if. If this condition fails, the, the, the code block, the block of code uh, and uh, implicitly all the code inside the curly braces is going to be skipped. But if I don't use, para, uh, don't use curly braces, and now if I run this, look what happens. We get only the first uh, line of code uh, skipped, so this is skipped because when you don't use curly braces, only one line of code is part of the if or all the of the if, and uh, the next lines of code are executed because they are part of the flow of the program. They are executed because they are the next line of code. So this is why you need to use curly braces. Let's so let's press Control Z. If you have multiple lines of code, again, uh, uh, again always use curly braces. So let's press Control. Z to have the previous code. Now, what you can also do is that you can chain more ifs here. So you can type here else if, and we have a suggestion with parentheses. Let's put parentheses. My number, my number is greater than or equal to four. Let's put curly braces. And press enter. So now we chained another else if statement. So let's press Ctrl Alt L to format the code. And I'll add the line of code here. Let's type SOT2. And I'll type here the number is greater than 4. And here it should be 5. Why I type here for 4? Five. Now let's change this to four, and let's run our code. So we get the number is greater so is greater than four. So this line of code, this uh, check here if evaluates to false, and then the else if check evaluates to true and the code inside the curly brace of the else if it's executed and you can chain more else if uh, else ifs here so you can chain as many else ifs as you want here with uh, various conditions now i'm going to end this video here and uh, see you in the next video now it's time to look at the less than or less than equal to operator so i'm going to go down here i'll type if my number is less than four then I'm going to output in the console SOT, so print line, less than 4. Else, we're going to add the else, left curly brace, and press enter to add the right curly brace, SOT again. I'm going to type greater than 4. So now if you run this code, but so let's first comment this code. So let's go to code, comment to line comment. Not this, because we need this. Control Alt L to format the code. And uh, let's run our app to see what to get. And get greater than 4, but that is not correct. Our number is not greater than 4. But it executed the else part because the the if my number is less than 4 is false so it executed the else part which says it's greater than 4 what we can do is put here less than or equal to 4 so now if you run this you're gonna see less than 4 because now it's equal to 4 so we get less than 4 let's bring this variable down All right. Now you can also add another else else if here. My number. Let's say it's less than three. Curly braces. 
SRT for print line the number is less than 3 control alt to format the code and let's put here 2 so if you run this We get less than four because it uh, evaluates this branch and uh, it, it checks to see if this uh, expression so as press shift control p so it, it checks to see if this boolean expression number is less than or equal to four and it's correct it's less than or equal to four because it's two and it's executed it's executing as a consequence the code inside the curly braces for this if so it's not even though this condition is also true is uh, my number is less than uh, than three because it will first check this and it will uh, execute the code and it will uh, stop the, the the application. So you you need to be careful how you define your conditions in uh, when you have a more more uh, you have more real sieves and you use a lot of uh, a lot of comparison and so on. So uh, this is. Uh, So this is about this operator. Or uh, there is another operator that you can use, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna type here ex exclamation mark, and what this operator input in front of the equal is gonna do is gonna check to see if two numbers are not the same. So it's checking to see if the operands, respectively, what is in the left and what is on the right, are not the same. So what you're saying here, if my number is not equal to four. Then let's change the text accordingly. They are are not equal. So now if you run this, so now we're checking to see if they are not equal, and that is true. They are not equal. That is going to return true. So we're going to get they are not equal. So it's executing the code block of the if. And if I put here four. Now, because this is checking to see if a uh, number is less than, uh, if number is not equal to four, and the number is equal to four, this will evaluate to false. So if you run this, we'll get an output. Greater than four, so it, it, it executed the else part. So, because uh, this condition failed, and uh, it executed the else part, even though the number is not greater than four. So you can use the uh, logical not operator. This is how it's called to check if two operands are not the same. And you can use the logical not operator in front of any boolean expression. So you have a boolean expression. You can uh, let's say that I put here again less than or equal to four. So less than or equal to four. And if I want to change, because with the logical not operator, what you can do, if you put if you put it in front of a boolean expression, you can switch the value from false to true and from true to false. And the logical not operator can be uh, placed in front of any boolean expression. So if I put uh, this boolean expression, my number is less than or equal to four in parentheses, I can switch its value. But to make it more clear, I'm gonna de declare another variable down here, val is active and I'm going to assign false to it. Then I'm going to type here if is active I'm going to output in the console the user user is active else I'm going to output in the console SOT the user is not active so now the is active is set to false so it will execute the else part it will say the user is not active so let's run this and get the user is not active because this is set to false here so here we check and see if it's true and set to false but with a logical not operator you can put in front of the boolean expression so you can put this uh, the logical not operator which is an exclamation mark and now it will 
switch the value from false to true. So now if you run this, it will say the user is active. Even though, even though we uh, we uh, declare here to false, because here is going to switch the value to true, so it will be true. So now it's going to say the user is active, and you can do the same with true. So you can put here true, and uh, I can run this. And now this is going to be switched to false, and it's going to say the user is not active. Alright, so as you can see, it says the user is not active, because even though this has the value true, we, by putting the exclamation mark, which is a logical not operator, we change the value from true to false. And if you have a more complex uh, expression, like we have, like you have here, and as you'll see, there are uh, also some operators to create uh, to, to create more uh, boolean expression to combine boolean expression into one boolean expression which can return true or false but we're going to look at that in the next video and uh, what you can do you can put in parenthesis uh, the expression so the expression is uh, a construct which evaluates to single value so if i press shift control p on this if I select my number is less than or equal to 4, this is a, an expression. It's a construct which evaluates to a single value, true or false. And you can put parentheses around the, the Boolean expression. And, in, and before the parentheses, you put the logical not operator and you can switch the value from false to true and from true to false, as you saw. All right, so I'm going to end this video here and see you in the next video. Alright, so I deleted the code that we had previously because in this video I want to introduce another operator called the logical end operator. And the logical end operator is used to combine multiple expressions which themselves are going to return true or, or false. And uh, I'll type here two variables, val is active, going to be equal to true, and val score equals to 80. Now, I'm going to go down here and I'll type if, parenthesis, I'm going to type is active. You can type is active equals equals true, but it's going to underline and it's going to say that this is redundant because you can simply put is active to have the same effect. Now, to use the logical end operator, we put two ampersand signs here and we put now our second expression score. Let's say equals equals to 100. And the logical end operator returns true if all the expressions are true. So in this case, if the is active, it's equal to true. And if score is equal to 100, which is going to return true or false. Well, only then the logical end operator is going to return true. So I'm going to type here S -O -T. You are at the next level. Let's put an else. Let's type you are at the same level. So now if you run this, as I said, both expressions have to be true in order for the logical end operator to return for the and for the whole expression that we have here. To return true otherwise it will uh, return false and it will execute the else part so let's wait for the output and we get you are at the same level because this evaluates true only if both conditions are true so if i put now 100 here now if i run this Now you get you are at the next level because now both expressions respectively is active and score equals equals to 100 both are true and the entire expression returns true and in fact if you press shift control p here and you select this whole expression as you can see this whole expression it's a boolean expression so this entire thing that we have here highlighted in blue it's a, an expression which is going to return either true or false if both because you're using the logical operator, logical end operator, if both uh, expressions are true, respectively it's active, it's true, and the score is equal to 100. So you can use the logical end operator when you want to combine multiple expressions. And the logical operator works in this way, and the, the way is that it's 
returns true for the whole expression if all the expressions are true. So if you had another variable here like val, let's say, internet, I don't know, let's say, speed, let's put 4000 here. And if I put an another logical end operator here, internet speed equals equals to let's say 5000. Now if you run this, because now if I press shift control P on this, if I select the entire expression, so we have its active equals to and uh, then we have its score equals to 100 and internet speed equals to 500. I, I choose a, a random number there. It's not, does, that does not mean anything. And if I select the entire uh, expression which is highlighted now, so if you press shift control P and you select the entire expression highlighted in blue, as you can see the entire expression is going to return true or false. And uh, with the logical end operator, all expressions, this expression, this expression and this expression have to be true in order for the uh, for the whole expression to be true. So for the whole expression to be true, uh, all the expressions have to be true. So it's active has to be true, uh, it's active and score has to be true and internet speed has to be true. So all the expression have to be true. So now if you run this, because we have the 4000 value and uh, here we're checking for 5000, get you are the sa at the same level because this is false so the entire expression returns false now if you change uh, this to 5000 now if you run this we get you are at the next level because now all expressions so all expressions is active is equals true score equals true and internet speed equals true and the entire expression now evaluates to true, so you get the true back. And this is why you get you are at the next level. And you can put another end operator here. It depends on what you trying to build, what uh, program or what app. Alright, so I'm going to end this video here and see you in the next video. Alright, so now it's time to continue our discussion about operators. And I'm going to look at the next operator, which can be used to combine... Uh, multiple expression and that is the logical OR operator. And the log logical OR operator evaluates an expression or multiple expression in this case to true if one of the condition is true or if both condition are true. So let's see an example of this. But first let's comment the code that we have here because it will make uh, things confusing. So go to code and uh, select comment with light comment with line comment or uh, you can press the, the shortcut control uh, slash. Now, let's declare two variables down here. The first, uh, there, the first is going to be a val. I'm going to call it uh, num1. I'm going to assign a value of 5 to it. Second is going to be also a val. It's going to be called num2. And I'm going to assign a value of uh, 3 to it, or 4. Now, I'm going to type the if-then-else statement. I'm going to type the if keyword. Inside the parentheses. I'm going to put the condition. First is if num1 is greater than 0. And now, to use the logical OR operator, we type two vertical bars here. Now we put our next uh, condition or our next expression. And that if num2 is also greater than 0. And we put a curly brace. Press enter to, to add the right curly brace. And we put also the else part. And inside the curly braces of the if, let's uh, print some text. Let's say the condition is true. Alright, now if you run this code, You're going to see the output, the condition is true, because now both conditions are true, and uh, the logical operator returns true if both conditions are true, or if one uh, of the condition is true. So let's see if we change this to minus 3. 
And now our second condition num2 greater than 0 is false. So now this is also going to evaluate to true because the uh, logical OR operator returns true if uh, one, atle if one uh, of the conditions is true or if both conditions are true. So you now get condition is true. But if you change this to also to minus 5, now our both, both conditions are false. Now you're going to see that uh, it's going to be executed the else part because this condition now is going to be false because both conditions, both expressions, num1 greater than 0 and num2 greater than 0 are false. Alright, so let's change it back to 5. Now if you run this code, you're going to see the condition is true because at least one of the condition is true, which is this one, num1 greater than 0, even though the num2 condition is false. Alright, and this is how you can use the logical OR operator. Alright. Now it's time to see how we can use the if then else statement as an expression. And that means that uh, the if then else statement can return a value which can be stored in a variable. So let's see how can we can do that. But first, uh, actually let's keep this code that we have here. And uh, to use the if then else statement as an expression, we declare a, um, a variable first. So I'm going to declare a val. And let's give it a name and we'll call it, uh, let's say, text. And to use the if then else statement as an expression, we put equals, and after the equals, we put our if then else statement. Now, we need to assign a value to our uh, variable text to use it as, a, as an expression. And the value is going to be the last expression in the, in the curly braces. So here, if I type the text, Let's say uh, this uh, is text 1. And down here, if I type in quotation marks, this is text 2. Now, if I add a println here at the end, and if I print the value of the variable text that we declare above, let's put a dollar sign. And if I type text here, now you can see our variable. It says that it's of type string. So if I run this code now, you're going to see first this println inside the curly braces, which says the condition is true. And uh, after that, you're going to see this text being assigned to our variable text. And uh, it will be output, out, output it down here by the println statement. So you see this is text... Uh, Two. Actually, I was wrong. That condition is false because uh, you have minus five and minus three, and this condition value is false. And uh, the last, the last uh, expression in the in the curly braces is assigned as a value to our variable. Now, uh, what you can also do is to remove the curly braces, but uh, it's recommended to use to not uh, use the curly braces if you have one only one statement. Uh, in your uh, if then else statement. So let's del delete the println uh, here. Let's delete the curly brace here. Let's also delete the curly brace here. Let's delete the println statement here. And let's also delete the curly brace here. So now this will work the same, uh, it will work like previously, but uh, so now you'll see the same uh, output without the condition, without this text, the condition is false because now we don't have uh, the println statement. So now we get this is text two because this condition evaluates to false and it assigns this value to our variable text. Then down here it prints. So also you see that this uh, they are not aligned here. This our variable and to format your code, you just go to code and uh, click reform reformat code or press Control Alt L on Windows or you can um, use another shortcut. You can use the corresponding shortcut on uh, Linux or Mac. So click on code. And now we're going to see that uh, our code is formatted. If you run this, now see this is text 2. But let's change this to 5. Now this condition will evaluate to true. And this expression is going to be is going to be assigned to our variable text. So if we run this, You're going to see this now our variable text 
is assign the value of this is text one because this condition is true and assign this value. To make things more clear, clear you can uh, use uh, you can uh, you can uh, type your code something like this. Now this does the exact same the exact same thing as previously. So if you run this code now. You're gonna see that now this it says the same thing. This is text one. Now, you may be wondering what type this variable is. So if you hover over it, it says that uh, it is of type string. But look, uh, what can I do? I can put here a number. So if this condition evaluates to false, this is gonna be assigned to our variable test. So if I run this now. Now get this text one, and let's uh, put here minus five for the condition to be false. And if you run this code now, now you're gonna see five. And you may be wondering how this uh, makes any sense because uh, previously our variable was of type string. But if you hover over here, now it says val text, and the type is uh, this thing comparable uh, anyway. Uh, but what is uh, simply doing here is looking at the condition. It's looking first at the if statement, and uh, if this condition is true, then it assigns our text to our variable, and then it infers the type to be a string, right? If this condition is false, then this part is skipped, and then it assigns this value of five to our variable text, and now and then uh, our uh, variable is going to be of type int. So there is no case in which uh, both uh, both uh, values going to be assigned to our variable. So this is why you can uh, use here text and here uh, an integer even though but if you declare explicitly here that this variable is going to store only strings, only sequence of characters or text, now here you'll get an warning because it says the integer literal does not conform to the expected type stream. So in other words, we cannot put here uh, uh, a number because we said that explicitly here that this is going to store only strings. But if you omit the type, that is going to work. So you can decide what, uh, de depending on the context, what to choose. So this way of uh, writing the if then else statement in one single line, like we have here, it's okay as long as we use the if then else statement as an expression, or in other words, if you're assigning. Um, a value to a variable, like in our case. But if you have multiple instruction in your, uh, also if you have a single single instruction, you, you can also omit the curly braces. But um, most of the time, it's recommended to use the curly braces because that allows us uh, that allows us to uh, execute more than on uh, uh, instruction or the statement in your code, and uh, it also makes the code uh, more clear. So let's change this code. Uh, from an expression to just an if then else statement to see why. So I'm going to change this. I'm going to add the curly braces. Let's format the code. Press Ctrl uh, Alt L. All right. And also let's change this. Let's delete this. Uh, text. Let's add two println uh, statements here. Right. Now if you run this code, you're going to see this part execute the else part because this condition is false. Both uh, of our condition, respectively num1 great, is not greater than 0 and uh, also num2 is also not greater than 0. So this is going to return false and it's going to execute the else part. Right, but now if you change this to 5, and now one of the conditions is going to be true, and uh, as you know, this entire expression is going, to wait, is going to evaluate to true now, because at least one of the, the expression is true. So if you run this code, Now I see this condition is true, and also we see our uh, our second println statement. This condition is true in some text. 
But um, look what happens uh, if I uh, let's say if I uh, delete the else part, right? And if I delete the curly braces here, all right? And now if I run this code. You see the now both uh, statements are executed, but as I said, if you don't use curly braces, which one, just only one of the uh, statements in is going to be executed. So why you have uh, both of these? Because the first is execu executed as part of the if uh, statement because this condition is true, and the next one is executed because it's part of the code because it's read from top to bottom. But if uh, I uh, change this to false, and now I want both condition, both uh, statements, uh, respectively with this one and this one, to not be executed. Look what happens. I get this condition is written some text. So the first uh, instruction in our if uh, then statement is omitted because it's part of the if then statement, but the second one it's uh, executed because it's part of the code, so it's going to be read uh, uh, anyway. So this is why you need to always use curly braces. In this way, the entire code is, is going to be either executed or uh, omitted. So this is our discussion about the if-then-else statement. And uh, you should always use the curly braces. And uh, for the else uh, part, you also you should use the curly braces. And uh, only omit the curly braces if you have, if you have only single uh, one single ex uh, statement or uh, one single expression you, if you want to use uh, the if then statement as an expression to assign a value to a variable but if you have just one single uh, statement let's say you have something like this you can omit the curly braces like this so now you can see that everything works uh, fine so you can use it uh, like this, if you have one single statement, like we have here, you just print some text to our console, or if you use it as an expression, so if you store a, a value in a variable. So see you in the next video. Alright, now it's time to look at the next control flow statement that we can use in uh, Kotlin besides the, the if then else statement and that is the when statement or the when expression but first let's create a new project I'm going to call it control flow it should be in Pascal case select IntelliJ click on next and finish right now let's delete the code inside the curly braces let's hide the project pane and uh, let's first declare a variable it's going to be a val it's going to be called alarm and I'm going to assign uh, a value of uh, 12 to it now to, to declare a when statement we type here when we put parentheses and inside the parentheses we put our argument in this case it's our variable alarm next put space and we put the curly braces press enter and now we put the expression here so here I'm gonna put uh, the value let's say 12 now I'm gonna put a minus sign and a greater than sign so we have this arrow and uh, here I'm gonna type print ln this is the code that is gonna be executed and I'm gonna type the time is dollar sign alarm let's press ctrl D to duplicate this two times or three times and uh, let's change the last one to an else all right Let's change those values here to 7 and 14. Now let's run this code to see what to get in the output and uh, after that we're going to discuss our code. 
so we get in the output the time is 12 and uh, we get that because what is what the when statement is doing it's using this argument that we passed here in this case is our variable called alarm and it's comparing this uh, the value of this uh, argument with all the branches that we have here respectively it's going to compare it with uh, the expression that we have on the left because on the left we have the expression the this arrow sign is going to is is uh, saying execute execute this code on the right if this expression on the left is true in uh, this case if our ala alarm equals equals 12 and it's true we have uh, a value of 12 so this branch is executed and it executes the code uh, on the right which is this this the alarm is uh, 12 but if i change this to 7 now And if I run this code, now you're going to see the time is 7. And if I change this to, let's say, 13, and here we have no 13, the else part is going to be executed, similar to our uh, if then else statement. And we get the time is 13. So it was, it was executed the uh, else part now. Now, in, we can combine uh, those uh, expressions by putting a colon. And, and we can combine them and putting them on, on one single line. So I can uh, put here colon. I can type here 7 and 14. Now, I'm going to delete those two. Now, it will check to see if our uh, alarm argument has the value either 12 or 7 or 14. So, um, let's change it to 14 to see. So now if you run this code, you're going to see that uh, this will uh, evaluate to true and this code on the right is going to be executed. So now again, the, the time is 14. And if I change this to 7, Again, this will evaluate true because one of those uh, expression is true. So you get the time is 7. Alright. What you can do next is we can check to see if a number is in a certain range. So we can put another uh, another expression here. And, and here I can type in. And the in keyword is used to check to see if a number is, to see if a number is in a certain range. And to declare a range, we type the range. Let's say that I want to check uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, one to, to, to from one to ten. We put two dots, dot, dot, ten. Now, what this is gonna do is gonna check to see if our uh, alarm argument, and in this in this case our alarm variable, is in the range from one to ten. Now I'm gonna put a minus sign and a great uh, and a greater than sign to have the arrow and here I'm going to type uh, the code that I want to be executed in this case it's just a println statement and I'm going to type uh, the number is in the range 1.7 now if you run this let's run it from here We get the time is 7 because uh, the first branch is uh, checked and this branch is true. And uh, in effect it executes the code on the right and uh, the next branches are uh, left off, are not executed. To, and to change that let's put this first. So let's copy this. Now if you run this code. Now get the number is in range 1 to 10. And it's true, our 7 is in the range from 1 to 10. What you can do is also you can use the logical NOT operator. So you can put here the logical NOT operator, which is an uh, exclamation uh, mark. And this now will negate this value. So if you run this code now, you'll get the output uh, 7. The, the time is 7. So now you get the output. The time is 7 because this, will, uh, this switches this value from true to false and execute this uh, part. 
Now, let's delete this. What we can also do is that we can put curly braces. So I can put curly braces. Press enter. The same here. And here also. And it's recommended to use the curly braces only if you have multiple statements in your code. In our case, we have only one single statement, which is this println, which outputs uh, some text to the console. And uh, the uh, when statement, as I said, can be used as an expression. So I can type here a val, let's say uh, text, and I can assign the when expression to our uh, text variable. Now, we need to give back uh, a value to our uh, text. So instead of printing this text, I can uh, delete this. Let's put it like this. Now, the last expression in our uh, block of code, which is uh, now we have a single expression, but if you have multiple expressions, let's say that we have here uh, another println. Let's say some text. So similar to our if then else expression, the last line of code, the last expression is going to be assigned to our variable text. Now let's print this down here to our console. So let's type println. And let's put directly here text. Now if you run this code, Now you're going to see the text, the number is in the range 1 to 10 because it checks to see if uh, this uh, expression on the left is true. Then it executes the, the code inside the curly braces, it, which is uh, this expression. And because now we're using the when as an expression, it assigns this expression, this text or variable text. Then it outputs that value with the println down here in our console. So we get the number is in the range 1 to 10. All right. Now, uh, but what if I want to put here uh, a less than sign? So you, what if I want to put here if uh, it's less than 7, our uh, alarm argument? I can do that. The only way to do that is by, uh, let's delete this now. Let's put 7, not here. Let's press Ctrl Alt L to format the code. All right. Now, the only way to put a greater than sign or a less than sign or a greater than equal or greater or a less than equal sign is to delete the argument here. But let's first delete the curly braces to make uh, things more clear. So let's delete the curly braces. Let's delete this now because here uh, we have two lines of code, so we need to use curly braces. This is why I deleted the printl in there. And again, you should always use curly braces if you have multiple lines of code. But in our case, we have a simple line of code, which is uh, the text on the right, which is going to be assigned to our uh, variable text, and it's going to be output in the console. So always use curly braces if you have multiple lines of code. All right, all right. Now this is more concise and uh, more clear. And let's say that I want to check to see if uh, our alarm is less than, uh, say, uh, 10. Uh, to do that, we need to delete the argument here all right and now what can i do is i can put here our uh, alarm variable and here i can put less than or equal to 10. so now here we have a boolean expression on the left sorry so now we have a boolean expression here on the left and this will check to see if our uh, alarm, our variable alarm, alarm has a value which is less than or equal to 10, which is true. We have a 7 here. So now if you run this code, uh, but uh, let's delete this because uh, we need to have uh, now Boolean expression here because here we, we cannot, uh, here we have uh, just literal types. So here I need to put, uh, let's say, if 
just type alarm equals equals 8 or two vertical bars alarm equals equals 7 so now if you run this code now you get the output the number is in the range 1 to 10 because now this on the this expression on the left is true and it executes this text uh, it assigns this expression to our variable text and it prints down here the, that value so we get here the number is in the range 1 to 10 but uh, this condition is also true so if I s s swap those two so if I put this one below because as I said if one uh, one of the expression evaluates to true the next uh, ones the the one which are below so this in this case this one is true are not be are not going to be executed are uh, skipped it only executes uh, this code and uh, the subsequent ones are uh, omitted so let's put this below it's good to remember this so now if you run this code now get the time is 7 because now this evaluates true even though this below is also true because our uh, uh, alarm is uh, less than 7 but because this evaluates to true it executes the code which is on the right which is uh, assigning this uh, expression to our text and then it leaves the one expression it's not going uh, down to execute the next one so it breaks uh, right there and it stops it actually stops right there and it's not executing uh, the next branch so this is our discussion about the when uh, statement statement and the when expression see you in the next video now it's time to start a discussion about nullability in Kotlin but first I'm going to create a new project I'm going to call it null make sure to have the language Kotlin selected and for the build system IntelliJ also make sure to have the JDK selected here and I'm going to check this little box to generate the main function for us and that code that comes with the main function so I'm going to click on create to create a new project now our project is going to be created in a short moment So we got our uh, project created and we get our, our, we got our main function uh, auto generated here for us because we checked that box. So I'm going to delete this because I don't need this code. And I'm going to hide the project pane. So what is a null value? A null value is basically when you assign to a variable nothing. Syntactically speaking, you assign null to it. But what that means is that you have a variable which has no value, which has no memory reference. And if you try to do some arithmetic operation with that variable, you'll get in an impossible scenario where you have nothing try to do some work and that will, will throw a, a null pointer exception. And this is particularly bad because uh, null, the null pointer uh, exceptions are only thrown at runtime and not at compile time. So you could have uh, your program working well and uh, having no problems. And uh, at some point you try to I don't know press a button and somehow somehow that uh, pressing of the button is uh, using that variable which has a null value and then it's going to throw a null, null pointer exception and uh, your app will crash and Kotlin aims to avoid uh, and to eliminate null pointer exceptions and null values that is not to say that we can't have a null value in a Kotlin but it's very hard to have uh, one so let's see why. So what Kotlin has done to make uh, null values and implicitly null pointer exceptions very hard to get. It first made all its types by default non-nullable. And that means that you cannot assign uh, null to it. So if I declare here a variable called text, I'm going to declare the type explicitly. So it's going to be a string. And if I assign null, so to assign null to a variable, we'll just type the null and we have the null keyword. We can't because this variable by default and all the variables by default are non-nullable and that means that you cannot assign a value. So if you hover over this underline it says null cannot be a value of a non-null type string. But what if I want to assign uh, null to it? What if, if I want to have null for some reason? In that case you go at the end of the type and you put 
question mark and that means that now you have a nullable type that means that you can assign null to this uh, variable so if i put question mark here now i can assign uh, null to this variable so this is uh, how we can assign null to a variable by putting the question mark at the end of the type because that is saying to the compiler hey i'm gonna let i'm gonna let me to assign null to this variable so to avoid the, that uh, underline in red now if i try to print this so if i put here print line and i put here text what do you think we'll get in the output and the output will get null you know you don't get null pointer exception so now if i hide this and uh, let's say that i want to get the length of uh, let's say of the text so let's say that uh, i assign here uh, some text well, actually let's put a name here name and let's and uh, if i try to get the length here so if i put here dot length i have an underline which says only safe and we have this question mark that on non null or asserted uh, and we have this uh, this operator calls are allowed on a nullable receiver of type string so it's saying that we, we can uh, we can only get uh, because you, this this variable can have a null value but we know that it doesn't but the compiler is saying to us uh, because we said that this can have null is saying to check first that this variable is not equal to null and then try to get its length and let's do that in the long way first so let's delete this so let's actually just copy this and we type if we put parenthesis if text not equal to null then we're gonna output is then we're gonna get its length so we're gonna type here text that length so now the compiler is happy because it's it's uh it's ensured that it's not gonna have null because we checked here especially that this variable uh, should have uh, it should not have null in order to get the length so now if i run this I get four so this is the length so we have four uh, letters here and I, I can also add the else part which is uh, which is gonna say the very well is null so if the variable is null the else part is gonna be called so now if you run this We'll get also four, but I'm gonna assign. I'm gonna reassign this variable, so I'm gonna change it to var first. So we put here var, and put here text equals null. So now our variable is null, and this uh, check is gonna fail, and, and it's gonna execute the else part. So if I run this code, so we get the variable is null because now on the on the third line we assign null to it so this uh, if fails and is executed the else part but as you can see it's a lot of code just to check to to check and imagine if you have uh, multiple variables to check to, to always check for this uh, to, the, to, that the variable is not null then print its length and there is a shorter way in kotlin to do that and uh, we saw as a suggestion how to do that uh, previously so if i press ctrl z to uh, undo our code so if i press still pressing now if i hover over this error that we had previously which says only save call so and we have this uh, operator and this is called the save call operator and if i put here just a question mark this is equivalent to having a if which is checking to see if the length is null if, and if the length is uh, null then it's gonna say null or and if it's not null it's gonna just output uh, 4 so now if i run this so this is equivalent to the if uh, that if the, the the if statement that we had previously so we have 4 so 
but if I sh and if I assign null, so if I type here, uh, let's change it to var the first. So if I assign here text equals null, we'll simply get null. We get null. But what if I want to get that uh, null pointer exception for whatever reason? What can I do? Also, the compiler uh, it helping is helping uh, us also there. So because if I delete that uh, save call operator, which is just a question mark that, and that is basically saying, hey, if this text is not null, then output in the console, uh, then get then get the length and then output that in the console. If it's null, just say null. So this is how the save call operator works. But if I delete this, as you can see, there is another operator and is and uh, is this operator which is uh, two exclamation uh, marks and this operator is basically saying hey if uh, this variable has null then throw that exception but uh, if uh, it's not null just output uh, just output the length so if i put two exclamation marks here but for whatever reason it's not uh, the our text that length is not getting the length and i think this this is because we assign uh, to our text uh, variable here null it um, it can't uh, it has a it has a, prob a problem uh, with inferring uh, what type this variable is even though here is saying that it's a string so we should uh, should we should be able to call that length and to avoid this we just put null at uh, when we declare the variable so we assign here null so we put here null. Now if you run this, because you have uh, the two exclamation mark operator, now this will throw that null pointer exception that I talked about. So we get exception in thread main, uh, so it doesn't matter what thread main is now. For now. You get Java that length null pointer exception, so this is the, the null pointer exception. But if uh, we assign down here this variable text equals uh, some text, and now if we run this code, we get 9 because this is the length of this. So this is how we can use this operator. The next operator that we can use is the Elvis operator. And to show you how uh, that works, I'm going to delete this code. Now, I'm going to declare another variable up here. So I'm going to call it text2. We put equals and we type text. Now, to use the Elvis operator, we put a question mark and a colon. And now we need to... Uh, type something on the right of the Elvis operator. So we put here some text. I'm going to explain immediately how this works. So I'm going to type here uh, some text. Now what the Elvis operator is doing is saying if this variable text is null then assign what is on the right to this variable text to if this uh, variable uh, text is not null then assign what is to this variable to our variable text uh, to our variable text to and now let's uh, let's type here text to and uh, let's delete the length so now if you run this code Let's uh, actually put something more discreet, like uh, the variable is null. So, if we run this code now, we get the variable is null because it uh, checks to see to, to see if this uh, variable on the left is null, and if it is, if it is null, it's gonna it assigned this to, to a variable takes two and then you output that in the console but if this is not null then it's going to assign what is on this what whatever value this variable has to our variable takes two so if now i put here text equals this 
variable is not null. Now if I run this, now this will, this will evaluate to true, so it's gonna assign whatever value is on the left to our variable text to our variable text too, and we're gonna see in the output uh, the variable is not null. So when a variable text two has now the value assigned from our for this variable. So this is the shorter way of writing. Let me show you how we will write this in the longer way. So you, in the longer way you will have something like this. So let's delete this code. Actually, yeah, yeah, let's delete this code. We'll have a variable called text2 uh, and uh, it's gonna have an empty string. So we would, what we would have to do without the Elvis operator, we have to first check if text uh, not equal to it's not equal to null. Then um, we're gonna co call our variable uh, text two, and we're gonna assign uh, text to it. Else, we're gonna assign to our uh, text two variable the text. This variable is null. So this is the longer way we're doing uh, of what we did previously. So if I press Ctrl Tilt to format the code. Now if you run this, you'll see the, uh, the, the same output. The variable is not null. So we get the variable is not null. And this is the longer way of doing the same thing. So if I assign here, uh, if I assign, actually if I delete this, and the variable will have null. Let's press Ctrl Z. If I run this, now the else part is executed, so our variable text two, it will be it will have the this is variable this variable is null the text assigned to it, and then it's going to output that in the console. So this is the longer way of doing what of what we had uh, previously. So if I press Control Z to have uh, the Elvis operator back, so that was the longer way of doing what of what we're doing here in one simple line of code. So this is our discussion about uh, nullable types and uh, uh, I hope that you got a lot from this uh, video and see you in the next video. Right, now it's time to start our discussion about functions but first let's create a new project and I'm gonna speed up the process now a little bit because we already did this a few times so I'm gonna call it functions, should be in Pascal case, select IntelliJ, click on next and click finish. Right, let's delete the code inside the curly braces. Let's hide the project pane. And uh, let's start by saying that until now we have written our code only inside the main function. And uh, occasionally we have called the println function to output some code uh, to the console. But uh, as I said at the beginning of our videos, you can uh, create your own functions in uh, Kotlin. So let's see how we can do that. So go down here at the end of our main function at the end of our uh, enclosing curly brace and to declare a function we type the keyword fun we put space next we need to give a name to our function and the name of the function should say what the function is doing and uh, generally it's a verb I'm gonna call this function say hello and it should be in camel case next we put parentheses because uh, functions can take input to work with it and next we put curly braces because this is where we're going to put our uh, instructions for our statement. This is where we're going to put our logic. Now, let's add the print uh, ln uh, statement here. Let's type the text hello. And now let's run this code. Now, as the input, we don't see nothing here because if you hover over this say hello function, it says function say hello is never used because in order for that this in order for this function to be used, you need to call it from main function. And to call it from main function, we type here 
the name of the function you can type it uh, entirely you or you can uh, type uh, start typing and uh, IntelliJ is going to be is going to give you some suggestions so press enter to fill in fill in that for you and also press control alt l to format the code now let's run our code Now you're gonna see that it says in the output hello because the main function executes in what's inside the curly braces and uh, on the line 2 it says that we have a function that we're calling here a function executes it executes the the say hello function the code inside the say hello function in this case it's a simple println uh, statement and then uh, it outputs that to the console and uh, it exits the the code it uh, finishes the process because you don't have anything else below for say hello but what we can do is put another say hello here to call our function again and now we're gonna see the output hello two times because now we're calling the say hello function first on the line two and second on the line three so it will be executed two times so you can see that uh, in this way functions are uh, reusable and uh, are separate chunks of code can, which can be can be reused and uh, you'll see that they can be reused in uh, specific cases now as i said functions can take input and to make a function to receive some input we need to define what is called a parameter and to define a parameter we type the name of the variable first i'm going to call it name and we need to explicitly provide a type here so for the type i'm going to choose string and we need to explicitly provide a type here because is there there is no way for the type to be inferred here because uh, the value that you're going to pass to this uh, say hello function is going to be here so it's impossible uh, to know uh, to what uh, kind of value we're, we're going to pass to it so this is why you need to explicitly say what data this parameter or this variable is going to store so let's delete the second say hello now let's uh, change the text that we have here in the println let's uh, let's refer the parameter name so put a dollar sign and start typing name and you can see that it has this p for parameter and press enter now what is going to happen now is that this say hello function is, is going to be called is going to be executed from our main function and uh, the code inside the say hello function is also going to be executed and uh, specifically is going to execute this uh, this uh, text that we type here to be outputted it's going to execute the hello and then it's, it's going to execute uh, what what value if we have passed as an argument for this parameter and uh, if you don't know what an argument is the argument is the value that you pass to the um, to the function so in this case up here we need to pass uh, some text so i'm gonna put a name here not here it should be in uh, double quotation marks and we see that we have a hint here it says which is which says the name of the very or the name of the parameter which is name now what is going to happen now is this uh, this uh, say hello function is going to be called uh, and this value that we passed here is going to be used in our println statement where uh, where, we are, where we're referring now which is uh, here you here we're using the name and it's going to use that value and that value is going to be outputted down here and let's run the code to see now we get hello alex because now it's using the value that we passed here as the as an argument to the parameter name and it's using that uh, value down here where uh, we type the println uh, statement or function now functions can take multiple arguments multiple uh, arguments and uh, to do that we need to define uh, i should say that you can define more parameters for uh, the function and a function can take multiple arguments and to define another parameter we put a comma here 
and uh, we type the name of our uh, parameter is going to be age and we need to provide the type and I'm going gonna to provide the type as an integer as an integer because it's going to store whole numbers and uh, here we're going to put an exclamation mark and I'm going to type your age is now we need to refer the parameter age and also we need to provide the value for that parameter now if you go up here now it says that you need to provide a value for the parameter has age it says no value pass for the for the parameter age so here we need to type on uh, a value for our parameter that we define so let's say 22 all right now if you run this code now those uh, parameters that we define here are going to use the values the arguments that we type here inside uh, our uh, curly braces or uh, how is often called the body of the function or the code block so it's going to use the values here and here now another important thing to know is that you can not change the value of a parameter so if you type here age equals let's say 30 now I'm gonna, if you hover over here because you have an underline it says val cannot be reassigned because those parameters are, are declared as vals as variable vals so that means that they are immutable you cannot change their values the only way to use a variable which can uh, have his value change is to declare on so if you declare here a, va a variable i'm going to declare it as a var to change its value i'm going to call it number and uh, if i uh, assign here a value of 50 now i as you know you can change now his value to let's say 70 and you can also assign the parameter here to our variable number and now we can change its value also you can put number and you can put another value here all right another important thing to know is that this variable that we define here also the parameters are scoped inside the function say hello in other words they cannot be referred or access outside of the, the curly braces of the say hello function so if i try to access that uh, number variable here it's not working if i try to access access here on the main function let's say I type number i can't because it's scoped inside the say hello function uh, it exists only inside the say hello function the same thing with the parameters age or uh, name so in this way you can see that functions can uh, be very useful because they are uh, chunks of code which are reusable and uh, flexible and um, to see an example uh, with this let's declare another function down here let's call it uh, let's uh, type the fun keyword let's call it get data and uh, this function is going to mimic the uh, a real function uh, in a real app which can uh, get some data from the internet of course that we're not going to get some data from the internet but we're going to uh, mimic that behavior so here i'm going to define a parameter let's call it uh, data and for the type let's choose string right let's uh, put the curly braces and uh, here let's add the print uh, ln statements and uh, here we're going to print your data is and uh, I'm going to refer the parameter data All right now what I can do up here is to define a boolean uh, variable it's going to be a val I'm going to call it has internet connection I'm going to assign a value of true to it now I can put an if statement here now I can check to see if that uh, expression is true so I can put equal equals true or use the shortcut because it's better here I'm gonna put the curly braces now I'm gonna call the get data function only if this condition is true 
So in our case it's true, that, but in a real app that can be can be false. So in that case you can do something else. As you're gonna see, we're gonna let's also add the else part here. And here we're gonna call another function, which can which is gonna be called in the case that uh, there is no internet connection. All right. So above here you can put some logic to get the data from the internet. But because this is a simple example, we're gonna type here dire directly. Uh, some text let's put some data and uh, for the else part in the case that uh, there is no internet connection that variable is false we can declare another function down here to, uh, and I'm gonna call it fun show message and uh, this is not gonna have any parameters it's gonna have only simple println uh, statement and it's gonna say that uh, there is no internet connection. Alright, so now let's go up here now. And now you're gonna call the show message uh, function in the else part. Now, if you run this code, you're gonna see "Hello Alex," which is our uh, first function up here on the line two. Your age is 22, and next to see your data is some data because it uh, executes the "Say Hello" function. Then it declares this variable, and uh, it checks. It checks to see if this condition is true, and this condition is true, and uh, it executes this function, get data. So uh, this is why you get your data is some data. But if uh, for whatever reason the user has no internet connection, let's say you assign a value of false to it, to this. Now this function is going to be called show message. So this function show message now is called and the code inside the show message function is uh, called which is println with this println uh, statement which says there is no internet connection. In a real app you can have uh, some logic to show a uh, dialog that there is no internet connection. And uh, you can see that in this way with functions you can divide your uh, code in uh, different chunks of uh, different in different chunks of uh, code which can be called in very specific cases so in this case uh, we only call uh, our f functions only in, in the case that we have internet connection or in the case that we don't have internet connection so in this way uh, we have uh, divided our code in different uh, chunks of code which can be called in different uh, uh, specific uh, scenarios and in this way uh, uh, we can write a program because uh, if you just put your code, all of your code in the main function and you execute that code uh, from top to bottom, you, you cannot create a program like that. So uh, this was an additional uh, discussion with uh, the get data and show message and uh, I hope that I not uh, confused you a lot. So see you in the next video. All right. So in the last video, we've seen how we can uh, create functions, how we can uh, call our functions, how we can define parameters uh, to our functions, how we can uh, send uh, data to our function as arguments. Now it's time to see how we can return some data from a function. But let's first read the code that we have here to make things more clear. And uh, the code inside the function, uh, the main function. Alright, now let's define another function. I'm going to type the fun keyword space and it's going to be called get max. And this function is going to return uh, the maximum of uh, two integers. So I'm going to define here a parameter. I'm going to call it a. In a real app, you should use more descriptive names. It's going to be of type int. And the next one is going to be called b. And it's going to be also of type int. I'm going to put the curly braces and I'm going to press enter. Now, to get the 
maximum uh, value between these uh, two numbers. We type here, we type here val max, and here we type an if expression. So we type if a greater than b, then we're gonna assign a to our max uh, variable. Else gonna assign b and in the case that the two numbers are equal b is gonna be assigned to our uh, max uh, max variable now in order to return this uh, to in order to return this uh, value to our uh, function we need first to, def to to say to the function what kind of data is gonna return and to do that go here at the enclosing uh, parenthesis and uh, if you don't have uh, spaces here or you uh, wondering about uh, how to have uh, the proper formatting you just press uh, Control alt l and the code is going to be formatted all right and here we put a colon and here we, de we define what uh, what type of data this function is going to return and in this case going to be an integer so we put int here and this is similar to the way we declare a type for a variable. Now, if you, go, if you go down here now, you see that it says a return expression is required in a function to block body. So now we need to return this, uh, now we need to return some data that we define here. In this case, we need to return uh, an integer. And to return uh, the maximum value to our function, we type here return, the keyword return, and our value which is uh, our variable max and press enter now if you call this function in our main function get max and now let's also pre press ctrl alt l to format the code and here we, we let's say that we type uh, two arguments for our parameters let's say that we put five and nine now if you run this code Now you're gonna see in the output nothing because uh, in order to in order to get this uh, value, we need to retain this value to capture this value in a variable. And to do that, we define a variable uh, in front of our uh, get max function. It's also be uh, a val. I'm gonna call it max, and we're gonna assign uh, the get max uh, uh, function to our variable, and that is gonna return. Uh, or a maximum uh, number. Now uh, you now you may see that you have uh, two names. Uh, you have the same name here and the same name, and that is not a problem because uh, this variable max that we have inside the the get max function exists only inside the the get max function. It's scoped only here. This is why you can use uh, the same name here. So if I try to type here also max to declare the variable of, which is going to be called max, I can't because uh, it says conflicting declaration because if you because the compiler doesn't know if you assign a value let's say to this it will not know what variable to 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 call because you have the same name but uh, up here is not a problem because uh, this is in uh, the block of the main function so it exists only here and this exists only here now we have called our uh, get max function and this function is going to return the maximum of uh, these two values which is 9 now we need to print this value in our console and to print this value we just type here println and uh, we're referring our uh, max variable now if you run this code you're going to get 9 because uh, our get max function is called uh, the two the two arguments are passed to, to our function then the code inside the, our get max function it's uh, executed it compares these two, two numbers and uh, if uh, a is greater than b then it assigns a to our max uh, a max variable or it's gonna if that is not true it's gonna assign the value of uh, b and then it returns that max value to the to the function which is uh, called so if this function returns that value here and and here we retain we capture that value which, re which is returned from the get max function in our max variable and then we print that uh, max variable with our println uh, 
function or a statement and then we see the output in our console 9 right another important thing to know is that after we type the return call or the return keyword the the function is lived the function is uh, stopped there so if we add uh, other text here let's say we add here a println and we type here uh, some text we see that this is highlighted and it says that it's, this is a reachable code because after we typed our return max our uh, function is uh, stopped it's lived and uh, it's not executing any any code below of, uh, of that return uh, uh, call or, or uh, of that return uh, keyword right another important thing that you can do with uh, return keyword is that you can uh, return from a function without returning any kind of value and in that case it will have the same effect and uh, that means that it will uh, leave the function right there even though we don't return any kind of value so we, we, i can type here return but let's uh, delete here the type because now it's expecting a value to be returned and now this will have the same effect it will leave the function right there and it will not execute any any kind uh, any line of code below of our return uh, keyword so if i type here uh, a println uh, statement and i put some text here As you can see, this has the same effect. Uh, if you type the return keyword in your function, it will stop the execution of the function and every line of code below of the return keyword is not going to be executed. So it's very good uh, to know uh, this also. Another important thing to know is that we can, we, can, we can only return a single value with the return keyword. So we cannot return here two, two integers, let's say and um, also we cannot have two returns in the same uh, function let's say if i put here also return max i can't because this is also a reachable code but i i can have two returns two returns calls if they are reaching different branches so if i change this uh, if uh, expression to an if uh, statement so if i type something like this if uh, let's say a greater than b let's add the curly braces now we type here return a a else return b so now we have two returns but they are never reached together they 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 are they are, they are uh, always reached separately so this is why you can use here two returns because I said they are, they are uh, rich uh, always separately. So if you run this code, you're going to see the same output. So you see 9. So this is another way to to write the same thing that we had previously. That, but it's recommended to use uh, to use uh, what we had previously. Because with, uh, specifically, uh, it's better to have an if uh, expression. Another way to to write to the same thing but in a more concise way and let's un undo the code that we have uh, that we had previously so let's press ctrl z so now i have the co code that we had previously now if you hover over over this max it says variable used only in formatting return can be in line so if you click here in line variable now this thing does the same thing that uh, it it was uh, doing previously but this is a shorter way to write the same thing so now it returns a if this condition is true otherwise else part the else part is called and it returns b so we have the same thing but uh, uh, written in a shorter way all right another way to write the same thing that we have here is by using what is called the single expression function and uh, to do that we can uh, remove the curly braces we can put our code up here we can uh, remove the first curly brace and we can also remove the return uh, keyword and here we put equals and this uh, now does the same thing that uh, the code uh, 
the previous code was doing but uh, this is a more uh, concise way and it's recommended to use uh, this only if you know that you, you have in your uh, function a single uh, expression or uh, in other words if you know that you have a single line of code and you can also remove the type here because the type can be be inferred and uh, again only use this if you know that you have in your uh, function a single uh, line of code and uh, in that case you can uh, you can uh, skip the return uh, keyword but if you, do, if you have multiple lines of uh, code you should always use the curly braces and the return uh, call or the return keyword all right so this is our discussion about how we can return uh, a value from a function all right so now let's continue our discussion about functions and now it's time to look at uh, what is called function overloading and let's say that i want here to pass uh, not two integer types but two doubles to be compared so let's say that I uh, type here 6.5 and uh, 9.6. Now, this will not work because we define here explicitly that the parameters are of type uh, int. So we cannot pass here double. Uh, and uh, a solution to this, it may be to create another function with a different name and to define uh, the parameters as doubles. But that... Uh, does not make a lot of sense because uh, we we are doing the exact same thing so it does not make sense to create a new to create a function with a different name so what we can do instead is to let's change it back to integers is to duplicate this get max function and to do that you can press ctrl d or command line on mac so i'm press i'm gonna press ctrl d here now what i can do is change the types of the variables so i can put here instead of uh, integer I put double and here I can put also double let's add the space to make things more clear now if I pass here let's say uh, 5.6 and uh, 9.7 now you see that we have no error so if you run this code Alright, so we get in the output 9.7, and this is correct, this uh, is bigger than 5.6, but now it's using the second function, which is the function which has the parameters as of type double, and you can see that uh, this function now, uh, which is using the parameters uh, as uh, integers, is gray out, because the compiler can figure out what function to use by the argument uh, types we pass here, so in this case we pass here doubles and it knows that uh, it has to use this function which has the types uh, which has the bar parameters defined uh, as type of double right another way to overload the uh, function is to let's also press ctrl d is by changing the number of parameters so i can uh, put here let's say uh, also integer also let's pass an, uh, the third parameter now and uh, this is also going to be an integer it's going to be called c it's going to be of type int all right now let's change this logic to an if uh, statement so let's delete the if expression let's put the curly braces right so let's change this now so you can type it here now if a greater than equal to b and a is greater than equal to to c then gonna return a so now we're using the return uh, keyword else if now uh, we're putting here an else if b is greater than equal to a and b is greater than equal to c then return b else c is going to be the bigger value so put here return c all right let's press ctrl alt uh, 
to be here. Right, so I need to put here uh, the type. This way I get that error. And now everything is okay. Oh, so from here is the problem. Right, so now if you run this code, let's change this to let's say five seven and uh, ten. Now if you run this code you see that the two functions above are gray out. Now it's gonna use the third one, which has uh, third parameters. All right, so when you get we get in the output ten, which is correct. So if you change this to test, let's say we put here uh, one hundred. Let's put here three. And if you run this code, now we get one hundred and. This is correct. Alright, so this is our discussion about function overloading. And you can use function overloading every time you know that you will uh, do the same task but with different uh, type of parameters or with a different number of parameters. Also, you may have noticed that we have uh, an underline over, uh, he, over if, over the if statement. So if you hover over here, it says that the return can be lifted out with if. So if you click this, you can uh, write it in this way or we can keep it in the previous way but uh, because this is uh, underlined that means that Kotlin recommends to use it in this way in this way so see you in the next video we're going to talk about uh, default parameters all right so now it's time to look at another features uh, that you can use with functions and that is called default parameters and uh, let's first declare a function. So I'm going to declare it down here at the end of our enclosing curly brace for main fun. I'm going to call it send message. Let's put the parenthesis. And inside the parenthesis, I'm going to define two parameters. The first is going to be called name. It's going to be of type string. And this second one is going to be called uh, message. And it's going to be also of type string. Now let's uh, declare the curly braces, press enter, and let's print those uh, parameters in our console. So let's put a print line here and inside the... Also, uh, while I'm typing, uh, while I'm typing this print line, you may see that this print line function is a, a function which is overload, referring uh, to our uh, previous video. Because you can see that it can, it has the same name, but it can take uh, different types of parameters here. So it has int, this thing, which is any, byte, short, char, long. So the print line function that uh, we've used uh, throughout our videos is uh, overloaded. This is why you can pass different uh, different types of uh, of data to it. Now, let's type here println quotation marks and inside the quotation mark I'm going to type name equals dollar sign name so now it's going to print the argument values that we're going to pass to this function as uh, parameters. Now let's call this function here so let's type send uh, message. Let's press cont control alt L to format our code. And here I'm going to pass a name, let's say uh, Alexa, and uh, the message, let's say hello. Now, if you run this code, you're going to see in the output um, uh, the name uh, here is going to be this uh, argument that to type here, which is Alexa, and the message is going to be hello. So we have this. But let's say that for whatever reason, the user doesn't want to to send uh, any kind of message, but we still uh, need to use this uh, function. What we can do then? Uh, one way is to remove uh, this parameter uh, all the way, but uh, that's not uh, good because you still need to use this function with uh, those two parameters, the name and uh, and the message. So in, let's say that if the user doesn't pass any message, we can define here what is called a default parameter. A default uh, parameter. So we, we can assign here a default value for our parameter. So I'm going to put here uh, just uh, 
double quotation marks or uh, or you can put some text here but let's put the, just the double quotation marks which, which is just an empty text so if now I don't pass a message here now it's still gonna work because as a value for this parameter is gonna use the default value that we defined here alright so let's run this code to see now how, how it works So now I get name Alex and message equals empty because uh, em double quotation marks without any text is uh, an empty text. Now if I want to pass here now the message, now I can pass here the message and now uh, our default value is going to be replaced with the argument uh, value that we typed here. So now I'm going to see name Alexa message hello. Alright, you can do the same thing for uh, for the name, so here you can define. Let's say the, the user doesn't want to to type a name, and you can define a default name. Let's say user. Yes. Now, let's say that I delete both uh, arguments here, and I just have an empty function. If I run this, now it's going to use the default values that we type here, respectively user and this empty string. So now I get name, user, and message. Now let's put back uh, what we have. So let's put here uh, Alexa. And let's uh, put our message here again. Now let's run this code again. Now what we can also do is uh, use what is called named parameters and uh, let's say that I want to to pass a parameter only for the second uh, second uh, let's, let's say that I want to pass an argument type for only for the second parameter that we define here respectively for our message so if I delete this now let's say, let's say that I delete uh, the argument uh, for our name and if I want to pass the value only for the message, let's put in the quotation mark because it's a string. Let's say I put the message hello here. Now you can see that the hint is name, so it's using the first uh, parameter that we define here, not the second. So what we can do now to pass uh, a value to only to our second parameter because uh, as you can see it's using the, it's assigning this value that we type here for this parameter. And to solve that, you can use what is called name parameters. So with name parameters, we can um, type an argument for our parameter irrespective of the order in which they are defined. So in our case, we have the name for defined and then the message. So to use uh, that, you can uh, type the name of the parameter, let's say message. Now you see that we have this P message and it's equals to a string. So that means that we need to pass some text there. And now we can pass here hello and now this is gonna work because uh, now we can pass uh, a value to our parameter irrespective of the order in which they are uh, defined uh, here right so now we get name is uh, this default user and the uh, message is hello and we can do the same for uh, for the second one which is name so I can put now here name and I can type here uh, let's say Alexa and if you run this, now you get Alexa is the name and the message is hello. So with uh, named parameters, this is how they are called, or name arguments, we can uh, pass a value to our uh, parameters irrespective of the order in which they are defined uh, in the function. So in our case, name is first defined and you saw there that when I try to use uh, the message to assign a value only for the message is what it was using the first parameter because this was the word in which they were defined but with this named parameters you can change it. you can um, you can um, type an argument irrespective of the word in which they are defined and you can put this in uh, multiple lines to make it more clear like this let's say so this is our discussion about uh, named uh, parameters and uh, default parameters but before we end our video I should uh, say that uh, 
to the default parameters, we cannot only type literal values like we typed here uh, some values directly. We can use variables or uh, you can use uh, a function which can return a value. So I can define here a function. Let's say fun send uh, text. It's not going to have any parameters. It's going to return uh, a string. So I'm going to define here a string as the type of return. And here we're going to type return and let's type some text. Now we can call this function here send text and now this value which is returned for this function send text is going to be assigned to our parameter message so now if you run this code let's uh, increase this a little bit so now if you run this code you're going to see that the uh, now the default value for the parameter message is the return value from our send text uh, function so you can see now that we have uh, Okay, so let's change it here to no value for our message. So now if you run this code, because uh, there we have an argument passed, so let's not pass no, an argument. So now it's using the value that we was, was passed as the default value for our parameter, which is this return value from this function. Now, because here you have one single line of code, we have one single expression, we just return uh, some text or function, we don't have uh, multiple statements in our uh, function, we can uh, write this as a single expression function. And uh, you can uh, remove the curly brace and you can uh, write this as a single uh, expression body like we did in a uh, previous video, so you can put it just equals and you can remove the type here also. So if you run this code, now you're going to see to the output uh, for the parameter message some text, which is the value which is returned from this uh, function, from the single body expression function. Right? So, see you in the next video. Alright, now it's time to look at the var arg keyword and how we, we can use the var arg keyword with functions. But first, let's declare a function below of our enclosing uh, curly brace of our main function. So, I'm going to type here the fun keyword to declare a function. I'm going to call it sum because it's going to return the sum of all the parameters that we're going to define. So I'm going to define here uh, some parameters. First it's going to be called a, it's going to be of type int. Single, second it's going to be called b, also int. Third it's going to be called c, also an int. And the final one is going to be called d, also an int. And this, fu this function is going to return uh, the sum of all of those parameters. So we need to define here uh, the return type, which is going to be an int, a whole number. And now we can put the curly braces. And here we type return a plus b plus c plus d. And this is going to return the sum of uh, all the parameters that we define here or uh, the values that is going to be passed as arguments to this function. And you can write this as a single expression function if you want. So you can write this uh, like this if you want. This will have the same effect. But uh, I, will, uh, I will write it with the... Uh, curly braces because uh, it will make things more clear. So let's uh, undo this. All right now let's call this function here. Sum. Let's press Control Alt L to format the code and uh, let's pass some values here. So I'm going to type here 5, 6, 7 and uh, 10. Right. If you press Shift Control P on this, you're gonna see that the type of this function. Let's press again. The type of this function is an int. So this function return returns an integer. So uh, it's an is it's an expression. That means that you can put this instead of putting uh, storing the, um, uh, the return uh, value in a variable. We can put this direct in a println. Uh, function. So you can type here print ln and we can put the function inside here because that function is of type 
int so it's going to return uh, the sum of all the arguments that we type there so now if you run this code we get we get 28 because 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 10 is 28 now if I want to pass another parameter here let's say that I want to pass another number here I can't because I am limited by the number of parameters that we define here of course that I can define another parameter uh, here but what if I want to pass uh, 10 numbers or uh, 15 numbers or 100 numbers in that case it will be very tedious to write all of those parameters and and to solve that you need to use what is called a varg vararg keyword and a vararg keyword allows us to pass more than one parameter actually more than one argument to our uh, parameter so to declare a varar keyword we type here uh, we type here var arg so this is the keyword var arg it stands for uh, variable arguments now we need to define uh, a name for this uh, var arg i'm going to call it uh, numbers and we also need to specify a type what kind of uh, values this var arg uh, is going to store now this return keyword, uh, it's, uh, re these variables here are red because they don't exist. Now, if I want to, but first let's see that I want to type here another uh, parameter now. Now you see that we have no problem. So I can type here uh, whatever uh, number of uh, numbers I want. And there is no problem, as you can see. Now, uh, to to sum the values st uh, which are stored in these vararg numbers we need to use something which we didn't cover yet but we have a separate section which uh, i show you how to in which i explain uh, this thing that i'm going to use now and that is loops because uh, now we need to loop through our numbers and to add our numbers to a variable so we need to use what is called uh, a for loop so to do that first we declare a variable i'm gonna call it uh, let's say uh, result i'm gonna assign a value of zero now to use a for loop we type for and again i'm gonna go into more detail about this in a the separate section but now we need to use this because there's not uh, another way to to sum up the values inside the vararg uh, numbers and here we need to define uh, a name for our variable so it's going to be called number and now uh, we use the keyword in and now we're referring the parameter va the vararg parameter which is defined up called numbers all right now we c here you can put the curly braces and inside the curly braces we're going to type here it should be res numbers result and now we're going to use that uh, abbreviation which is plus and equals plus equals number and now here we're going to return the result return result all right so let's uh, explain what we have here so first we declare a variable we assign a value of zero to it so it's a type uh, int next what this uh, for loop is doing so this for loop uh, is doing what is doing is executing um, a line uh, of code multiple times so it executing is executing uh, uh, what's inside the curly braces until uh, the it finishes to it finishes the to loop through all these numbers which are stored in the uh, vararg numbers so it uh, first assigns uh, the first uh, the first number to our number here and it loops and it adds that it adds that number to our result then it, it does that again and again and again until it finishes until it reaches uh, the, the final number five and in that case also gonna assign from our uh, numbers uh, the number five to our number 
and then that uh, number is going to be added to our result variable. And when it finishes uh, that uh, looping, when it finishes that uh, thing, it's going to return the result. It's going to return all the values which are which were been uh, added to our uh, result variable. So now if you print this, now we get 85 and probably this is the result of this uh, calculation. So this is how you can use vararg uh, numbers, vararg uh, keyword to store more than one uh, single, more than uh, a limited number of parameters defined uh, by you. And uh, Another short, shortcut to, to loop through this is using a, a for each loop. So we can do something like this. But this time, uh, let's say that I want, I don't want to return uh, something. So let's say that I delete this. And I, I can uh, type here, actually numbers for that, here we put that for each and here we type print ln again this is uh, a more complex uh, subject which is going to be covered in the next uh, videos so here we type print uh, ln and we type it all right now let's uh, let's call our sum Let's define some numbers here. Let's say that I type here 1, 4, 4. Alright, so if you run this code, now you can see that every number in that uh, that we defined here is printed one by one. So this number, this for each, which is also a loop, it goes through all of these numbers it, and it prints them one by one. And again, I'm going to look at uh, for uh, the for loop and the for each in uh, the next videos, but I had no other way to show you this example without using them. But if you feel confused by for the for each or the for loop, don't worry, we have a separate uh, section which in which we talk about in detail about this. For now, we need to only the only thing you need to know is that you can uh, pass an indefinite number of parameters of actually you can pass a an indefinite number of arguments to our uh, vararg numbers because uh, this allows us to to par to, to pass uh, an indefinite number of uh, values so here you see that we have 1 4 5 6 7 8 9 5 7 and 6 the numbers that we have here so this uh, for each is going through all of them and it prints them one by one. So see you in the next video. All right, now it's time to start our discussion about loops. But first, let's create a new project. I'm going to call it loops. Select IntelliJ, click on next and finish. Right, a project is created. Let's delete the code inside the curly braces. Let's hide the project pane. And um, let's start by explaining what loops are and why you need to use them. So loops allows us to execute uh, a piece of code multiple times without uh, you writing down every uh, line of code uh, manually. So Let's say that I want to print uh, 10 numbers in the console or uh, 20 or 50. Instead of uh, printing, uh, instead of typing that code uh, manually line by line, which will be very tedious, you can use a loop and you can put that code in a loop and in that code in the loop it will be executed repeatedly uh, uh, until uh, a certain uh, number is uh, reached. So let's see how we can define a loop. To define a loop, we type here for, this is the first loop that we're going to look at because there are other loops. So this is the for loop. We press enter. 
inside the parentheses we type i this is convention you can put whatever uh, name you want there now we put here in this is the keyword in and now let's say that i want to loop from one un, from one to ten and to do that we type one dot dot this is a range to one to ten now i put the curly braces and inside the, pre the curly braces, I'm, I'm going to put the code that I want to be executed 10 times. So I'm going to type here println and I'm going to type the value of i at each iteration. And uh, we can put it like this. You can type here, uh, you can put in the quotation marks and you can do the placeholder. You can put i. So now if you run this. So now we get i is 1, 2, until 10. So it, what it's doing is, is uh, looping through this range until it reaches 10. Then it stops. Now, uh, you can write this i uh, like I did it here using a placeholder or you can uh, write it like this. Now if you run this code, it will have the same effect but will not have the taste. Uh, before here. Yeah. So now we get 1 until 10. Now there are other, other, other vari variations to use uh, this uh, range and one of them is to use uh, until. So let's uh, comment this code. So let's press control slash Right? Now let's type 4 again. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it also i. Here you can put whatever name you want. And uh, instead of, uh, now I'm gonna put also the, again the in keyword. And instead of putting the dot dot to loop to a range, I'm gonna put 1 until 10. Alright? Now I'm gonna add the println uh, statement and here I'm going to type uh, i and uh, this will have the same effect with a, sing with a single difference that 1 until 10 is, is going to exclude 10 and 1 uh, using the range dot dot 10 it will include 10 so if you run this code you're going to see that you will not have uh, 10 here because 10 is excluded when uh, you're using the until. So now as you can see we have 1 until 9 and 10 is excluded because uh, now we're using the until. So uh, if, you're, if you're using the range which is uh, dot dot, it, uh, the last number is going to be included. But if you use uh, until the last number is going to be excluded. So it's important to know that this uh, two, respectively the until and uh, the range, can only count upwards. So we cannot put here uh, 10 until 1 because uh, the first uh, number, the number of on the left, needs to be smaller than the number on the right. So we cannot put 10 until 1. We can only count upwards. We can only put uh, 1 until 10 or uh, 1 dot dot 10. So to loop backwards we need to use another uh, thing. So let's comment this code also. Now to loop backwards we type 4. Again in the parentheses you put uh, i. Here you can put uh, whatever if you want. In so here you can put uh, whatever name, but uh, conventionally is I is used. Now I'm going to put in, and now I'm going to put down. First let's put uh, 10, down, down to 1. Let's add the uh, curly braces, the print the line, and let's put I here. Now this is gonna this is gonna count downwards. Now it's gonna it's gonna count from ten to one. So if you run this code,
now I get 10 9 so it's counting it's, it's counting backwards right another thing that you can do is that you can introduce an arbitrary step so let's uh, let's comment this code also let's add below another code another for loop so here I'm gonna type for parenthesis uh, let's put I and let's use uh, the until so in one until 10 so now I can put a uh, an arbitrary step so at uh, at at this arbitrary step that uh, number which uh, is that is that is at that arbitrary step is gonna be skipped so I can put here step 2 let's say so now I'm gonna put the code places to have the some code executed I'm gonna put println and let's put here i so now if you run this code I get 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. So you can see that uh, uh, at uh, the second uh, iteration, the number is skipped. So we have 1, 2 is skipped, now we have, then we have 3, 4, 3, and 4 is skipped, and so on. So you can put this arbitrary step if you want. So let's comment this code also. And let's add the first code that we had uh, here. To, to talk a little bit more so let's put i in 1 let's put the range dot dot 10 and curly braces here I'm gonna type println i now if run this code We'll get the same as output at, uh, as at the beginning of the video so I'll get one uh, until 10 inclusive now again what this uh, loop is doing is going through this is going through this to this range from 1 to 10 and it's executing the code inside the curly braces 10 times and when it reaches 10 it stops and it executes the next line of code below here but because here we don't have any line of code uh, our uh, program uh, exits exits and it's finished so this is our discussion about for loop there are uh, other lo loops which can loop uh, which can loop as long as a certain condition is true not as long as uh, a, cer a certain number is rich so we're gonna look at the next loops in the next video see you next all right now it's time to look at the next two loops that you can use in kotlin and those are the while and the do while loop but first let's um, open our previous project called loops because i'm going to type my code there so open your previous project and here i already have deleted the code that you had previously here but uh, if you have the code uh, delete it and uh, let's start our discussion about the while loop so first i'm going to type uh, while this is uh, this how you declare the while loop and here you can uh, press enter to fill in uh, the the while key in the parenthesis for you or you can type manually the while and the parenthesis so i'm gonna press enter to fill that for you fill in that for me and next you put a space and you put curly brace here so i'm gonna put the left curly brace and press enter and the right curly brace is gonna be added automatically as you can see on the line uh, five now a while loop loops as long as a certain condition is true in contrast to the for loop which uh, loops for a specific number of time a while uh, loop loops as long as uh, a condition or an expression is true so this gives us more flexibility in um, circumstances or we don't know for uh, what uh, specific number of times we want our code to be repeated so we put our uh, condition inside the parenthesis here and as long as this condition is true the code inside the curly base is going to be executed uh, repeatedly so let's see how we can do that so first let's declare a variable here 
I'm gonna call it number and I'm gonna assign a value of 0 to it. And here I'm gonna type while number is less than 10. Inside the curly brace I'm gonna type the println function and uh, we're gonna output the value of our number and then we're gonna increment the value of our number. So I'm gonna put number I'm gonna use the increment operator plus plus. Let's put a space here to have things uh, more clear. Now if you run this code you're gonna see the numbers from 0 to 9. So what is happening? How this uh, works? First we declare a variable, we assign a value of 0 to it. Next we loop using the while loop and first the while loop is checking to see if this condition inside the parentheses is true. So it checks to see if uh, the value of our uh, variable number is less than 10 and it's true because we have 0. Then it executes the code inside the, the curly braces and it uh, outputs the value of our number in the console using the println function. Then it increments the value of our number and then it loops again. But now the value of our number is 1. So now it will compare again uh, if uh, uh, the value of our number is less than 10 which is true. It will loop again, it will uh, output this value, it will increment this value, so now we have 2 and so on until uh, it reaches 9. When it reaches 9, it will increment the value, it will, it will print, uh, it will output the value in the console, it, it will increment this value, then it will check again to see if this condition is true, but now the value is going to be 10 because uh, it was incremented when it was 9. And this condition is going to evaluate to false. And the code inside the curly braces is not going to be executed. This is why we don't have 10 here. And uh, it executes the code that comes below our while loop. That because we don't have any code, the program is terminated. And you can uh, write uh, this thing in one single line, but it's recommended to use uh, this form only if you know that you have one single statement in your uh, loop. So if I can delete this, this two. And I can put here directly number plus plus. And because this returns the value, it increments the value and it returns the value, it's an expression, I can uh, I can run this code and it will have the same output. But if I delete the increment operator uh, after the variable and if I put it before, now you're going to see a different output here because this increments the value of uh, of our number then it decrements the value of our number and this is called prefix in increment increment so this is called prefix incrementing and uh, the the previous one let's press control z this is called postfix increment so this is postfix because it's at the end of our variable and uh, if you put uh, the green increment operator at the uh, the beginning of, of our variable is called prefix or oh, increment. Anyway, let's press Ctrl Z to have the code that we had previously and the curly braces. Now look what happens if, if I delete the increment, uh, if I don't increment our variable now. Now uh, let's just talk what is happening because we don't increment the variable and the variable always has the value of zero, this will always be true. And it will execute the code inside the curly braces forever. So we'll have what is called an infinite loop. So if you run this code, now you can see that uh, it prints zero forever because this condition never ever is to, to, to false. So let's stop this by pressing on this uh, red uh, square. So now the process, uh, the, the program is terminated. So this is why you need to increment the value of our number because uh, we want that condition to be false at uh, some point in the in the, in the in the in the future. Next, let's say that uh, I assign here 10. So if I run this code, now this condition is going to be false because 10 is not less than 10. And the code inside the curly braces is not going to be executed. So now we have no output here because this condition is evaluated to false and uh, it's not executing the code inside the curly braces. But there are certain situations where you'll want to have your code executed at least once, even though the initial, the initial uh, 
condition or the initial expression is false. So if I delete the curly braces and the code inside the curly braces here. Now to to do what I said, if, to execute the, the code even though the condition is initially set to false, to execute the code at least once, you need to use a do while loop. And to use a do while loop, you put here a do, press enter to add the curly braces. And we put our while at the end of, of our uh, enclosing curly brace of our do. And here inside the curly brace, uh, I'm going to put our println function. And I'm going to output uh, the value of our uh, variable number. So now if you run this, Now get 10 because this executes the code inside the curly braces at, at least once and after that it, it uh, comes down here and checks to see if this condition is true or false. And if this condition is uh, true it will repeat the code uh, but if the condition is false it, uh, it, will, it will not repeat the code. But the important aspect here is that it will um, execute the code inside the curly brace at least once irrespective of uh, our condition if the condition is true of or false in our case is false so these are the three loops that you can use in a Kotlin the for loop the while loop and the do while loop now it's time to see um, how we can use the continue and the break keywords with uh, those loops so let's press ctrl z to undo the code to have the while loop uh, back because I'm going to start with the while loop and to see how we can use the break and continue keyword with the while loop. Let's uh, bring this up a little bit. So let's first look at the continue keyword. And the continue keyword can be used to bypass a section of code. So let's say that I want to skip the number 7 in our uh, loop. So I can type here if our variable number equals 2, so 2 equals 7, let's put curly braces, press enter to add the right curly brace, continue. So now what this is going to do is when it's going to reach the number 7 and this condition is going to be true, it's going to call continue and it's going to bypass the code that comes below of our uh, if statement. So if you run this code, look uh, what happens. It happens nothing because uh, here our uh, number has a value of 10, so this condition is false, so the code is not executed. So let's put here 0. Now if you run this code, so it gets 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. But, uh, and you see that at 7, at seven it, uh, it skips the code, but why you don't have the next numbers? This is because uh, unintentionally we created here an infinite loop. So let's stop this and uh, to explain. So what happens here is that because um, we said we say here explicitly to to check here explicitly, we check here to see if our number is equal to seven. Then we're going to continue. In other words, we're going to uh, skip the code which comes below of our uh, of our uh, if uh, then statement. Then this code is never called. So this code is never called the println and uh, more importantly the increment uh, operator is not, never called on our uh, number variable. And because of that, because our variable is not incremented here, it, uh, when it's going to loop again, it, it will uh, have again the value 7. So this condition uh, the, in the if is going to evaluate again to true and it's going to call continue again. And because this code again is never reached, this code, and the value is no, not, not incremented, it, it, it will still have the value 7. So this is going to evaluate again to true. So it does this uh, forever. And to change that, we need to put our uh, number, and which is incremented, before our, our, our if. And that is going to solve the problem. So now if I, let's... Uh, Now if I run the code, let's increase this. Now get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 7 is skipped. Then 8, 
9 and 10 because now when this uh, condition evaluates to true it will continue it's not going to print uh, the code it's not going to be executed below of our if and uh, it will come back to loop and now it's going to increment the value and the value is going to be 8 instead of 7 this is going to evaluate to false and the continue is not going to be called and it will print uh, the number 8 and it will do the same for uh, it will increment the value again and then we'll have 9 and so on so this is how you can use the continue keyword and uh, you have to be careful where you put your in a, your where you, where you increment your variable because uh, as you saw you can easily get into an infinity loop now you can have a more uh, complex expression here so you can put here if uh, number is uh, greater than let's say 2 and number is less than uh, 8 now if you run this look what happens now you get 1 2 and then we get 8 9 and 10 because what uh, this condition now checks is uh, is uh, if our uh, number is greater than 10 and less than 8 then continue then skip that number so this is why the numbers between uh, uh, 2 and 8 are skipped because uh, we call continue on uh, on them and uh, if you hover over here you see that it says the two comp operation should be converted to a range check so we can uh, write the same condition that we have here using a range but uh, this is different from a range uh, uh, that you you've uh, used in a for loop in the sense that this is now checking to see if our number is in the range 3 to, from 3 to 7 so if you run this code Now I have the exact same output, but now uh, we are using the range to, to check to see if our number is in that range. And if it is that range, we, we call continue to skip that. Um, the next thing that you can do is you can uh, break the loop. You can stop the loop using uh, the break here. So I can say here again, if number equals equals, let's say 7, call break. So I'm going to type here break. Now, when this condition is going to evaluate to true, it's going to call break and the loop is going to stop. It's not going to execute uh, any line of code after that. It's going to stop, it's going to leave, and it's going to execute the code which comes below of here. But in our case, we don't, don't have any code. So you, hit, you see that we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And when it reaches uh, 7, it breaks and it not, it's stopping the loop. It's not printing the value and it executes the loop. So it terminates. So um and we can do the same thing with the uh, for loop so we can use the for we can use the uh, continue and uh, and break with a for loop so you can type here for let's say i in let's create uh, let's say 0 to 10 let's create this range let's add the curly braces now i can say here if i in let's say 3 to 8 then continue let's print the value let's type here print ln let's print the value of i here so now if you run this code So we have our first loop which loops uh, to 6 and then it breaks because you call break there. Then it, using the for loop it loops, it loops uh, from 0 to 10 but uh, because here we're checking to see if our number uh, is in uh, the range 3 to 8 then skip it. We get 0, 1, 2 and then the numbers, uh, the 3 and uh, the numbers between the three and in, the numbers between three and eight inclusive are skipped here. So we have uh, zero, one, two, and then the numbers between two and nine are uh, skipped, and we have nine and ten. And we can use uh, also the break keyword with the four. We can put here if i equals equals seven, 
break. So now if you run this code, now you get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and when it reaches 7, it breaks, similar to our uh, while loop. So this is how you can use the break and continue QR with uh, the while and uh, for loop, and you can use uh, the break and continue QR also with the do while loop. Next, we're gonna look at how we can nest loops within each other, and we're gonna look at an example using the while loop. So I'm gonna delete the code of the for loop and the println statement there. I'm gonna delete the if then statement, the break keyword, and I'm gonna bring the println uh, function up there. Down here, I'm gonna declare a variable. It's gonna be a var. I'm gonna call it i, and I'm gonna assign a value of zero to it. Now, inside the while loop, I'm gonna type another while loop. Here I'm gonna put a condition while i is less than 5. We're gonna increment i and we're gonna print gonna output the value of i in the console. But let's put some text here to make uh, clear what loops what loop is looping. So I'm gonna put uh, three asterisk signs here. I'm gonna type uh, the dollar sign and i. So now if you run this code let's also change this condition to less than 5 so if you run this code now we get first we get 1 then we get our uh, code inside of our uh, inner uh, while loop which is the 3 asterisks and we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 then it loops again but let's take this code line by line to explain what is happening here. So first we declare this variable call number, we assign a value of 0 to it, then we loop using the while loop, the outer loop, and it checks to see if this condition is true, and it's true, 0 is less than 5, so it executes the code inside the curly braces, and it increments the value of our number by 1, then it outputs the value of our number in the console, so we get here 1. Then it declared this variable called i, and then it starts looping inside our uh, outer loop while using the inner loop while. So it loops here five times. So when it finishes, it goes back, and now the value was incremented by one. It will check again if the condition is true. It will uh, execute the code inside the calibrate. It will increment the value now, so the it will have two. It will output that value, so now we have two here. And then it will uh, loop again five, sty five times using the inner loop, and it will uh, do the same thing for the next round and the next round until we get to five. When uh, uh, we'll get to five, five will uh, be not be less than five, and this condition will evaluate to to false, and the code inside the calibrate is not going to be executed. All right? And uh, you can use the break keyword inside the inner loop. So I, I can say here if uh, you can put it above here. So I can say if i equals equals zero, then break. And uh, you can put the break and continue keywords in uh, one single line if you want. You can avoid the curly braces. So now if you run this code. Now get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because now uh, when it reaches the inner loop, it breaks immediately at every at every iteration in the outer loop. So when it uh, comes down here, it will check uh, to see if the con this condition is true. It's going to be true, but when it gets to the if statement, it will break. It will stop the loop. So uh, it will execute only the outer loop. And with a break uh, keyword, you can... Not, not target only the loop. So with, with this break keyword, we stop, we stop only this while loop that uh, that we are currently that is currently the nearest loop. But there is something which are, which is called labels, and with labels you can target an outer loop. So you can break the outer loop here. So you can break the while loop uh, which is here, and to do that we we give to our while loop a label, so we type here a name, I'm gonna call it outer, and we put at. Now, here we can put break, and now I'm gonna type at, 
and you put outer and this this should be a single word now if you run this look what happens Now you get one because it breaks the outer loop. So it first uh, evaluates this condition, it increments the value of a number, it prints the value of a number, and uh, then it uh, goes in the inner loop. It checks to see if this condition is true. It's true. Then it checks to see if i is equal to zero, which is uh, true. Then it breaks, but now it's not breaking this loop, this inner loop. It's breaking the outer loop. So it's breaking this loop. So this is why you get only one and the code is not executed because it breaks the outer loop and the code, uh, our program, our code, it's terminated because about down here we don't have uh, any code. So this is how we can use labels with the break keyword to target an outer loop and the labels uh, can be used also with the continue keyword and uh, in uh, other loops that we've uh, looked at. So this is our discussion about loops what you can do i should say is that you cannot target with the labels an inner loop from an outer loop so you cannot uh, you can give here a name to a label to our inner loop but you cannot target our inner, inner loop from our outer loop so this is our discussion about loops and in the next video we're going to do a challenge all right so now it's time to do a challenge using all the knowledge that we have accumulated so far and i'm going to use uh, the previous project to put my code there but if you don't have the previous project, you can create a new project and give it whatever name you want and type your code there. So I'm going to open my previous project. I'm going to delete the code inside the main function. Now, what is the challenge? The challenge is to create an arbitrary range of numbers. Then you need to find a way to go to that arbitrary range of numbers and to determine if... Uh, a number is an even number or if a number is an odd number and based on that if the number is an odd number skip that number but if the number is an even number then output that number in the console additionally you should create a way to count all the even numbers that you found in your range and display the total numbers of even numbers uh, at the end of your program so try to do this solution and uh, after that you can watch my uh, solution to this so first i'm going to declare a, i'm going to declare a variable called number i'm going to assign a value of 1 to it next i'm going to de declare another variable but this is going to be a val it's going to be called last number and it's going to have a value of 20 now i'm going to loop using the while loop and in the parentheses i'm going to type while number is less than equal to last number then you're going to put curly braces. Now I'm going to increment our number. Now here we need to add the logic to determine if a number is an even number or not. And to do that I'm going to add the function at the end of our enclosing curly brace of our main function. So I'm going to type here the fun keyword. Now you need to give a name to our function. It's going to be called is even number. I'm going to put parentheses and it's going to take a parameter called number of type int this function and it's going to return a boolean value true or false this function so you put colon and we type boolean then you put curly braces and now we add the logic to determine if a, new, a number is even or not so you type here if and now inside the parentheses we put another set of parentheses and here we refer our parameter number that we have defined above and here we put the modulus operator because the modulus operator gives us the reminder of a division so we put the modulus operator 2 now outside our inner parenthesis we put equals equals 0 then we put curly braces and we return true else we're gonna return false now how this logic works so our uh, num our number uh, parameter which is defined here is going to take an argument let's say that uh, it's going to take uh, an arbitrary number then it's going to check to see if that number divided by 2 
has no reminder if it and if it has no reminder then that number is an even number because the because even numbers when they are divided by two they have no reminder and if that is the case if the, the reminder equals equals to zero our number is an even number and it's going to return true and the else part is not going to be executed now let's add the logic here this user function here because as you can see now it's uh, gray out it's not used so let's type here if and in the parentheses we're going to type is even number our function we're going to call our function here and we're going to pass a parameter to it call now i'm going to pass the parameter we're going to pass an argument and the argument is going to be the variable that we define above as you can see you have the v there so press enter to fill on that for you Let's press Ctrl or Alt L to format the code. Now, if we press Shift Ctrl P on this, you're gonna see that this is a Boolean expression because this returns true or false. So we can put the logical NOT operator in front of it to change its value, to switch its value from true to false and from and from false to true. So let's put curly braces. And here we're gonna call our continue keyword. Down here, I'm gonna add a println which is going to output uh, the, the number in our console. Next, we need to add the logic to to count the total uh, in, the total even numbers uh, which are found. So I'm going to declare var is going to be even uh, numbers counter, and I'm going to assign a value of zero to it. And here we're going to increment our even numbers counter. So now, if you run this code, we get 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. So these are the even numbers that they are, that they found, that the, our program found and is correct. But let's add a println at the end of our loop to print the total number of numbers, of even numbers found. So let's put println here and let's put, let's refer our even numbers count here even numbers counter so if you run this let's put some text actually let's put this in curly braces so let's type here total number of even numbers found equals dollar sign Now, if you run this, now you get total numbers of even numbers found this 10, and this is correct. So and you output uh, correctly our uh, even numbers, and it shows that the total number of even numbers found is 10. So let's now think about how this uh, logic works here. So let's look at the if statement that we have here so what is doing here, this thing here so let's take an um an uh, specific example uh, a specific number to 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 see how this works so let's say that here we pass four and it's going to use the logic to determine if this number is an even number and if that number is an even number it's going to return true so this this function which is a boolean expression is going to return true and then we're going to negate this value, we're going to change this value from true to false and continue is gonna, not going to be called and uh, the code which comes below which is uh, our variable which uh, counts how many even numbers uh, we have the, it uh, it increments then it outputs that number in the console so we have our even number 4 output, output it in the console but if you pass here 3 that uh, number is not going to be an even number because has a reminder and this is going to return uh, false and because if here you put the logical not operator that is going to be switched to true and the continue keyword is going to continue keyword is going to be called and our code which, which comes below here which is uh, our variable even number counter is not going to be incremented and uh, our number respectively our number three is not going to be uh, output it in the console so this is how this uh, works 
So this is our solution to our uh, to our challenge. Of course, you can simplify this. So if you hover over here because you have all, all of those underlines, you can see that it says remove redundant if statement. So this can be simplified to this. This does the exact same thing. It is going to return true if this uh, divided by two has no reminder. Otherwise, it's going to return false. And this can can be simplified even further because here we have a single expression, and we know when we have a single expression, we can write our function as a single expression function. So I can remove the curly braces here. You can remove uh, the boolean return type. You can remove the return keyword, and you're gonna put the equal here. And this now, if you run this code, this uh, will all work um, the same. So we have the same output here. Now, I use the function here because uh, we've uh, talked about functions in our previous videos. But you can remove the function completely and add the logic to determine if an even number is uh, even or not directly in the if statement. So you can put here if, let's put parentheses, our number now we're going to use the modulus operator to not equal to zero then continue and this will have the same effect so if you run this code this will work uh, in the same way so we have the same uh, code here because this does the exact that the function did previously it will check to see if this is an even number if this is an even number uh, this is not going to be true because here we're checking to see if this is not equal to zero and uh, our number is equal to zero so this condition inside the, curl, the parenthesis is going to be false the continue is not going to be called and uh, our code below is going to be called our uh, even number counter is going to be incremented and our uh, number is going to be output in the console so this uh, does the same thing as previously and we can do this challenge also with a for, st with a for uh, loop if you want so you can type here for i in 1 to 20 then execute the code inside the curly braces and here you can uh, check if parenthesis again if i percent 2 not equal to zero then call continue then else is gonna execute the code which comes below here which is let's first uh, assign a value for our, uh, to a even number counter to zero because when, when uh, we're gonna enter in the for loop we should uh, have uh, zero to not have the previous uh, value which was 20 so let's put zero here and here you can increment our even number counter plus plus and we're gonna print our even number so I'm gonna print i here so if you run this code let's run it from here but let's add the print element to make things more clear so I'm gonna add here print Let's put quotation marks and here I'm going to type total number of numbers found using for loop are let's put the dollar sign now let's refer our even number variable. Now if you run this, now we have the exact same output, but now we're using the, first we're using the while loop, then uh, we're using the for loop. So let's let's add a print line statement between our uh, loops to make clear which loop is looping. So let's add a print line here, and let's type here, now 
we so we are looping using the for loop so now if you run this to make more clear which loop is looping so now as you can see first the while loop loops then we have our println which says that uh, now our while loop our for loop starts looping then we loop with the for loop then at the end uh, we output the total number total number of even only if even numbers found with the while loop we have 10 then we output the total number found uh, the total number of even numbers found using the for loop and r10 so our code works uh, perfectly well and uh, uh, this do not, does not represent the, the best uh, uh, the best way to solve this challenge of course that you can uh, find a, a total different way a better way to solve this so this was my this was just my uh, way of solving the problem so see you in the next video and how i hope that you enjoy this challenge so now it's time to start a discussion about arrays. But first, let's create a new project. I'm going to call it arrays. For the language, select Kotlin. For the build system, IntelliJ. Make sure to have the JDK selected and uh, check this little box, add sample code to have the main function auto generated for us. And click on create. Alright, now let's delete the code inside the curly braces of the main function. Let's hide the project pane and let's start our discussion about arrays. And uh, so far in our videos, we've only looked at how we can store only one single value in a variable. And that is very useful, but uh, what if you have uh, a large amount of uh, values that you want to store in our variables? Let's say that you want to store 30 or 40 different uh, values in our uh, variable of a certain type. Of course, that you can uh, declare a variable for each of uh, one of those uh, values then and then assign it to the variables but what happens if you have uh, 1000 or 10 20000 uh, values in that case uh, it will not be practically possible to write each one of those variables and then assign a value to it and uh, Kotlin help us here because it provides us arrays and an array allows us to store more than one single element in a variable name so it allows us to store more more elements in one single uh, variable name now to declare an array we type val here we type names next we need to provide the type and the type is going to be an array and uh, uh, IntelliJ has given us some suggestions there so press enter to fill in uh, that for you and now we put angle brackets and inside the angle bracket is going to put what kind of data this array is going to store. So it's going to store string or uh, text or sequence of characters. Then you put equals and here we don't uh, type a literal value. Here we have a, here we type a function call and here we type array of. And now we, we put our elements inside the, 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 the parentheses uh, of the function call separated by comma. So I'm going to put three names here. So I'm going to put john steven and megan now let's uh, let's see what we have here so first we have the val keyword next we have a name for our variable and the name is names then we have the type and the type is an array which uh, means that we can store multiple values in our uh, variable and next we have angle brackets and string and this means that this array is going to store text or uh, sequence of characters it's going to store only strings and then you put equals we have the function called array of and then you put our elements of type string which is uh, those names separated by comma but because uh, kotlin has type inference here we can delete the type and the type is going to be inferred in the same way it was it was inferred uh, previously when you when you just declare a simple variable so now the type is still inferred as an array of strings and uh, now is a good uh, moment to introduce type hints but uh, we need to activate the type hints from uh, settings and to do that you can go to file 
and click on settings or you can pr press the, the shortcut that we have here for our uh, particular system and uh, for Windows is Control Alt S so I'm gonna press Control Alt S and here we go to if you have something like this you go to editor click on this greater arrow in front of editor and then you go down here where it says where it says inline hints click on, on this greater arrow in front of inline hints and from um, those options select Kotlin and here you go to types and select select local variable types then click apply and ok now what we have here uh, on the right of our uh, variable name is a hint so it's not real text this is just there to remind us what kind of type this variable ha has and in our case is an array of string and uh, my suggestion for you is to keep those things activated because in this way you'll always see what uh, type a variable is without explicitly declaring the type so this is not uh, this, is just, this is just uh, there to help us to remind us what kind of type a variable is now let's say that I want to output a certain element in the array in the console to do that we cannot just type here println and pass names because we need to more to be more specific than that we cannot pass the array here um, and to get a specific element in the array you need to know that the elements in the array are stored at indexes and uh, the index of an array always starts at zero so the first element is stored at the index zero and to get the first element we type, we type here square brackets and we put zero and that if you press control if you press shift control p on it it's a string because that is gonna return us the first value in the array which is uh, john so if you run this code we get john but let's put some text here to make it more clear that this is the first element so let's type first element now let's choose the dollar sign because this now is a placeholder and let's put the curly braces around our uh, our element and the quotation mark here now if you run this code you get first element John let's put here some so we get the first element John because uh, John is stored at the index 0 and uh, in the same way John is stored at the index 0 Steven is stored at the index 1 and Megan is stored at the index 2 so uh, our index starts at 0 the index of an array always starts at 0 and uh, you can replace a specific in, in, uh, element in the array also using the uh, index operator so you can type here names again square brackets 0 equals so now I'm gonna assign a new value to our element stored at index 0 which is now I'm gonna put here the value Alex so now if you run this code now we get first element Alex because John was John which is at index 0 was replaced with the value Alex so now we have Alex Stephen and Megan but what you can't do is you cannot get an uh, element at an, ind at an index that doesn't exist so we cannot get here let's say uh, an element at the index 4 because if you run this look what happens we get an error which says array index out of bound exception index 4 out of bounds bounds for length 3 that is because the index 4 doesn't exist and uh, here we try to access that value and that value uh, and that value and that index doesn't exist and this is called the uh, runtime error because this error is uh, is uh, called only when while our app is uh, still running so we don't have here uh, an error like we have for uh, here we don't have a compile uh, error which uh, you saw in uh, our previous videos that is because uh, the size of uh, an array is not uh, known until at compile time also it's very important to know here that the size of an array is fixed so this will always have uh, 
the, the size is 3 and uh, the only way to add new elements to it is to put the elements directly here but there is not uh, another way to let's say that I want I, I can put another element in the array uh, down here you can only replace elements and then in the next videos you're gonna see that there are other arrays which um, are more flexible in the sense that they can grow and shrink we can add uh, or uh, remove elements from uh, uh, those arrays but for now uh, we're gonna look just at, at the uh, this array so let's change this back to zero to don't have that error and um, to avoid this kind of errors you can uh, check to see what is the size of the array in other words to see what is the number of elements stored in array using the size variable so let's do that so i'm gonna add the println statement below for first one so i'm gonna type here println And here I'm going to put the text, the size of the array is. And here I'm going to put the dollar sign, curly braces. Now I'm going to use our names array. And here I'm going to put dot size. And this is going to give us the size of the array or, or it's going to give us, the, in other words, the number of elements which are stored in this uh, particular array. So if you run this code, you're going to see first output, the first element is Alex and then you're gonna see the size of the array is 3 so we get first element Alex and the size of the array is 3 and this is very important to note that the size of the array is always one times greater than the last index in the array so we have uh, an, ar an array which starts as index 0 and, uh, and ends at index 2 which uh, has a size of 3 so it's very important to remember this to avoid the uh, crashes in your uh, programming and of course that you can put other data types in your array so I can declare another array here also val called numbers and we can use the array of again and here I can pass some numbers and now you see the type is an array of int or an array of integers of, or whole numbers and you can also mix types here so you can put here numbers and strings so now we have an array and this which is between our angle brackets you don't know you don't need to understand this for now but this allows us to have array of two types respectively of type int and of type string and you can put also a char here if you want let's say a so you can create an array of any type if you want so this allows us to to put uh, to mix uh, our types in uh, in the array and uh, because we've looked at loops and how we can use loops you can use loops to loop to this array so I can put here let's say that I want to use the first uh, array so I can put here for name in names now I'm going to refer our array of uh, strings then print print uh, ln the name so now you see that we have this type hint for our uh, name variable that we have here of course this can have whatever name you want now if you run this you're going to see our uh, three names output it down here in the console So now we have Alex, Stephen, Stephen and Megan because uh, now we're, we're using the for loop to loop through our uh, array names and uh, this is interesting but what if you want to loop through our uh, array numbers which is uh, a mixed array we have numbers and uh, strings and charts we can refer it here let's call it uh, i in and now you see the type uh, that was inferred for the i is this comparable that we have here so this is gonna loop through our mixed array so we put here i now if you run this you're gonna see our uh, numbers and then our name one and our char output down here 
So now we get first element Alex, which is a print line statement, then the next print line statement, the size of the array, then we have our uh, numbers in our uh, numbers array, and then we have our name one, and our uh, and then we have our char. So this allows us to to loop through our mixed arrays. But what if I want to to output only if uh, I want to output in the console only the integers uh, in this mixed array called numbers? To do to do that, and this is a, a good good uh, way to introduce the is keyword. And with the is keyword, we can check to see if uh, a literal or a variable is of a certain type. So I can put here if i is let's say an int, then and only then we're gonna output its value in the console. Then we're gonna call our println and we're gonna pass our pass our i variable to our println uh, function. Now if you run this, you gonna you gonna see in our uh, loop only the numbers here, only the integers because this is keyword is checking to see if our i is of type integer and this is going to return true or false in our case it's going to return true for our uh, for all of our numbers that we have here so we have four five six seven and four again and you can check to see if this is uh, a char and we're gonna see in the console only our uh, single element a i'll put it down here So we have a, or you can check to see if this is a string, this uh, element that we're looping at this particular iteration, let's say. So if you run this, you're going to see in the console only name one, because only name one is of type string. So you get name one. So this is very important to know that with the is keyword, you can check to see if a variable or a literal is of a certain type or if it's not. And based on that to to do to do some uh, to do, to execute some uh, code in our case you output that value in the console if that condition is true so this is how you can use the is keyword and the for loop to, to the for loop to loop through our uh, array and uh, the is keyword to check to see if uh, an element in uh, our array is of a certain uh, type or if it's not and uh, let's change our uh, array numbers to a different name because numbers is very specific it implies that we only have numbers in this array but uh, we, we have a mixed type so we have multiple types in uh, our array we don't have only numbers and to do that instead of changing uh, our uh, numbers array in everywhere in our code where you're using the this variable we can right click on it go to refactor and uh, click on rename or we can click uh, Shift F6. Now, if I change the name of uh, our array numbers, it will be changed everywhere where you call this uh, variable. So, look, if I delete now the name, the name is also changed in our uh, line of code uh, 9 we're using in the loop. So, now if I change this to, let's call it uh, mixed. elements if I press enter now this will be also changed uh, everywhere where we call our uh, our uh, variable respectively on the line 9 here so now we have our uh, our uh, array numbers changed to mixed elements which is more uh, descriptive because it implies that we have an array of uh, mixed elements so now it's time to do a challenge using the knowledge that we have about arrays. But first of all, I'm going to delete the code inside the curly brace of the main function because um, I have the previous project opened. Now, the challenge is to create a function which is going to take as an argument an array of integers. Then you need to figure out a way to determine which number is the biggest number in that uh, array. Then you need to return uh, that number to, uh, to the function. And you need to create another function which is going to uh, do the same thing but is going to figure out what is the minimum um, number stored in that array and then it's going to return that value. And third, you need to find a way to combine those two functions in just one function which is going to 
return the maximum value stored in that array if you want, or if you don't want, it will uh, uh, return the minimum value. So try to solve this challenge and then uh, watch my solution. Now let's uh, solve this challenge. So first I'm going to create a function which is going to be called uh, find max. This function is going to return the maximum value. And it's going to take as a, and I'm going to define here a parameter and an array. So here I'm going to type a name for our array. It's going to be called numbers. And it's going to have the type array of int, of integers. And it's going to return an integer. Now, here I'm going to declare a variable, it's going to be a var, and it's going to be called max. And in this max variable, I'm going to store the first value in the, uh, which is, uh, which is passed, which is in the, which is in the array. So I'm going to type here numbers, square brackets, and I'm going to use the index zero to get the first value in the array. Then I'm going to loop through this array. So, for number in numbers, then here we're going to check to see if our uh, number is greater than our first value which was stored in the array, our max value. And if that is true, then we're going to store this value which is now greater than our than uh, our maximum value in our uh, max variable. So here I'm going to put max. Now it's going to be equal to this number, which is found to be greater than our previous uh, max value. And at the end of this loop, we're going to return the maximum value. And uh, we're going to do the same for the find them the minimum value. So I'm going to copy this code. And this is going to be called find min. But uh, here we're going to change a little bit the logic. Let's call this variable min. And here we're going to change the condition to less than min. Now let's call those function in our main function and uh, let's pass some arrays to see how uh, it works. So first I'm going to declare a variable, it's going to be a val and it's going to be called max. And uh, now I'm going to call our find max function and here I'm going to pass an array. And I'm going I'm to pass the array directly here. So I'm going to type array of and I'm going to pass some arbitrary numbers like Then I'm going to create another value. This is going to be called min. Now I'm going to call find min. And here I'm going to also call our array of function. And here I'm going to define some uh, arbitrary numbers again. Now I'm going to output those values in the console. So I'm going to Add println here. I'm going to type max value is dollar sign, and I'm going to refer our max variable defined above. Another println. Now if you run this code, get max value 7, which is correct. This is the biggest uh, number. 
and then we get minimum value is 4 and this is also correct so our uh, code works uh, perfectly well now the next thing is to combine those two functions that we have here let's decrease this now you need to find a way to combine those function in one single function which is gonna also return the maximum and minimum value but only if I want to return uh, to be returned uh, so I can determine uh, if I want the minimum value to be returned by that function or uh, if I want uh, the maximum value to be returned by that function so I need to find a way to combine those two and to do that I'm gonna delete our uh, second function I'm gonna delete the code inside the this function and I'm gonna change the name of this function to find min and max and now here I'm gonna define a parameter which is gonna be a boolean uh, which is gonna have a boolean type so I'm gonna call it I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it search max and it's gonna be A boolean all right now based on that boolean value if it's true if I want to search the maximum value here I'm gonna type an if statement so I'm gonna put if search max then I'm gonna add here the code to search for the maximum value but the first let's define a, a variable here it's gonna be also a var and it's be called uh, gonna be called max and uh, it's also gonna have the first uh, value in the array which is as the in the zero now if our search marks is true then we want our uh, maximum value to be search and return so I'm gonna add here to the code to to do that so I'm gonna type here a for loop which is gonna go through our uh, numbers array And here I'm gonna add uh, the if statement, which I'm gonna check to see if our number is greater than our max. Then I'm gonna assign our uh, our uh, number to our max. Now I'm gonna go down here, and, and uh, here I'm gonna add the else part. So if this uh, argument which is passed to our parameter search max is false so I don't want to search for the maximum value then that means that I want to search for the minimum value so I'm gonna put here else now I'm gonna add the code to search for the minimum value and uh, for this we need to define also a variable here it's gonna be called mean and it's gonna have the value of max I'm gonna explain in a minute uh, how this works now here we're gonna, gonna also loop in our uh, numbers through our numbers array and here we're gonna check if essentially we have the same code that we have in our uh, find uh, min uh, function so here we're gonna search if our number is less than our mean then we're gonna assign our number to our mean Also, we need to return this value at the end of our uh, loop. So here we need to return max, and here we need to return min. Now let's press Control Alt L to format the code. Now let's delete the, those the code that we have here. Let's delete also this code. Now. Here, now I'm gonna put uh, our uh, find min and max function dire directly in the println statement. So I'm gonna type here uh, or uh, or to put in a variable first. So let's put in a variable first. So I'm gonna define a variable. It's gonna be also a ma it's gonna be also max. And here I'm gonna type find min and max. Now here we need to pass an array first. So I need to pass we need to call our array of we need to define some uh, numbers here let's say uh, 
20 40 50 Now we need to pass an argument to our parameter search max which is going to be either true or false so first I'm going to pass true here now if we print uh, this value if you output this value in the console let's say that we type here uh, the max equals to dollar sign I'm going to refer our variable Now if you run this code, we get the maximum value is 100, which is correct. Now let's duplicate this code that we have here, and let's try it for dominion value. Let's call it mean. And let's add the println uh, statement down here. Let's type the mean value is dollar sign mean. Now if you run this code, and let's pass here false. Let's run this code again. Now we get the maximum value is 100, which is correct, and the uh, minimum value is 20. And uh, we did this with uh, our find uh, min and max function by combining uh, our uh, two previous functions. And uh, our code uh, until now works uh, okay. Now it's time to have a discussion about how this uh, code, uh, how this code, uh, how this solution to my challenge works. So now let's see how our uh, logic inside our find min and max function works. So first we declare our function find the min and max. Then we declare two parameters which is one is numbers and is of type array of integers. So here we're going to pass only an array of integers. And the second parameter is called search max and is a boolean. So we can pass here only true or false. Then we're going to say to the, then we say here that this function is going to return a value. Next on the line 9 we declare a variable which is called max and we assign using the index operator the first uh, element in the array in our max. So in this case we assign 20 in our max variable and then we declare another variable called min and we assign our max in our min. But our uh, max has the value of 20 because we assigned it here. So this variable min is also is also also having the value 20. So both has, have, the, have the value 20 at the start. Then we check to see if our search max parameter is true or false. And if it's true, then we're going to ex execute the if part. And the if part works in uh, the following way. First, we loop using the for loop through our uh, numbers array. Then we check at each iteration if our number let's say if 20 is greater than our max so if 20 is greater than 20 which is going to be false so the code inside the curly brace of the if is not going to be executed then we go for the next iteration so here now we're going to see going to check to see if our number respectively 40 is greater than our max which is 20 and this is going to be true and because of that, the code inside the calibration is going to be executed. So now we're going to assign to our max, which is now is 20, our number, which is 40. So now our max variable has a value of 40. And we're going to do, we're going to do the same thing for the next, for the 50. So this condition is also going to be true. So we're going to assign to our max 50 and so on and so on until it reaches 100, which is, uh, which is going to be also true. This condition is going to be true and we're going to be assigning uh, 100 to our max uh, value. Of course, that, that if uh, we had uh, another uh, number here, let's say 2, it's going to loop for that number also, and this condition is going to be false for that, because our number 2 is not going to be greater than max. And it's going to exit, it's going to exit the loop, it's going to ter terminate, 
and it's gonna return the maximum value which is 100 like we saw in our uh, output in our console and uh, at this point when we re return our max value the function is lived so it's not executing any line of code uh, uh, besides our uh, uh, return max it's not gonna execute the subsequent code which comes below but if our search max is false, it's going to execute the else part. So in this case, it's going to search for the minimum value. So here we have the same for loop. We search, you go through the through all the numbers. But here you're not checking to see if our number is greater than uh, max. Here you're checking to see if our number is less than our minimum number. So you, ch you check to see if our... Uh, Let's say, uh, let's say, let's take 20 first. You check to see if 20 is less than our minimum value, which is 20. And that is going to be false. So this code is not going to be executed inside the curly brace of the if. And it's going to loop again. And now it's going to check for the 40. And that is also going to be, going to be uh, false. So, and so on, so on, and so on, until it reaches 100, which is also going to be false. The loop is going to execute and it's going to return 20. Of course, that if... Uh, we put here 2, let's say, now the minimum value is going to be 2 because it's going to loop for another iteration and now one is going to compare to see if our number, respectively 2, is less than our mean, which our, our mean uh, previously was 20, that is going to be true and it's going to assign our 2 to our mean. So if you run this code now, now you're going to see that uh, the minimum value is not 20 but it's, but it's 2 and after that we return this value to the function uh, which is called so now I get the minimum value is 2 which is correct so this is how this uh, code uh, works and uh, see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about object oriented programming and particularly in this video we're gonna look at classes and objects but first I'm gonna create a new project I'm gonna call it OP for the language select Kotlin and for the build system IntelliJ make sure to have the JDK selected and uh, also I'm gonna check this little box because uh, this add sample code is gonna add uh, the main function and that code uh, for us so I'm gonna click on create to create the project now I'm gonna delete this code and I'm gonna hide the project pane now, what is object-oriented programming? Object-oriented programming is a way of writing code in a sense, in the way we think about the real world. So, in the real world, we have objects which can interact with, e with each other and um, which can do stuff. But the objects in the real uh, world have two major characteristics. First, is the state. So, an uh, the state of an, an object in real life is represented, let's say that we, we think about o of a car, the state is represented by the color of that car, by the number uh, of uh, gears that car has, by, uh, by the brand name of that car. So, this is uh, the state of a car. The next thing that uh, real life objects have is functionality. So, objects can do stuff. So, let's take again the example of a car. A car can move, a car can stop, a car can switch gears. So, objects in real life have this, uh, do, this, uh, those two characteristics, the, those two major char characteristics represented by the state and the functionality. And uh, the aim of object-oriented programming is to construct objects using code in the way they are... Uh, they in the way they are in, in the real life B but uh, to do that let's say that you want to build an object an actual object in real life what you first need to do the first thing that you need to do you, you need to create a template or a construction plan for uh, creating that object in which you're gonna define the generic things that uh, a car has and uh, in programming you will do the same thing but instead of using a piece of paper or a or uh, something uh, on, on, on your PC to draw that, uh, that um, template. In programming, uh, you're going to use a class. So the class is used to create the template, which then is going to be used to create an actual object, an object which is going to have a, a specific state and a specific functionality. So um, 
in a way you can think th uh, that uh, the real world serves here as a model for us to write code and uh, in this way in by combining uh, the state and the functionality in one entity and have an, an object and uh, as you can see you, you can also have uh, like in the real life objects communicating with each other you're gonna see that this is really powerful because uh, you can um, you can uh, model uh, your code in a more uh, dynamic in a more uh, in a more create creative way so this is what uh, we're gonna do next so first let's say that I want to create an object uh, of type car and uh, to do that we go down here and we need to define as I said the uh, construction plan the template for building an object and in this case we're going to build the car object so we're going to define what is called a class and we type the keyword class now we need to name our class i'm going to call it car and the name of the of the class should start with a capital letter and if it has multiple words it should be in pascal case then you put curly braces and press enter now inside the curly braces we need to define the state and the functionality as I said, for uh, the objects that are going to be built with this template. And um, to do that, we need to use variables first for the state or uh, or in the context of object-oriented programming and more specifically in the context of uh, classes. They are called, the classes and objects, they are called properties. And we, we define them like we define uh, simple variables. We type var and the next thing, the first thing that... Uh, that a car has is a name, a brand name. So we're gonna type name, but we cannot keep this variable uninitialized. We need to provide a value to it. And I'm gonna put an empty string for uh, for now. So we're gonna have the default value, an empty string. The next thing is the model, what kind of model this car is. So it's gonna be also a string. I'm gonna assign an empty string. The next property is gonna be called uh, color. It's gonna be also an empty string. And the next property is going to be called doors. So this is going to store the number of doors that a specific object, which is going to be built with this template, is going to have. And we're going to put zero. We're going to put zero now. Now, we need to define some functionality for uh, this class and for the objects, for an implicit for the objects that are, that are going to be built with this class. And uh, I'm going to add two functions. First one is going to be called move. It's not going to take any parameters. It's going to just output some text to the console, which is going to say that the car is moving. So we put quotation marks. The car is moving. Now we're going to define another function called stop. Also, it's not going to take any parameters. It's going to just output some text to the console. It's going to, it's going to say that the car has stopped. Now, we have the template, we defined what uh, our car is going to have. Now we need to create an actual or, or object, an actual and an specific object using this template. And to do that, we first need to declare a variable and uh, it's going to be a val and I'm going to call it car1. So, so our object is going to be stored in this variable car1. Then we put equals. And we type car, and now we have some suggestions, and we have our car that we define uh, below, our car class. So we press enter, then we put parentheses. So now we have created an actual object, a real object, real in the programming sense, and um, which, uh, but now this uh, actual object, was also this is called uh, instantiation because we created an actual instance but we don't need to bother with uh, these uh, names for now so we created an actual object using the, this template that we have below but the the properties of these specific objects are those properties that we define here those default properties and to define some uh, specific profit pro, pro, so, some specific values to these properties that this uh, car object that created has we need to type car1 dot so this is called informally dot notation 
And now we have some suggestions. So we have our uh, properties that we define for uh, a car. And now we type car1 dot and we choose the name. And now I'm going to assign a value to this name. I'm going to be called Tesla. So now our car1 uh, object that was created has the property name Tesla. Now we do the same thing for the next property for the model car1 dot model press enter and you put you put here s played so the model next we also type car1 dot now we're gonna assign a value to the property color and it's gonna be red next we type also car1 and we define for the property names for the property doors also a value so we're gonna put here four so now our object car1 has for its property for its property some uh, specific values respectively we have uh, for the name tesla for the model s plate for the car uh, for the color red and for the doors four so now let's output the property values of uh, this object that we created in the console. And to do that, we put our println function down here. We put quotation marks inside the parentheses because I'm going to add some text here. So, uh, so I'm going to type name equals, we put dollar sign, then we put curly braces. And inside the curly braces, we type car1 dot name. And this is going to return the the value of the property name for the car1 object that we created respectively is going to return tesla let's press ctrl d three times to do the same thing for the next properties and here we put car1 dot model so this is going to return the value of the model property we're going to put color and here we're going to type doors now if you run this code We get name Tesla. Actually, let's change uh, the text here to model to match the property name. Model color and doors. So now, if you run this, we get name Tesla, model is played color red and doors 4 and those are the values of uh, the properties of this object that we created here with uh, our uh, template uh, car next what we can also do because in the class we defined uh, two functions we can call those functions on this uh, object that we created and to do that we also use the dot notation we type car1 dot move and this is going to call the move function which is inside the car1 uh, object let's also type car1 dot stop to call the stop function so now if you run this code we get uh, the values of our, to, to our properties and then we get the car is moving and uh, the car has stopped so car1 dot move and car1 dot stop is calling the functions on this object that we created uh, here now let's uh, also add inside the functions the name of the car that is uh, moving so to do that we put here dollar sign inside the class and we type name and this is gonna re ref reference this property name that is defined here and let's also do the same thing for the star function let's type name and now what this is gonna do because those functions are in they are they are living inside this object that we created here car1 and this object has uh, the name Tesla when uh, those functions are gonna be called they they gonna they're, they're gonna say that the car and the name of the car uh, which is uh, in our case for our object is Tesla is moving and then it's gonna say the car again tesla has stopped because they are called on this uh, specific object that we created which has uh, 
those specific uh, values for its properties. Alright, so now if you run this code, we get as expected the car Tesla is moving and the car Tesla has stopped. So the functions are called on this object that we define here and it's using the property values that we define for this object. But as I said, with, uh, you can create as many objects as you want using the same template. And let's do that. Let's create another object. So I'm going to type here val car2. Let's put equals. We type car and then we put parentheses. And this created now another object, but we need to define some values to its properties because now the values for the properties are uh, the default values that we define inside the class, respectively the empty string and the zero. And to do that, we type here car2 dot name. So now we are calling the properties for the car2 object. And now we define some values to the car to the properties of the car2 object. So they are uh, this here is not overriding the value that we have here because this thing that we have here it's a distinct object in memory uh, from this object. They are distinct distinct objects and they have their own properties with their own values and their own functions. And now let's put here Ford. Let's put uh, car two dot model. Let's put Mustang. Let's put uh, car two dot color blue and for the doors let's put two car two dot doors equals to two and uh, let's output uh, those values in the console so let's output the values uh, of, the, of the properties for this second object that we created in the console and to, the, to do that I'm gonna copy this code I'm gonna paste, paste, uh, paste it below here and now I'm just gonna change the the variable to car2 to to call to call the properties on the car2 object. So we put here car2. So now we're calling uh, the properties values on on uh, our car2 object. And now if uh, I run this code, now we get name Ford, model Mustang, color blue, and doors for. And the first part is from the our sec for, from our first object, which is named Tesla, model spray, the red doors four, and the car Tesla is moving and the car Tesla stop. But let's add a space here to make uh, clear uh, uh, to make uh, clear which uh, to make uh, clear uh, that this is the output for the second object to make things more clear. And to add a space, we put here uh, our a, pr a println uh, statement. We put quotation marks and we put a backslash n and this is going to add a space between our println uh, statements so it's going to add a space between those statements and we, uh, and those so now if you run this code let's increase this we get the uh, name Tesla, so this is our first object, model is played, color red, doors 4, the car Tesla is moving because we're calling the functions on uh, the first object, and the car Tesla has stopped. And then we get name Ford, model Mustang, color blue, doors 2, and we have our space, because we put here this backslash and which adds uh, that space for us. Let's um, decrease this, and let's also call the functions the move and stop functions on the second object. So I'm gonna type here car2 that move and car2 that stop. So now if you run this, let's right click and just click on run main.kt. Now we get our uh, first object which is with, with is uh, value for uh, the value for with the value for its properties and then we get the two functions called on our first object and um, we get then our second object with uh, its values for its properties and then we get the car for this moving and the car Ford has stopped because now uh, 
we're calling the functions on the, this second object and this second object has uh, the value for the properties has has different values for its properties so this is why we get uh, the car for this moving and the car for has stopped again they are different objects they are distinct ob objects created using the same uh, template the, the same uh, construction plan and uh, I'm gonna end this video now and see you in the next video. So in the last video we saw how we can create a class and then how we can define uh, some properties and some functionality to that class then we use that class to create uh, two objects and then we define for those uh, objects for the property of those objects uh, some values but in the way uh, we, we define values to the properties of the object is to call the, the object and then uh, the property of the object and then we assign a value. And this is okay, but uh, if you have more than uh, than uh, four properties, let's say you have 20 or 100 properties, that will be very tedious to write each one of them and then assign a value. And uh, a better way is to use what is called a constructor. And as the name implies, the constructor is used to construct the object. And the constructor is called at the time when we create a new object. So at the time we, line, we, we uh, type this line of code, when you finish to type this line of code, the constructor is called immediately so that is the the time where uh, we, we need to pass the values to our properties and to do that we go down here where we define our class we put at the at the end of uh, our uh, at the end of the name of the class we put parentheses and here we define some parameters the way we define parameters for functions and the first one is going to be called name it's going to be a string the second one is going to be model, also a string. The next one, color, also a string. And the last one is going to be doors, and this is going to be an integer. Now, we need to assign whatever values pass to those parameters to the properties of the class here. And to do that, we just delete the empty string here and we'll type name. And as I'm typing, you see that we have name and it has this P. And this P stands for prop, for uh, parameter. So you, you're saying, do you mean this uh, parameter that we define up here? And then we press enter to fill that for us. Then we put, we type here model, color, and then doors. Now, if you go up here, we have some errors because now the the when you create the object the object is expecting for its uh, constructor some values so if you hover over here inside the parentheses it says um, no value fast for parameter color doors model and name so if you, and if you look down here you see that it has this public constructor so now what you need to do is to pass the value that you passed uh, down here to to the properties by calling the calling them on the object is to pass them directly in the constructor and then the values the arguments if you want are going to be assigned to the properties so i'm going to put here and you have this hint name tesla then we put a comma so you have the, again the, uh, the hint which is very uh, helpful so for the model we put s played And then for the color, we put red. And for the number of doors, four. All right, so now this is more concise. And now this is doing the exact th thing that we did previously, but this is uh, more concise. And we're using the constructor to pass the those values to the parameters to, that we define here. And then those parameters are going to be assigned to the properties respectively those properties name model color and doors you're gonna see what is the difference between the properties and parameters uh, in uh, in the next video now we have also an error here because uh, uh, this also expects some values to its constructor so instead of putting uh, those values here we put up here ford mustang blue and two 
Now we can delete this because we already passed the values for this uh, second object for its properties. And now if you look at the code, uh, the code is more concise and more uh, and easier to read. Now if you run this code, you will have the same output because the code uh, works well. So now if you look at the console, let's uh, increase this a little bit. Let's scroll up. You have the name Tesla, model is place, color red, doors 4, the car Tesla is moving, the car Tesla has stopped. So we have the same output uh, as previously. And down for the second object we have uh, we have uh, the name Ford, the model Mustang, the color blue, doors 2, and the car 4 is moving, and the car 4 has stopped. So our code uh, works uh, well. Now let's close the console. But if you go down here, you will see that you have this uh, this uh, the properties color. So if you hover over them, it says the properties explicitly assigned to a parameter name. So it can be declared directly in constructor. Now, what is uh, saying here, in other words, is that we can put the properties directly in the constructor. So you don't need to d define the properties down here and then uh, assign the value that is passed. The, to the parameter to the property and uh, the difference between the properties and uh, parameter is parameters is that the properties respectively those that we define in the in the header of the class inside the parentheses here of the, in the constructor is that uh, the properties are not uh, storing the state of of the class uh, they are not storing the state of the object they are, they are only here to to get whatever value we pass here, so whatever value you pass here, and its job is to only get that value and assign it to the property name. So only the the, the variables which are declared declared inside the class are uh, storing ultimately the the state of that uh, object. So uh, if I delete, let's say if I delete this here, now we have an error here because the property name uh, it says on unresolved reference name create member property card name and that is because the property name is not uh, declared it's not exists it's not it's not a it's not a, 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 a it's not a characteristic of a car we, we didn't define a property name because here the parameters the parameter name is only there to get the value and then pass the value to the property but we can uh, let's press uh, ctrl z to put the code uh, back now the error disappears because we have the property declared but because the only thing that we do here is to 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 get the value that is passed to the property as an argument here and uh, for the next ones and then assign it to the property uh, we can put those directly in the constructor so to do that we just we can uh, hover over here and uh, let's hover over and click on this light bulb and click move to constructor so now you have this you have the same uh, the same thing uh, the same thing but the only difference is that we have this var keyword in front and uh, that is responsible for changing the changing the parameter into a property so let's do the same thing for the next ones move to constructor and now we don't have that error that we don't have a, a property for our class because now our, because they have the var so if you put the var or the var keyword before declaring the 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 parameter it, it is going to be converted into a property so now those are properties of our class car so they are storing actually they are storing the the value that you pass to to them uh, for the object that we create so uh, it's not like previously where we have the property the parameter and then the value is passed to the property inside the class so now if you run this code we have the exact same output 
the only difference now is that this is uh, more concise. We have the properties declared direct directly in the constructor, so we don't have declared the parameters, and then we assign uh, the value that is passed to those parameters to properties. So you can uh, declare the the constructor like this if you want. So the question may arise when to use properties uh, and when to use uh, parameters, and to 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 answer that question, um, you have you need to have in mind that uh, if you want to do some if you want to do some work before you assign the value to the property, because in our case uh, the value that is passed here to the to the property in this case is directly stored in the property, so we cannot uh, add some uh, validation to check to see if uh, I don't know if uh, this uh, name is if if it starts to a specific letter or if it's uh, if it's an uppercase or because the value that is passed uh, that is passed uh, as an argument to the property there I say property because they are, they are, they are now declared as properties it is directly stored as uh, as uh, the state of the object so if you want to to do some work before you assign the value of the property you need to, de to declare it let's say let's say that you want to Let's actually delete this, and I'm, I'm going to declare it as a parameter. So let's say that you want to 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 trim the space that is passed. So let's say that I put some spaces here. Let's actually press Control Z to see what is happening if I don't do that. All right. I press Control Z too many times. So let's let's again pass. Let's put some spaces here. So now, if you run this code, let's run it again. Now, because uh, the value that is passed as an argument here to the object car1 is passed directly to the property so it's stored in the property and we we don't do nothing with it we have also the space but if you want to to delete that space uh, currently we can do that because the values pass directly to the property and there is nothing that we can do from uh, that point and to to change that we can declare the the property that is defined here, uh, the property name, as a parameter first, and we can declare it down here. Uh, the, we can declare down here now the property, and we can put equals. And now we we pass the the uh, the parameter to the property, so we assign name here. But before before that value is assigned to the property name, we put that trim and that is going to remove the spaces so that trim is a function which is part of the string class because the the data the all the data types that we looked at uh, are also classes so you can call functions on them the way we called functions on our uh, on our uh, objects so name that trim removes the space so in this case it removes the space uh, that we have here and after that it's assigning the value to the name uh, property. So now if you run this code, now we, now we have the space, but if you run the code, so let's go up, run the code. Now as you can see the space is removed because uh, we pass the value to the parameter now name then the parameter name trims that space and after that it's assigned the value to the property name so in this case so in this can be a scenario where we can uh, where we can declare the instead of declaring directly here the property can declare it as a parameter but um, what to, what what we can do if you want to add more code than just one line of code in that case we will need to use what is called uh, initializer blocks but um, we're going to look at the initializer blocks and uh, at, at uh, other things in the next video because uh, this video is long enough. So see you in the next video.
So in the last video we looked at uh, constructors and how uh, you can uh, use constructors to construct your objects and uh, it was a, an alternative to defining the values to the properties of the of a particular object and uh, we've also looked at uh, how you can define uh, the this was I should say it's also called the primary constructor that we have here the parentheses and then the parameters or the properties and uh, we've also talked about uh, how we can define uh, parameters to our constructor and then how we can uh, convert those parameters directly into properties and um, I also talked a little bit about how and when to use uh, parameters and properties but uh, in this video we will continue our discussion about parameters and properties and um, specifically gonna look at how we can uh, execute more than one line of code when the object is created because um, now uh, when the object is created and uh, we in the last video we trimmed this space that we have here uh, here you can execute only this line of code so if you want to add more line of code here to do some uh, to, to do a, a more uh, complex validation we can't because here we can put just one line of code and uh, to add more than one line of code of code we need to use what is called initializer blocks and um, initializer blocks are uh, as you'll see some blocks where we can put our code and uh, we can put more than one lines of code, you can put as many lines of code you want and that code is going to be executed uh, when an object is created, when an instance of uh, our of our, uh, of your uh, class is going to be created. So uh, this is what we're going to do in this video. Also I should say that uh, you can declare the class in another file, not just in this file like we did here. So we can open now the project pane, you, you can go to src, go to main, to go to Kotlin and here on Kotlin you can right click select Kotlin class file and uh, from here make sure to select file and I'm gonna call this file classes because here we're gonna put our classes respectively we're gonna put our uh, car class but you can put more classes there and uh, we're just gonna copy this class that we define here Control C and paste it here now I have an error because uh, this is declared two times here and uh, here and to, we just delete it from here and now the error disappears and if you run this code we get the same output because uh, our code uh, works uh, perfectly well uh, now the only difference is that now we put it, we put our class in a different file, and uh, my suggestion is for you is to put uh, the class if you want in a different fly file, because in this way you have uh, the code in, in a more organized uh, way. Because here you have your class, here you have uh, the code, uh, the objects that you create with that class, and uh, so on. Now, for this video, I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna create a different class and uh, to, do, to do that I'm gonna declare uh, another class but I'm gonna declare it down here and uh, I'm gonna delete the code that we have here because we're gonna use a different class and the class is gonna be called user so it's gonna represent the, the use an, an user object so we type here class user now we create the constructor, the primary constructor, we put parentheses, we define the parameters or the properties, for uh, now I'm going to define uh, directly the properties here, so we type here the var or the var keyword to have the property declared, var name, string, so it's going to be stores text, var last name also string, and uh, var age this is going to be an integer so this with this class we're going to create some uh, user objects we're going to put curly braces and uh, for now we're not going to put uh, any code here so let's create a, a user so let's type here val uh, let's call it user you can give it whatever name you want so let's, uh, let's create a new object now so we put we type here user and then we put the parentheses because 
I'm gonna put, I'm gonna pass the values to the constructor here. So we need to pass a name. I'm gonna type Alex. Last name. Dobinka. And for the age 23. So now we created a new instance, a new object using the our, using the class that we define uh, below. But um, what if I want to to pass to to the to the name uh, to the name name property only the 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 names which starts with uh, the letter A. In that case, we need to declare this uh, property as a parameter. First, we need to declare here the parameter, and then to declare the pro property below. And um, before before we assign the the value that is passed to to, to the property, we need to do some validation. And if uh, that uh, argument that is passed to the parameter is starting with the A letter, then we're going to assign the value to the property name. Otherwise, we don't do that. So to do that, uh, we need to use initializer blocks because we're going to type more than one line of code. And the, the initializer blocks are used in conjunction with the primary constructor. So when we create a new object, like we did here, the initializer blocks or the initializer block is going to be called uh, immediately when the object is created. And to use an initializer block, we just but first let's declare uh, let's change this to to a parameter. So let's delete the var keyword in front of uh, of uh, the variable. So now we have only a parameter here. Now let's declare the property down here. And now here we need to define an explicit type declaration. So we need to put here the type string because, as I said, um, we're not gonna assign uh, the value to the property directly here in one uh, line uh, of code. We're going to assign the value to the property inside the initializer block after we do the validation, respectively after we check to see if the name that is passed to the objects that we're going to create with the class starts with the letter A. And if the, the name, if the argument doesn't start with the letter A, then we're going to assign an empty string and we're going to output something to the console. So this is why we need to provide here the type because we're not going to assign the value directly here. So it cannot infer uh, what kind of data is going to store. Then we press enter, we type init, and uh, here we have a suggestion. We have the init keyword and then we have the curly braces. Press enter. And now here we're going to add our validation. And here we type if, parenthesis. Now we type name. So now we're referring the name parameter defined above here. So if name or the value that is passed to the name parameter, first we're going to um, lowercase that name. And to do that, we type here name dot lowercase. Because I want to have uh, both cases, so if uh, if the user passes, uh, let's say, a name with a lowercase letter, then we're gonna check to see if it starts with, with A. But if the user passes the the name with a, an uppercase letter, we also want to check to see if uh, if that letter starts with A. And to cover both cases, we lowercase uh, the input, we lowercase the name, uh, so all the, we lowercase all the letters. Then we, ta we put here another dot, starts with, and we put here A. And if that is true, then we're going to assign whatever value was passed to the name parameter to the name property. And we cannot type here name equals uh, name because now it's referring the parameter here. And to refer the property that we define here, we need to use what is called the this keyword. So the this keyword is used to refer the properties of the class. So we type here this. So we're saying this name. So now we have this name and we have a difference. We have this v variable here. Then we put equals name. So now we assign the value that is passed to parameter only if uh, that uh, value only if that value passed to the parameter starts with the letter a then we're going to assign the name to the property name else if that is not true put curly braces and now we need to cover the else part because if this is not true we also need to pass a value to 
to the name property. The name property cannot stay uh, without a value, so you need to pass also a value here. Else, we're gonna put this that name, and uh, we're gonna put uh, user. So I'm gonna put the user text if the if the the name doesn't start with the uh, with the letter A. And we're gonna also output some text to the console. So we put println here, and we we'll type the name doesn't start with the letter A or capital A. So now if you create a new object here, so we type here val, let's say friend, we create a new object, so we type user, now we need to pass the values to the constructor, so we put here, uh, let's say, uh, John, let's put uh, Smith, and let's put 30. Now, because the, the value that you pass here to the parameter name doesn't start with a, a letter A and start with the letter J, this validation inside the initializer block is going to be false and then it's going to execute the else part and it's going to assign to the property name the user uh, text and it's going to output the name doesn't start with the letter A or A. But if that, that is not, uh, if, but if it's true, if it starts with the letter A, then this line of code is going to be executed, the if part, and it's going to be assigned, uh, it's going to assign the value to the property. So now if you run this code, we get the name doesn't start with the letter A or A, and it's correct. Our name starts with the letter J. So if I put here, let's say, uh, Andra, let's change this to, oh, let's say uh, also Smith, now if I run this, now we have no output because the, this, the initializer block is, is called and uh, the if part is evaluated to true and it's assigning the, the name uh, Andra to our uh, name property. So let's add the print uh, ln down here to see that that's correct. So print, let's print the value of, of the property name for our friend object. And we put here, uh, and here we type uh, dollar sign, we put curly braces and we type friend, dot name so now if you run this let's close get name under let's put comma here let's put colon here so our initializer block is called the code inside the initializer block is um, executed and then uh, this uh, if check evaluates to true and then and then it assigns the name Andra to our property name. But if we I put here John let's type it like this let's say to see that it's working because we lowercase the letters. We get the name doesn't start with the letter A or A, name user. So the initializer block is executed immediately when the object is created and uh, the code inside the initializer block is called it checks to see if, sta if it starts with a lower it starts with a, with the letter a and if not then it is assigned to the property name user so we have this why we have user here and then it outputs uh, this uh, text to the console. So this is how we can use the initializer blocks in conjunction with the primary constructor. And um, you can also put more initializer blocks and uh, the order in which you put the initializer blocks matters in the sense that uh, the order in which you define the initializer blocks is, is going to be the order in which they, they are executed. So the order in which you define them is uh, important. 
but uh, most of the time I think you'll, you use only one initializer block to put your code. So this is our discussion about initializer blocks and in the next video we're going to look at um, because we talked about the primary constructors there is uh, another type of constructor which is called the secondary constructor or the secondary constructors and uh, we're going to also look at the default parameters because you can put you can uh, we can define default uh, values to the properties or to the parameters of the constructor so we're going to do that <coughs> we're going to do that in the next video i'm going to end this video now so now it's time to start a discussion about secondary constructors because besides our primary constructor that uh, we define and that we talked about in Kotlin you can uh, define multiple constructors and those are called uh, secondary constructors. Now you may be wondering why you will need secondary constructors. And um, to answer the, that question we, we need to consider um, the user class and the user object that we can create. So let's say that an user only provides its first name and uh, for the properties last name and age doesn't provide any value. In that case, you will need the you need a way to to define some default values for those uh, properties in case the user only provides the first name. And uh, if uh, let's say the next user uh, does provide the, the first name and the last name and the age, in that case you're gonna use uh, the the primary constructor. But if it doesn't provide uh, those uh, those values, then you're gonna use the secondary constructor. But to make this uh, more clear, let's uh, let's add the code, and we talk we talk about was while I am uh, writing the code. So let's delete the, the initializer block that we have here because we don't need this code. And let's also put the property now. Let's define the property in the primary constructor. So let's just put here a, a var, the var keyword in front of the variable. Let's also delete this println. And um, let's delete the values here for the last name and the age. So now, as you can see, we have an error because it's expecting here the um, it's expecting an argument, a value for the last name and for the age. And uh, to to solve that problem, we just go down here and we type constructor. So this is the keyword for declaring the secondary constructor. And we press enter to fill in that for us and we put parentheses. And now here in the parentheses we define the parameters and I am specifically saying parameters because as you will see the secondary constructors cannot declare properties. They can only declare parameters because uh, anyway let's uh, so let's define here the parameter. So I'm going to type here name. Let's put here uh, the type of this variable, it's going to be a string. Now, if you hover over here, it says primary constructor call expected, insert this call. So, what all the secondary constructors need to do is they need to call the primary constructor because ultimately the primary constructor is the one which declares the property, the properties for the class and stores the values for uh, of that uh, pro of that property and to do that we put here colon we type this so we put colon this we type the this keyword then we put parentheses and to the this call we pass the name so this name that we define here and for the next two values we're going to pass some default values. So here I'm going to put user because uh, let's say that because well, as, uh, as I said in the beginning, this user is gonna not, it's not going to provide uh, the last name. So let's put here last name, not user. Last name. And uh, for the age, let's put um, let's put uh, let's say zero. All right. Now, what this is going to do? is now if you look uh, up here we don't have an error so let's uh, so now we don't have that error because now it's using the secondary constructor is passing the value here alex to the 
secondary constructor that we define here. And here we define only the parameter. And the value that is passed to this parameter then is passed to, this, to the primary constructor because by putting colon and this in parentheses, we're calling now the primary constructor. And is the primary constructor the one which ultimately declares the property and stores whatever value we send to him? In this case, we send the value Alex, and for the last name, uh, we uh, we just uh, send the, last, the text last name, and for the age, we put uh, zero, because this is our way to saying that this uh, user doesn't want to provide its age. So this is why uh, you need to call the the primary constructor from the secondary constructor because uh, again the secondary the primary constructor is the one which ultimately declares the properties of the class is the one which stores the 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 properties uh, of the class the secondary constructor only only takes parameters and then calls the primary constructor so in fact if you put here the var keyword you have an error which says var on secondary constructor parameter is not allowed that is because the secondary constructor cannot call uh, cannot declare properties only the primary constructor and uh, because as i said we can declare multiple secondary constructors we can type here constructor so we can declare another uh, secondary constructor and here we can put name here we put string then we type last name also a string so this secondary constructor is only going to take the name and the last name as uh, arguments the age is not gonna this uh, secondary constructor is gonna, not gonna take any value for uh, the age now we need to put colon we type this parenthesis because now we're calling the primary constructor and here we we pass the name that is passed to this secondary constructor this that we define here the last name and for the age we're gonna put zero because this uh, this second secondary constructor doesn't uh, uh, take any value any arguments for its uh, for its age but because as I said ultimately the primary constructor is the one which uh, defines the properties we cannot uh, we cannot call the primary constructor and not pass any value. So we pass this default value here. And uh, so now if we, if we go up here and let's say that I delete the age. Now our code works fine because now what is happening here is this the, the value for the for the name and the last name is passed to this secondary constructor, this one here. And the secondary constructor then calls this primary constructor and it's passing the two values to the primary constructor. Name, respectively this name, John, and last name, Smith. And uh, for the age, it uh, passes the default uh, value zero. So this is, how you can, this is why we can pass here, uh, uh, this, this is why you can avoid here uh, to pass, uh, let's say, uh, you can avoid to pass uh, the, the last name and the age for the first because it is using the first secondary constructor and this object that we created here it's using this secondary constructor because here we're passing only the first name uh, for the first a value for the first name property and uh, a value for the last name property so it's passing them to this uh, secondary constructor which then in turn calls the primary constructor it passes them to the primary constructor so it passes the the two va the two the, the values for the two properties and the last one is defaulted because uh, he, because you don't provide the value for the age with pri with secondary constructors you can also put you can at the end of uh, the call of the primary constructor you can put uh, curly braces to have some code executed when you create an uh, object with that specific uh, secondary constructor so you can put here curly braces and inside the curly braces you can have some code which uh, is going to be executed when you create an object with uh, this let's say secondary constructor when we, and when you create an object with this secondary constructor so it's up to you what uh, code you put there
But to illustrate this, let's put uh, a println statement here in the in this secondary constructor. So let's type here println, and here I'm gonna type second, and um, I'm gonna type second because uh, this is the first constructor. This is the primary constructor, and this is the one which uh, ultimately does all the work. Is the one which stores the value for uh, the properties, and uh, this is the third constructor. So let's copy this. Let's put here third. Just for illustration. Also, let's uh, output in the console, the console the value of uh, the the property values for uh, these objects. So let's type here println and uh, let's type here name equals. Let's put the dollar sign. Let's put curly braces. Let's use our user. Uh, variable now let's call the properties on this uh, object so let's type name now let's press ctrl d two times and let's put here now uh, last name and uh, age and uh, let's also add a space between the information about the two objects to make things more clear so let's put a print and here let's put a backslash n here and let's copy the code that we have here let's paste it, paste it below let's change this uh, object to our friend object that we created so let's type here friend and I'm gonna speed this uh, now a little bit because it will take some Now let's output uh, this information in the console. So now what we have is we have we have second and then third because uh, this first object is using the the second constructor. So this is why we have here uh, second. And uh, then the next line of code is called, and we have third because uh, this one, this object that we have here, the friend object, it's using the third constructor, this secondary constructor. So this I have here third. Then we, then we have the values for the properties. For the then we have the values for the properties of the user object. So we have the, here the output down here, and uh, then we scroll down. And we have uh, name John, last name Smith, age zero because we have uh, the property values for the second object for this object. And uh, this is okay. This works uh, completely fine. The thing to have in mind is that uh, now we're using the secondary constructors, and the secondary constructor then calls the primary constructor, and the primary constructor is the one which uh, ultimately stores the values. So, which ultimately declares the properties and stores the, the values. But uh, one thing to notice in the output is that uh, the first object has the name uh, Alex and the last name last name and the age zero. That is because uh, the first object is only uh, taking a value for the first name property or for the name property and uh, for the last name and the age because it's using this secondary constructor it's uh, only passing the first name which is Alex that we have here and then it's using the default values last name and a zero it's passing those default, default values to the primary constructor so it's calling the primary constructor it's passing the value Alex and then uh, the default value last name and zero this is why I have last name and zero here and for the next one we have uh, name uh, John and last name Smith. This is because now this is using um, the next secondary constructor and um, that takes as uh, arguments the name and the last name and then it's calling the primary constructor. It passes the first name and the last name and the age uh, is defaulted so we have zero. So this is how you have here John and Smith and then zero. So it's important to 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 notice this and to think about how uh, this uh, think about this thing.
So this is our discussion about multiple constructors, respectively about secondary constructors. In this video you saw how we can uh, pass uh, a different uh, number of uh, values to our uh, properties. Ultimately you pass all the values to the properties by calling the primary constructor and providing default values because uh, in this way you can uh, satisfy all the possible cases. So if uh, in our case uh, one user only provides the name and the last name is not provided and the age is going to use uh, this secondary constructor and, and it's going to pass the last name as default and the age uh, zero. And this is um, in a way uh, similar to overloading uh, functions but is uh, not uh, the same because uh, what we're doing here is overloading uh, the constructors and uh, this in this way you can uh, you can think about uh, uh, why why uh, we are overloading the constructors and uh, that is because if uh, we didn't uh, have uh, secondary constructors we would have to create another class with a different number of uh, parameters or, or a different number of uh, properties and uh, we will need to to create each object with that uh, specific uh, class let's say that we create this object which only takes uh, a value for its parameter name then we have to create a class with, in which we're going to define only the name property and it's gonna then we're gonna create that object only with, with that class and uh, if uh, an object if an object uh, let's say if an user uh, creates uh, if, if an user doesn't pro pro is providing uh, the the name and the last name but not the age you will have to create another class with only the name and the last name uh, defined uh, as its properties and you can see that this this uh, is uh, this will generate uh, uh, duplicated code and so on and we can solve all of this by using uh, secondary constructors and uh, calling the primary constructor. So, see you on the next video. And because Kotlin is about con conciseness, in the next video we're going to look at how we can do the same thing that we have here with default parameters. Because um, Kotlin supports for its uh, properties, for its parameters in the constructor default values. So the same thing that we have here can be achieved by providing default values to the properties. So see you in the next video. So now it's time to look at default values for our properties. And uh, first let's delete the secondary constructors. And now we have uh, errors here because uh, it expect the value, the, expecting the values for the next properties here, and um, let's also change this to to first name because I refer to it to the first name, but uh, it was uh, called it is, it is it is called name, so let's call it first name. So go right click on it, go to rename and then to refactor to change it in all the places, and uh, let's call it first name. And as you can see now, let's change it in all the place, then press enter. So now we have the first name. And um, default uh, properties are, uh, default values to our properties are basically, they are similar to default values that we provide uh, to our uh, parameters uh, when we talked about functions. And what we do is, uh, let's say that I want to provide a default value for the last name, we just put equals. So inside the primary constructor we put equals and here we put let's say last name. So now this has the last name as its default value if a value is not provided for the last name. And here you can put also equals and we put zero. And now the error as you can see disappeared from uh, both of our objects because now what is doing is when we don't provide a value for the last name and for the age, then the default values that we provide here are going to be are going to be used as the values for uh, the properties. So this is uh, a way of uh, achieving the same thing that uh, we achieved previously with the secondary constructor, but this is more concise. And the question is when to use one on one or the other is um, the um, the answer maybe if you want to execute some code when uh, an object is created, let's say, 
with one of the let's say if you wanted to if you want to execute some code when you create uh, an object then you can use secondary constructors because as i said secondary constructors can have a block of code when uh, it, which can be executed but uh, the this uh, the, the default because primary constructor does not don't ha don't have a don't have a block of code they you cannot do that M maybe you could use uh, initializer, initializer blocks but uh, that is uh, open to discussion so this is how you can provide default values to to the primary constructor in our code works fine it's and it's very concise very beautiful and um, the next thing that you can do is that you can uh, also use named arguments so you can use the because here you use the first name and the last name and if i um, because those are uh, those are uh, both strings here you cannot see the distinction but if i put here uh, now i can use the name argument so i can put here first name equals so it's similar to the way we have uh, name arguments in our function and here you can put the text john also here and this uh, with this thing you can uh, you can uh, change the order in which you need to define the values for the parameter so let's put here last name but to illustrate this better let's create another object this type val user2 let's type user and let's put here you wanna but let's use the uh, name argument so let's put first the age so we're gonna provide the value for the age let's say uh, 19 and uh, let's uh, let's type first name so here let's put uh, you wanna because this is a string in quotation marks and for the last name let's say um, let's type also the name argument last name <coughs> and for the last name let's put here um, Dobby let's say right so what we did here is that uh, in uh, the primary constructor the order uh, for, uh, for of the property is very specific we have the first name and the last name and then we have the age but with the name arguments we first provided the age so we provided uh, a value for the age probably which is the last one so and then you provide the value for the first name and uh, with uh, name arguments similar to the way used in our functions you can uh, pass the va values to the properties in which order you want irrespective of the order in which they are defined here so this is very powerful if uh, if you ask me it's very interesting because um, you can uh, pass the values to the properties irrespective of the order in which they are uh, defined so this is our discussion about default uh, parameters and uh, named arguments in uh, with uh, the primary constructor and uh, you cannot use default parameters and name arguments with the secondary constructors they can only be used with the primary constructor so see you in the next video but uh, before i end the video let's actually run this code to see that uh, it works uh, in the same way it was uh, working in previously when we used the uh, secondary constructors so let's run this code So you have name Alex, last name, last name, because it's using this default value that's defined here. Then we have age zero because it's using this value defined here. So this this object. And then um, we have name John, last name Smith, age zero because now it's using this default value. So the same thing can be achieved using um, default parameters. And uh, we didn't output the values for the for the second uh, for the third uh, object that we created here user 2 but you can do that as a as a challenge for if you want you can output the values for uh, this uh, object so see you in the next video
So now it's time to start a discussion about getters and setters because um, so far in our videos, even though we didn't see explicitly the getters and setters uh, here, we've used the getters and setters every time we got the value of a property and every time we assign a new value to a property. And um, the getters and setters in Kotlin are implicit, so they, they are declared, they are auto-generated auto by default uh, by, by Kotlin for you. So every time uh, you, in, let's say you get the value of uh, an object, let's say that you get the value of the user that first name, what actually happens here is not that we're uh, getting the value of the first name directly, even though if you look at the code, this is what it seems to be. What is happening is that Every time we get the value of uh, of a property, that value is returned by the getter. So you never access the property directly, and you never, uh, never uh, does change the the property of uh, the value of a property directly. You every you every time you you are using the getters and setters. And now this discussion is touching on um, on a very important concept in. Um, Kotlin programming and that is encapsulation. So encapsulation basically means to to protect, to hide the inner workings of the class from being accessed outside. And uh, if you look at this syntax that we have here, it seems that we actually accessing the values, uh, the properties directly. But as I said, that is not the case because we always using the getter and the setter. And uh, because we always use use the getters and the setters, the getter to get the value and the set to to change the value of a property. That means that uh, your uh, data, your properties are never accessed directly. Thus, uh, the law, laws of encapsulation are not broken. The, the, um, in other words, you, you you never allow uh, somebody outside of the class to access directly that property. So this is why uh, this is why we have uh, getters and setters, and this is why the getters and setters in Kotlin are implicit. So they are not even declared explicitly here. We don't see any code which to imply that we have a getter or setter here, because uh, they are automatically and by default generated every time you define a property. So every time you define a property, either in the primary constructor or inside the class the getters and the, get, the getter and setter is automatically generated for you but uh, let's say that you, you want to override the getter and setter to provide some uh, additional uh, additional code to the code that is uh, by the by default provided you can do that by changing let's say this uh, property to a parameter and to override the getter in setter and to see how the getters and setters actually look under the covers, just type here var. We define the property, first name. We assign the first name parameter to property. Now, the getters and setter need to need to be overrided that, uh, the immediately after the we after we define uh, the property. So we cannot have some code here and then uh, to override. We can to override the getter and setter. So we need to we need to, we need to define them immediately after we we define the property. So we type here get and as I'm typing you see that I have some suggestion. Then you go down here you, and you can choose uh, you choose this one. So you have parentheses, curly braces and inside the curly braces you, you press enter. Here you type return field. I'm gonna explain immediately what is this. And now we need to override the setter. And to do that, we just type set. And I have some suggestions. We also go down here. We choose this one. Press enter. And here we type field again. This uh, and this identifier. And we put equals to value. So this is the implicit code that is generated, that is auto-generated by Kotlin for you every time you 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 define a property in your class either in the as I said in the primary constructor or uh, inside the class. So uh, because in fact if you look here we have some underlines and if you hover over here it says redundant getter remove remove redundant getter because uh, and also for the setter redundant setter because 
they, they are redundant because they are uh, implicitly again auto generated uh, by Kotlin for you so this code is redundant here you don't need this code because Kotlin already provides this code uh, under the covers for you but if you're not satisf satisfied with this code with this implicit code that is uh, auto generated by Kotlin you can you can um, you can override them like we did here and provide some additional code so we can put here let's say some text so so that every time we get the value of our uh, we get the value of our uh, first name uh, property we're gonna have a pre prefix and let's put here uh, first name let's put a colon dollar sign and field I'm gonna explain I'm gonna explain immediately what this field is but let's say first how uh, how this works and here let's put a println to print the value that is passed to the setter and then assigned to the first name property so let's put here dollar sign value was assigned to first so now if you run this code Now we have name, so we have uh, our text that we have here, name, and then we have first name Alex, let's actually delete this text to make uh, things more clear, let's delete this text, let's delete this. Now let's run this code again. So. What we have now is that every time we get the value of our property name, we, ha we have that prefix first name that we have uh, overwritten here in the in the getter. So the getter is called, uh, as I said, the value is returned by the getter. So the getter is, c is called, it returns the value of the first name property. So this field is uh, is the first name property, but is uh, it has this identifier field because of, uh, of an important reason, which I'm going to explain uh, immediately. So it returns the value of the first uh, name property with the prefix first name. And we have first name, the text that we have here. Then we have the value of the first name property. We have uh, Alex in our case, because our object has the name Alex, as the property name uh, Alex. Then for the for the setter we don't have any code uh, here also we have the first name uh, prefix for john so our our code every time we get uh, we get the first uh, name uh, property by any of the any of our, of our objects created by by using the user class it, it gets that value it returns that value through the getter and the setter uh, we don't have uh, value as assigned to first name property because the setter is called only when we change uh, the value of uh, of uh, of a properties and to do that we type uh, user like we did in our first video about object oriented programming that first name equals let's say oh let's put here uh, Vlad so now if I run this code now the setter is going to be called because the setter is called as I said only when each we change the value of our uh, of our of of our property so we get uh, we get vlad was assigned to first name property so uh, the code inside the setter was called because uh, this code that we type here is calling the setter so our code only only always goes to the setter and the code that we have here user that first name vlad what it's actually doing is passing that value Vlad to here so this for this uh, this parameter it, uh, that we have here is uh, receiving the value of Vlad and then that value is assigned to first name property again we have this field identifier for a reason and the reason is going to be explained immediately so uh, the getters and setters uh, are working uh, well and they are uh, as I said again the use always when we get or uh, we assign a new value to our properties now what is this field identifier why I didn't uh, type here uh, first name and here I didn't put uh, first name 
equals to value. So whatever value is passed to the setter, then that value is assigned to the first name property. So why why do not, we don't do that? And um, the reason uh, for that is that because uh, this syntax user that first name user that first name user that first name equals Vlad is calling the setter. If uh, we put here first name equals value, so first name equals Alex, it will be equivalent to to call the setter again. So this line of code that we have here, it will call the setter again, it will pass the value to the setter and then it will, it will assign the value again to the first name. So it will call the setter inside the setter forever. It will be, it will generate an error. And to avoid the, that recursive call, that infinite call, we need to use this field identifier. So the field in the identifier is the first name property, but it has this uh, uh, special uh, uh, use that it bypasses that uh, error that it will be generated if you use the first name here so uh, in fact let's uh, let's put here a first name to see so if you put here first name instead of field and we have an error here let's put here a field because uh, I want uh, I want the error from the setter to to get in the console, not the error from uh, this thing here. So now, if you run this code, as I said, that will generate a recursive call. It will call the getter over and over. So we get the error. So you see, we have Vlad was assigned to first name property. Vlad was assigned to first name property. Vlad, and so on. That is because um, the setter. It's calling the setter forever. It's a, rec it's a recursive call because this line of code here it's calling the setter. It's as, it's um, assigning the value to the sending the value to the setter. Then it's that value is assigned again to the first name property, which in turn calls again the setter and so on. So this field uh, identifier is used because it has this characteristic of uh, bypassing that error. This is why we're using the field instead of the first name uh, property here. And uh, it's basically the first name property, but it has this uh, specific uh, characteristics which uh, characteristic which um, bypasses the uh, recursive call which uh, we got when we've used the first name property. Now if you run the code, Now I have no error because the recursive call is not happening because we're using the field which bypasses that error. So this is why we're using uh, and we're having and Kotlin has this thing field and this the field can only be used inside the getter or the setter, not uh, um, not anywhere else outside the getter or the setter. And uh, the same is true about the getter. This is why you need to use the field identifier inside the getter also because it will uh, generate a recursive call. Uh, again now to to illustrate uh, better because um, you may be find uh, confusing this discussion about getters and setters what uh, they really are they are uh, equivalent to having two functions which uh, update the first name property and uh, return the first name property so they they are equivalent to having a function called set uh, first name and this function defines a parameter called, let's call it new value. It's going to be of type string. Let's put curly braces. And here we type this dot first name equals new value. And the getter is equi equivalent to having a function called get first name. And this is not going to take any parameter. It's going, it's, we're going to say, say explicitly here that it's going to return a string because it's going to only return a value. And this is going to return the first name property. So we put here this, that first name. So the getter and setter that we have here are similar. This is uh, illustrative for you to 
have in mind to having two functions which are setting the first name property are updating the first name property and are uh, returning uh, let's change this to first and are returning the first uh, the value of the first name property but uh, because constlin is about con conciseness it has this special uh, syntax and uh, they are uh, automatically generated uh, for you because uh, as i said Kotlin is about uh, conciseness so you don't need to declare those things uh, every time you create uh, a class so let's delete this so have in mind that the, uh, under the covers is we have something like this so let's delete this now the error disappears also you can uh, have a shorter way of writing the setter and getter if you don't provide uh, some additional code so if i delete this and this i can put here get equals field and uh, da. yes uh, this is uh, this okay because this is like having uh, a single line uh, a single function a single line expression function because we're returning the value to the function get so you can uh, write it like this because or uh, i i show you th this for you because maybe you'll see uh, written in this way and you may be wondering why that is because um, this is like having a, a single uh, body expression function so you can write it like this if you want but again if you hover over this is still redundant let's so let's press ctrl z to have the previous code so this is our discussion about getters and setters and um, see you in the next video so now it's time to start our discussion about the late init keyword and how we can use the late init keyword uh, with uh, our properties but first let's delete the code that we have from the previous video because we don't need this code let's also delete this code let's delete those uh, two objects let's and let's delete this property let's declare it here so let's put the var keyword and uh, let's also delete the default values here and let's press ctrl alt to format the code now we need to provide the values here because we don't have uh, default values for the last name property and the age so i'm going to type here dobin let's say and age 23 now as you already know if you declare inside the class um, a property let's say that uh, that property is uh, called favorite movie and it's going to store the favorite uh, movie of the user you cannot let this variable uninitialize so uh, let's say that it's going to be of type string so you cannot let this variable uninitialize you need to provide a value either by assigning directly a literal value here or by uh, receiving the value through a, through, to, uh, a, param a parameter defined in the constructor but um, that is not completely true because sometimes you'll want to to have a property declared inside the class but you don't want to assign uh, to it a value uh, uh, right away so you want to assign the value to the property later and to be able to do that we need to use the late init keyword and to use the late init keyword we just type here late init and we have a suggestion late init and uh, late init search for initialize letter later so what we're saying here is initialize let later this property favorite movies so you say in the co co to the compiler hey i'm gonna initialize this uh, property favorite movie but i'm gonna initialize it later so believe me and uh, to do that we just uh, type user that so you uh, whatever your object you create with this class and you have a defined uh, latent property favorite movie and you put equals and then you put let's say uh, interstellar here So now we've initialized our uh, favorite movie property, but we initialized uh, its value later. So we didn't provide the value here directly inside the class, either by, as I said, by providing a literal value or by uh, providing a value through the parameter defined uh, in the primary constructor. So this is how you can use the latent keyword if you want to 
assign a value to a property later. So you don't want to assign the value directly or, or you don't want to assign the, the value cor more correctly said uh, right away. So you want to assign the value later. You just put the latent it keyword in front of the property and then you declare uh, the property as uh, you, you the way you declare a simple variable. Right? And uh, if you don't initialize this uh, this uh, property and you want to, and you output the value in the console, so let's say that I put here a println and I type user that favorite movie and I don't initialize it. And if I run uh, this code, now this uh, favorite movie property is not initialized, doesn't have a value. We're gonna have an error, and the error is uh, it's very specific. So we have exception to the main uh, Kotlin uninitialized property access exception, we have, we have, and then it says latent property favorite movie has not been initialized. So it's very specific in saying that hey, you didn't, you said that you're gonna initialize that. Uh, property but you didn't and uh, down here you try to 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 output in the console the value of the far favorite movie but we don't have uh, provided a value and it's better to have this uh, this is called an exception so it's better to have this uninitialized, pro uninitialized property access exception than having a null, null pointer, pointer exception because this is why Kotlin actually enforces this uh, behavior of uh, uh, assigning uh, values to the variable to the variables so uh, Kotlin enforces to assign values to, to the variables and uh, not let them uninitialize because uh, if you don't initialize uh, uh, you don't provide a value to a, to a variable or to a property then when you try to access uh, that variable or that property and let's say that you have an app uh, that is gonna throw what you is going to throw what is called a null pointer exception and that is very bad because those kind of exceptions are called only at runtime and not at compile time so your app can uh, work uh, let's say completely well and uh, when you press a button i don't know to to see the the fa 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 favorite movie of uh, uh, an user then you get an error and the app crashes. So this is uh, why you need to avoid uh, those uh, null pointer exceptions. And um, Kotlin, as I said, enforces this behavior of uh, providing um, values always to the variables to, and to the properties. And um, if you don't want to provide a, a value to the property, then you can use this latent and uh, it will show this uh, different uh, exception called latent property favorite movie has not been slice so it's it's uh, a different um, exception than uh, the null pointer exception but with the latent keyword we can still have uh, as i said that behavior of not initializing the variable but you still need to initialize it later because this is why it's called late in it but this is not uh, saying that uh, the latent it uh, error that is shown here is not uh, also uh, having the same you know, behavior like the null pointer exception that I talked about because the late uh, init uh, error that is uh, that we have here if you have uh, an app it will uh, also crash your app but the late init uh, keyword allows us to not provide as I said a value lit a li a literal value here or a, a value through the constructor by the by uh, assigning the parameter here with the value pass to the parameter and uh, uh, the is uh, is uh, our uh, responsibility to initialize that variable later so that we don't uh, get into the same uh, problems that we talked about so we don't uh, get this error so it's up to you to to declare a, a property as later and eaten, then provide uh, a value later S because if you don't it will also crash your app when you try to access uh, by uh, I don't know in uh, your app somehow you want to access uh, the value of uh, that property so uh, always have uh, have this in mind that you need to initialize uh, that uh, variable later also I should say that the latent keyword only works with 
classes and uh, it does not work with uh, primitive types so even though the as i said the integers and all the data types that we looked at and also the boolean and char are uh, classes we cannot use latent it here with them because if i put here int you can see that i have an error that it says latent modifiers not allowed on properties of primitive types because uh, i'm not gonna get into much of details but what all we need to know to know is that uh, when uh, the int class and all the primitive types uh, which are classes uh, at least uh, uh, at the surface uh, when they are compiled i think they are uh, compiled into primitive types so they are not compiled into classes so um, this i think is the reason that uh, you don't uh, you can't use this latent int keyword but for uh, other classes, because a string is uh, is a data type, but it's a special data type, as I said uh, in a in a previous previous video, and uh, because of that, you can use the latent keyword, and you can use the latent latent keyword uh, with other classes. So I can put here user if you want, and it works because user is also a class. It's this class that we define here. So uh, it's good to 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 remember this. Now I'm going to end the video and uh, see you in the next video. But first let's uh, press Ctrl G to have the code that we had previously. So uh, now I'm going to end the video and see you in the next video. So now it's time to start a discussion about companion object. But to do that I'm going to delete the class that we have here. And I'm going to paste it inside our classes uh, file because we're going to need this class later. In our videos and I'm gonna also delete this code because we don't need this code and let's say that uh, let's create a class called calculator it's not gonna define any properties it's just gonna have a simple function called sum which is gonna sum two numbers so we're gonna define two parameters here a is gonna be an int a b also an int and it's gonna return the sum so we put colon at the end of our uh, uh, parenthesis for our function we put int because this is what you're gonna return and we put curly brace and we type return a plus b or you can put this in a single body expression function so you can put the code like this if you want So you can put here, uh, you can also delete the type, you can put here equals. And this will work, but I'm gonna keep it uh, like this. Now, if you want to use this uh, sum function that is defined in, in this uh, class calculator, first you need to create an object with that class. So we type here val, I'm gonna call it calculator. And uh, I'm gonna create here a new object calculator. The constructor doesn't have any properties any parameters and if you want to to call that sum function we need to use our calculator variable or uh, our calculator object or reference and we put that like we did in our previous video so use the dot notation so now we're calling the sum function on our calculator object that we created online too and we put and we call our function sum Inside the parentheses you pass two numbers, let's say 5 and 10. And uh, let's capture this value that is returned by the by the function in a variable. So let's put here uh, val result. Because that is going to return the sum of uh, 5 and 10. Of course that you can put that in a println uh, statement if you want but i put it uh, in this elaborate way to to make um, more clear what we're doing and here i'm going to type print ln result so now if i run this code you're going to see 15 in outputs in, in the console so let's increase this so we have 15 and uh, the way we did this we created an object like we did so many times then on that object 
use the dot notation to call that function on that specific object on this object and that function uh, takes as uh, arguments as easy, as uh, values to its parameters uh, to integers we pass 5 and 10 and then it returns that value and we retain we we capture that value in the result variable and then we output that value in the console and get 15 but um, if you think about the way we did uh, this thing uh, is uh, that the only way uh, we can call the sum function is by creating an object and then calling the function on that object but uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you have a calculator uh, class to call to create every time through our code every time you need to use the sum function to create an object throughout your code a better way it would be if you could call that sum function somehow without declaring uh, without creating an object and then using the the object to call the function and to you to do that we need to use what is called a companion object and to use a companion object we go inside our class we type companion object so we can press enter to fill in a companion object for us or you can type that then we put curly braces and inside the curly braces we put our code and in this case we're going to put our sum function now you, you're going to see something now we have an error here now this uh, function this sum function doesn't belong to an object to an instance that is created with the class calculator instead it belongs to the class itself and not to the not to any object that we create those uh, the variables and the function that are the functions that are declared inside the companion object are also called class variables or um, class functions because they don't belong to they don't belong to a specific object that you create with that uh, with that class instead they belong to the class itself so you don't need an instance to call that function and uh, that uh, implies that we can't use it uh, with an object because it belongs only to the class and let's see how you can use it uh, using the class without creating an object we just type calculator dot sum and here you pass again 5 and 10 so we just use our name our the name of our class we put dot sum and now we can use the function without uh, then uh, without us needing to create an object and then uh, calling the function on that object so this is uh, very powerful because uh, you will need this in your code sometimes when you don't uh, it, it, it actually not, doesn't make sense to create an object every time you you call let's say a sum function for a calculator now we can uh, also retain that uh, value that is returned in a variable also result put equals now we can print this in the console So we get also 15 but this time we didn't create uh, an object we didn't create a new instance and we call that we call the sum function on that object we just type the calculator class and we call that function on directly on the class All right so this is how you can use the companion uh, object and this is also true for a variable so if you put a variable here let's say uh, max and you put an arbitrary number here let's say 100 we can call this variable also by typing calculator the name of the class that and have our max variable uh, like uh, in contrast with uh, how we did uh, the how we called uh, the properties uh, in the past by creating uh, an object and using that object to call that uh, property on that object in this case we just use the class and we call the, the variable and this also can be can be useful if you have some uh, constants to which you want to use in our uh, th in, throughout your code so let's delete this so you can use also with variables and if you think about uh, uh, at our uh, one of our first lessons about uh, the data types when you look at the minimum and maximum value i i type something like this val max and i uh, 
to get the maximum value I type int dot max value and this is using also a companion object because as you can see the integer class because the primitive types are also classes at least on the surface not when they are compiled on the JVM they uh, also use companion objects like we have here to to get uh, to, to get the properties and uh, to get uh, the functions because we don't we didn't, we didn't create an instance of our integer uh, of uh, with our integer uh, class and then call that uh, max value on the object in fact if you hold control on this integer uh, class and if you actually hover over it and after you hold control it says public companion object of int so if you hold control and if you press and if you press click now it will open this primitives.kt file and inside primitives.kt file we have uh, our uh, int class and we have a companion object and inside the companion object we have this uh, public constant value we're gonna look at the constants in the next but the point here is that uh, it's using the companion object to to declare is declaring the, the this minimum value the maximum value inside the companion object so that you don't need to create an instance an object every time you need to use them so this is our discussion about companion object and uh, see you in the next video i'm going to close this file now and if you, look, you want you can look you can look in that primitives file if you want just take a look uh, look what is there so see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about singleton but first I'm gonna copy this code I'm gonna copy this class with the companion object and I'm gonna paste it inside the classes file and um, if you don't have this code this code because you create a new project just type the code that I'm gonna type in a second so let's delete the code inside the main function now what is a singleton a singleton is a design pattern in Kotlin with which you want to have only one instance of a particular ob object so you want to have only one instance of a particular object and you want to have that instance available globally throughout your program so you don't need to create uh, an instance uh, every time you need to use uh, that uh, that object uh, in a different part of your code and there are uh, practic practical reason for having only one instance of a class let's say that you have a database you want to you want to have only one instance of that database which creates uh, the database which gets the data and so on because if you have uh, multiple uh, instances if you able you are able to create multiple uh, objects with that class then you will have multiple databases in your uh, phone or in on your pc and that is not uh, good because uh, you are uh, uh, using um, more memory than uh, you should and uh, you have uh, duplicate du duplicated uh, duplicated and unnecessary co code so to solve that what you need to do is to create only one instance of a particular class and uh, having this uh, example in mind uh, this is what you're gonna do uh, next and first I'm gonna show you how we, uh, we, we did uh, in the past how we created uh, an, uh, a singleton without uh, having the object uh, keyword so you go down here and uh, first we're gonna create a singleton in the world way so we type here class we're gonna use our example database not gonna create a real database we're gonna just use this, this as an example and to make to restrict the creation of instances with this database class we need to make the constructor private so we type private and uh, when uh, you use an access modifier with a primary constructor you need to use the constructor keyword Other, otherwise we'll have an error so if I delete the constructor keyword here I have an error which says use constructor keyword after uh, modifiers of, or of, pri of primary constructors so you put constructor and inside the inside the class now because uh, we cannot create instances of this class uh, that means that we cannot uh, access any of uh, the properties or the functions of this class and to, to, to have access to a function which is going to return uh, an instance of this class you need to use uh, a companion object because with companion objects you can uh, have uh, properties and uh, functions being uh, allowed to be, in, to be accessed outside of the class without creating an instance 
and here we type again the private access modifier we call this instance and it's going to be a database a nullable database should be var there instance database and as i said nullable so we can uh, assign null to it then we define a function called get instance and this function is going to return an instance of our instance of our database uh, class only one instance only one single instance not multiple instances and to do that first to check to see if the instance is null so if this is the first time that we want to access uh, this uh, instance then it's going to return true if not it's going to return false so we che check to see if it's equal to null if it's equal to null so our instance hasn't been initialized you know, type instance equals to database All right so if the instance is equal to null that means that the instance has been initialized we initialize the database so we can initialize the class inside the class we cannot initialize it outside else so if uh, this condition fails the the, the code below is going to be read else you're gonna return the instance so if the instance is not null and this uh, this code uh, is not gonna be uh, uh, this condition is gonna be false and the code will not be executed inside the if is gonna re we're gonna return the instance but here you should uh, return the database and it should be a nullable database all right so our error disappeared let's delete this let's press Control alt l all right now how we're we gonna use this first we type here val instance and we put equals and we type database dot and now we're gonna use our function get instance and uh, if we we print this uh, instance in the console so we type here instance if you run this code so now we're uh, calling the fun gets instance inside the component object. We get this uh, code. This, this code represents um, the location memory of uh, the instance. So we have this code here. And uh, if we try to instantiate this uh, class, so we put here the constructor. If we do that, then we get an error because the constructor is private, so we cannot create an instance. And uh, when we call the get instance uh, function, so when we did this, it first checks to see if the instance was uh, equal to null, and it was equal to null, then it created the instance, and then it returned the instance. But if you call this uh, function again, so let's call it instance2, equals database dot get instance. Now this will evaluate to false because uh, the instance uh, is not equal to null. We have uh, an instance and it's going to come down here and it's going to return the instance, the already created instance. So if I put a println here and I'm going to output the instance too, you're going to see that there is no instance too. You have the same instance because it's you it's returning the already creating uh, created the instance so we have the same co code here meaning this translates to that uh, you have the same instance so no matter how many times you use database like it instance if it's the first time then it's going to create the instance and it's going to return the instance if you call that uh, again like we do for instance two then it's going to return the already created instance so in this way you have the same instance no matter how many times you you call the get instance function because it will uh, always return the same instance because we um, because of our logic that we cr created here but there is a shorter way to achieve the same thing by using the object uh, keyword and uh, this is what we're going to do next so let's close this now let's see how we can create uh, a singleton and which is going to have the same uh, behavior that we created here so it's going to be only one instance using the object keyword so i'm going to type down here object i'm going to call it database 
now let's delete this code because you cannot have uh, two objects which have the same name and uh, we cannot have a constructor here because uh, it's a singleton so you put only curly braces you can have properties and functions inside the singleton created with, you, with the object key so let's delete that code inside the function, French function too so uh, now by just typing object database now we have the same thing that we had previously just by typing object and database so this will, will always return the same instance and we have only this code object and the name of uh, the object so the, the, uh, and the instance of um, the object is going to be created the first time you call it and we can put an initializer block to have some code to be executed here so let's put a println let's say uh, Let's say database created, and to you to use this, just type. Let's put a println, and type database. And now, if you run this, and the first time you call the singleton, the, that time the singleton is gonna be is gonna be uh, created. So we have database created, and then we have this code which represents the uh, string uh, is the string representation of the object and if you press control D here look what happens we have database created so because this is only one instance this object is a single turn it calls the initializer block only once when it initializes itself so when we call the database for the first time it, it's initialized and it calls the code inside the init block and after that it only it uh, outputs this thing representation the second time we call the database we don't have database created because uh, the instance was already created and the initializer block is not uh, called again because we have the same instance so if you can press control here multiple times and you're gonna see that we have the database created only one only one uh, once because uh, that is called only when the only when the object is created for the first time so on this line in the next line we have the same uh, the same object so we have here this this way we have the same code because it's basically the same instance so as you can see this is a lot simpler and m more concise than the code that we had previously so this is how you can create a singleton in um, Kotlin this is how this is how we should do it so see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about lazy initialization. But first I'm gonna copy this singleton inside our classes file. And if you don't have this file because uh, you created a, a new project again, just type the code that I'm gonna type in a second. So I'm gonna delete this. Now, what is lazy initialization? Lazy initialization is used when creating an instance, when creating an object uh, is expensive and expensive in the programming context means that it will take some time it will use some memory and in that case it's uh, recommended to use lazy initialization and um, to illustrate the lazy initialization I'm gonna use our user class so I'm gonna copy our user class inside our uh, main file not because I can't create here an object uh, by ha having the file he here but because uh, uh, I, uh, I want to put the code here to make uh, clear what I'm doing so I'm gonna delete the code from here and if you don't have the file just create a new class called user define the properties first name last name and age I'm gonna delete this because you don't need this and inside our user uh, class I'm gonna put an initializer block which is gonna be called every time you create a new object and here we're gonna put a print a print, a print line statement which is gonna say user we're gonna call the first name property so the val value that is passed to first name property was created so let's create a new object here let's call it user1 equals user now let's pass some values to the properties of the constructor let's say Alex and 
Now if you run this code, we get in the output user and the value for the, or the first name property, Alex was created. If I press Ctrl D, and I change this to user2, and let's change this to a generic name, user, and for the last name, let's pass just the last name text, and let's keep that age. So if I run this code now, because now on the line 3 you create a new object, the initializer bracket is going to be called again because we create a new object, it says user user was created. Now to initialize our user2 with the lazy initializer, we just delete this and to, to illustrate how the initializer block works, we delete this and we put after user2 by, so we put the keyword by and we type lazy and as I'm typing you see that I have that block lazy, press enter and uh, put the curly braces and inside the curly braces we create our object. So user and here we pass the values to the properties. So let's put uh, user1 let's pass last name and for the age let's put uh, 0. Now previously when the user was initialized uh, in the old way we saw in the output user user was created so the initializer block was called when he created the second object but now if I run this code look what happens we get only our first object we get the initializer block only called for our first object and for our second object initialize using the lazy initialization we don't have uh, the initializer block because the object is not initialized. Is the object is only going to be initialized when you use that uh, object in your code. So if you use that object uh, somewhere in your code, the object de then is going to be initialized and it's going to be used. So if I type here a println which says uh, user that first name user two. Now if I run this, now because I, knew I'm, I am using the user2 object, now the user2 object instance is going to be created and then I'm going to see user2 that first name. So now we see user, we see user1 was created, so the initializer block was called because when we called the, the println user2 that first name, th then in that, uh, at that moment it created the instance and then it outputted the uh, user1. So this is why now we see here user1 one, one was created and previously we didn't because now we're using the user2 object in our code. So unless uh, you are not using the the instance, the object that we have created using the lazy initializer, it is not going to be initialized. So uh, this is initializer, uh, this is initialization by lazy. So see you in the next video. So now it's time to start a discussion about enum classes. But first I'm gonna copy our user class inside our classes file. Now I'm gonna delete this class and also I'm gonna delete the, co the code inside the main function. Now, what are enum classes? Enum classes are uh, used when you want to represent a fixed set of values. So when you want to represent, when you want to create some constants, you should do use enums because Enums are like constants, but they are more powerful because you can they can have properties and uh, they can also have uh, functions. And enums are usually used in um, if conditionals or uh, in if statements or in uh, in the when statement, or uh, if you want to call it the if statement expression or when statement expression. Now let's see how you can create an enum class. And to create an enum class, you just type here enum, the keyword enum, and as I'm typing, I have some suggestions. Then we put class, and let's call this uh, enum class directions. 
direction actually. Then we put curly braces and inside the enum class direction we define our enum values. So here we define north, we put comma, enter, south, you can put them in one line just to have comma between them, east and west. Right? So we have our enums values defined inside our direction um, enum class and those enums values that we have here, here they are instances of our enum class direction so they are an instance they are an object created inside the enum class direction just that they have uh, this uh, different name and as you can see the name of the enum values should be all the names sh should be in uppercase letters now let's see how we can access those uh, enum values to access the enum uh, values we can let's put the printer line here we type direction then we press that and we have some not, some uh, suggestions here we have west east north and south so we have our uh, enum values suggested so let's uh, choose west and let's output this in the console so we get west so this is the enum value west and uh, let's press ctrl d let's change this to east so let's change uh, this to east let's change this to north and south now if you run this code we get our enum values, west, east, north, and south. So this is how you can get the enum, uh, the, how you can get the enum uh, values that you define inside your enum class. Now we can also, you can also pass, uh, you can define a constructor here for our uh, enum class and define some properties like var, let's call it uh, direction of type string. And var distance, and this is going to be an integer. Now, if you hover over here, you have some underlines, and the underlines, if you hover over, it says that enum has not default constructor. So now, because as I said, those enum values are instances; they are objects created inside our enum class. Now we need to pass some values to the properties that we define here so let's pass some values here so let's press let's type here uh, first north and i'm going to speed up this now a little bit all right so now what we did here we pass some values to the enum values constructors because in in uh, up here uh, in our enum class direction we define some properties and those properties because the enum values are uh, objects, they are instances for enum uh, directions, even though they have uh, those different names. We need to pass to the constructors then uh, some values. So we pass here north, south, east, west, and we pass for the, for, for the distance, distance 10, 20, 50, and 40. Now, let's see how we can loop through our uh, enums uh, values. And to do that, we just uh, delete this code. And, what and uh, here we add the for loop. So we, we type for. Let's call it the direction in. And here we type direction, our enum class, dot values. And this is going to return an array with all the enum values that we define in our class. Now let's put curly braces. And let's add a println. And let's print that direction. So now if you run this, you'll see the same output. But in the, the order that they are defined uh, inside the class. So we see the same, uh, not uh, the same output, because uh, they are outputted in the order in which they are defined in the class. So we have north, south, east, and west. And this is how we can uh, loop through an enum to through the enum uh, values of a enum class. So this is how we do it. So now let's delete this code. 
Now, if you want to access the arguments that are passed to our enum values constructors, we just first put a println to output the values on the console. And we type direction, so our enum class, that. And we choose our enum value, let's choose north. And from here, and uh, here now we type also that. And now we have some suggestions, we have direction, distance. And um, we also have name. A name is a, is a variable which is not defined by us. So we only define those properties, direction and distance. But name is uh, a variable which is built in in the enum, enum class, similar to the the uh, the direction that values which return the array is uh, the the direction that values values was also a property with, with actually it was uh, an array property which was built into the enum class so we didn't create that it's provided by the enum class so this is why we have that name there so let's put direction let's press ctrl d du duplicate this code and let's uh, change this to distance let's press ctrl d again and let's also print that name which is the built-in uh, variable which is the built-in variable uh, provided by the enum class so let's put here name now if we run this code get north so this is the value that we pass here we get 10 and then we get north with capital letters so so we get the values that we passed here for direction and distance, which are defined in direction class. So we get the values passed for this specific uh, enum uh, value. And then we get uh, north. And this is the built-in uh, variable, which is uh, provided by you by the enum class. But as I said, you can also have functions. So let's have a function which returns the direction and distance. So let's type here fun. We call it print data because it's gonna print the data of a specific enum uh, value. It's not gonna take any input. Put curly braces. But now we have an error here. And that is because uh, when you declare a function inside the enum class, you need to provide a semicolon for the last enum defined in your class. So you need to put here a semicolon, and the error disappeared. And let's print the data here. Let's add the println. Let's put quotation marks. Let's put direction equals dollar sign direction and distance equals dollar sign distance. Now, if you call this on uh, our uh, on a uh, enum value, let's type direction dot let's say west dot, and now we have our function print data. So this print data function is gonna print the data of the west enum that is defined here. So it's gonna output west and 40 in the console. So you now, if you run this code. We get direction west and distance 40. So this is how you can use functions inside the enum classes. Next, let's see how we can use our uh, enum direction and generally how we can use enums with uh, the when statement expression. So I'm going to close the console. I'm going to delete this code and uh, the print data function works for uh, all, uh, all of our enum values. So let's delete this. And here. Uh, I'm going to define a variable, it's going to be a val, it's going to be called direction. I'm going to put equals, and here we type direction, our enum class. Let's choose east. So now the enum, uh, actually east, no west, east. So now our uh, direction enum east is going to be stored in our direction variable. Let's use the when statement expression. And we type here when direction then you put curly braces and here we type uh, uh, direction dot 
east we're gonna put auto execute this code so print ln the direction is east and we'll do the same thing for the next one so let's press ctrl d let's change this to west north and south so this is how you can use uh, the enums with uh, the when statement now if I run this actually I should uh, change uh, the text there but I'm gonna change it so let's ch close this to change the text here now if you run this you're gonna see the dire direction is his because this condition is true our uh, direction argument here is gonna match with this branch so it's gonna evaluate true and then it's gonna execute this code you can put curly braces if you want but as I said in our discussion about the when statement expression you should do curly braces if you have multiple lines of code in our case we have one single line of code but you can put curly braces if you want and of course that this branch will always evaluate to true because here we type direction that is uh, into our uh, direction variable literally directly and this value doesn't change but in a real app this value could come from a database or from the user input and in that case you need to use a function which is uh, also built into the enum uh, class mm -hmm. and that function is called value of so we type direction that value of and this value of function check it checks to see if our uh, value that we pass here exists inside our uh, enum class so it checks to see if uh, is defined here and it, all, it also returns that value so if I type here east now if I run this code we get an error which is no enum constant direction that is because all of our enum values have uh, they are uh, defined in uppercase letters but if I put here that uppercase and if I run this code Now we get the direction is east, and uh, this value that we have here is this value, uh, as I said, could come from a database or from the user input. And dire direction that value of is going to check to see if uh, this uh, enum value exists in our enum class, and it's going to return that value in our uh, variable. So it's going to assign that value to our variable. So see you in the next video. So now it's time to start a discussion about inner classes. So what are inner classes? Inner classes are classes which are declared inside another class and they are generally used when you know that there is a very close relationship between two classes. So when it doesn't make sense to put two classes separated, then you should use uh, inner classes. And let's look at an example. And we're gonna imagine here that we have a list view and uh, this list view, list view is gonna uh, display some uh, uh, items in a list in on the screen and uh, here we're going to use uh, inner classes because for uh, displaying the each individual uh, item we're going to create a list view item so first you create a class called list view We create the primary constructor, we define a property called uh, items and it's going to be an array of strings. Now we put curly braces and inside the class we type the keyword inner then class and now we create a class which is going to represent the individual items in the list view so we type here list view item put uh, the primary constructor but we put uh, we, not, we don't define any properties and then we put curly braces and this uh, inner class list view is going to have a function called display 
item and it's going to display the value the values of an item of uh, at, a, at a specific position so we put here position let's say we define a parameter to our function it's going to be an int and uh, we're just going to type here print line and the inner classes are uh, have access to the properties of the outer class so inside our inner class that we, that we have here we can have, we can access the properties that are defined inside the outer class list view in this case we have a single property called items and here we can type items and notice that i can use the items property which is defined in our outer class list view we type position and this is going to return an item at this position which is passed as an argument here to to, to our parameter position and uh, we go up here and we type val list view because we're going to create an instance for list view type list view now we need to pass an array to our uh, primary constructor to the property item so we type here array of and we define some generic names here let's say uh, name uh, one and name for now how can uh, we access the display uh, item function which is inside our inner uh, class uh, uh, list uh, item list view items this sh this should be list view item not items so let's change this go right click on it and go to, to refactor and rename let's call it the uh, items press enter now to access the display item function which is inside our inner class list view item we type list view so our instance our object uh, list view dot list view item and then again dot and now we have our function display item and uh, we can uh, pass here let's say uh, let's say uh, two now if you run this code So we get an output name three, and this is correct because name three is the at the index two. And uh, this is how you can access the, the display. How this is how you can access generally a function inside an uh, in, inside the, an inner class. You just create the, an instance of the outer class. Then you call uh, you call the name of the class of the name of the inner class, and then you call the function. Or uh, so. See you in the next video. So now it's time to do a challenge using the knowledge that we have about object-oriented programming. And the challenge is to create a class which is going to represent a bank account of a person. And uh, this uh, class is going to have uh, three properties. The first one is going to be called the account name. The second one is going to be called the balance. And uh, the third one is going to be called transactions. And uh, it should be a mutable list. Also, you should uh, create uh, functions for deposit and uh, withdraw and also a function for calculating the balance and uh, you you also should add the, the checks for checking to see if the amount uh, is uh, when you deposit the amount is greater than zero and all of that stuff so do this challenge and then uh, watch my solution so my solution is this i'm going to create a class and uh, for this uh, challenge, you should also have in mind uh, the discussion that we had about uh, access modifiers. So I'm going to call it account. And I'm going to define here a property called, uh, it's going to be called val, it's going to be called account uh, name. And it's going to be of type string. of type string and we put curly braces and inside the class I'm going to declare the next uh, two properties and uh, those one uh, first I'm going to declare it without the access modifiers because IntelliJ probably is going to figure out that uh, we need to put access modifiers on them so I'm going to type var balance and uh, I'm going to assign zero so this is the default value and uh, 
vară, transactions, and this is gonna be equals to a mutable, a mutable list of int because this this is gonna store the transactions. So these are the three properties of our class. Now I'm going to create the first function which is going to be called deposit and this function is going to be used to deposit uh, money inside our uh, bank account and it's going to have a parameter called amount, it's going to be of type uh, int and first we need to check if this amount is greater than zero because we don't want to deposit uh, a negative value so if amount is greater than zero and we choose greater than zero because we also don't want to deposit zero so this is why I put greater than zero then if it is greater than zero then we're gonna add that to our transaction uh, list that add amount and uh, then I'm gonna say balance we're gonna update our balance I'm gonna put plus equals amount then I'm gonna add the print line, which is gonna say, I'm gonna put uh, quotation marks, dollar sign, I'm gonna type amount, and I'm gonna put dollar sign, this, that, balance. So I'm gonna output in the console what is the balance. But if the amount that is passed to this uh, function is a negative sum, I'm gonna go in the else part, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna add the print line here, which is gonna say cannot deposit uh, negative sums. So I'm gonna put here ca cannot deposit negative sums. So this is our uh, deposit function. Next I'm gonna create another function and this is gonna be called withdraw and this is gonna be used for withdraw withdrawing mine. So we type fun withdraw and uh, we put parentheses and this is gonna take a parameter called withdrawal so uh, it should be like this and it's gonna be an integer we put curly braces now it should be with with here with with withdraw now we need to convert this into a negative sum because now we are uh, withdrawing money from our account. So first we need to check if and I'm going to put minus because I'm going to convert this into a negative sum. Withdrawal is less than zero. So if this is a negative uh, sum which is going to be withdraw, I'm going gonna, to gonna add to our transactions this transactions that add and you also put the minus and so you put minus with draw because now we're adding now we're uh, we are uh, taking money off the, of our account then we're gonna put this that balance my uh, uh, plus equals minus withdrawal because now we're taking money and then we're gonna add uh, again a print line it's gonna be this one, so I'm gonna copy this. But the, now this is gonna be the withdraw. Else, if uh, this is not uh, a negative sum, so I'm gonna put else. I'm gonna type print line cannot with draw negative sum so if he tries to withdraw a negative sum then I'm gonna say cannot withdraw a negative sum here we put the minus because we're taking money out of uh, our uh, account so we need to check for uh, this why you're checking here if it's less than zero it should be negative here 
and we're gonna create another function and this is gonna be called calculate balance so we type here fun let's uh, bring this fun calculate calculate balance this is not gonna take any parameters and it's gonna return an int we put curly braces and we're gonna put this that uh, balance to zero because I want to calculate the balance so I'm gonna add the, the transactions to this uh, property balance so here we're gonna say and here we're gonna loop we're gonna type for transaction in our list of transactions so for transaction in our list of transaction we're gonna type this dot balance plus and equals transaction so our transaction and then we're gonna return uh, the balance at the end of uh, our loop when we end we ended uh, looping so return this dot balance so this is our solution to the challenge and let's uh, let's create an account and let's pass some values here so I'm gonna type here val Alex account I'm gonna put equals account I'm gonna put now I'm gonna call the primary constructor so I'm gonna type here Alex I'm still use I'm still using my name here but so I'm gonna type here Alex account that deposit so I'm gonna deposit let's say 1000 and uh, I'm gonna type Alex account that withdraw I'm gonna withdraw 500 then I'm gonna put Alex account and I'm gonna put uh, deposit uh, negative sum let's say minus 20 and Alex account that uh, that we draw also a negative sum let's say minus uh, 100 now if you run this code we get 1000 deposit balance is now 1000 so we have our call called, uh, called from our uh, deposit function then we have uh, So I should I didn't change the text here. So this why is saying uh, this should, should say with uh, with drawn. So uh, sorry, let's change this to with drawn. So let's run our code again. So we get 1000 deposit, balance is now 1000, now we get our uh, correct output, we get uh, then 500 withdrawn, so we get our call, call from our withdrawn function, withdrawn, balance is now uh, 500, then, uh, then we get cannot deposit negative sums, cannot withdraw negative sums because we passed uh, negative numbers to our deposits and withdraw function, and here we're uh, checking to see if uh, those are uh, negative or uh, positive so this is our uh, solution to our uh, to our challenge and I hope that you enjoy this and uh, that you solve this and uh, this is not uh, again the best solution this is just my solution probably you find uh, you figure out a better solution or com maybe a, concise, a better and uh, more concise solution than this Actually, I forgot before we end our video, let's actually call also our calculate balance uh, function. So I'm gonna type here uh, Alex account dot calculate balance, and this is gonna return an integer. So I'm gonna type here val because that function returns something, so I need to capture that in a variable. So I'm gonna type here val balance equals Alex account. So I'm add the print line here and it's gonna say 
balance is dollar sign balance let's proceed per control alt l to format the code now if we run this code now we get uh, our previous output 1000 deposits balance now 1000 500 withdrawn balance is now fi uh, 500 then cannot deposit negative sums and cannot withdraw negative sums and then get balance is now 500 so our uh, code works uh, well so this is our uh, code one more thing that I forgot is that uh, I said at the beginning of the video that you should uh, have in mind the discussion that we had about access modifiers when doing this challenge and uh, I forgot to to add the access modifiers for balance and transactions because now what can I do for balance I can use our uh, Alex account uh, accounts and I can type here balance and now because that is uh, actually that is not really public because when we talked about uh, getters and, and setters we said that, that uh, when you access a property you always access access that property through getter and setter so we never access directly the getter and uh, the property but uh, still you should uh, not make that uh, that uh, public be because by default if you don't provide an, an access modifier they are uh, they are by default public so if i type here now account balance as you can see i can call that and i can type here 1000 and i can deposit uh, now i can change the balance of uh, the account directly from here and if you hover over here, uh, IntelliJ, uh, figure out that you should make this private. So make this private, the balance, and also the transactions. Because you don't use them uh, inside the primary constructor and they are uh, used only through the, to the, the functions that we define here. The, because of that, you should, uh, you should uh, declare them as private because you use them only through the function that you declared inside the class. So declare them as private and now you, if you hover over here it says you cannot uh, access balance because it's private in account and now we cannot change the balance from outside the class we can only de uh, deposit or withdraw uh, 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 sums of uh, money from our bank account by interacting only with the functions and not by calling the property directly and uh, assigning uh, a new balance to, to the property so make them private and this way you cannot uh, uh, you, you don't uh, you don't uh, access uh, the property outside of the class and you change there directly the the value of the property again it's not really directly because the code uh, that we had previously so this code actually is calling the setter here but still you can change uh, the value of uh, the balance but now because we made that private and uh, the compiler is smart enough to figure out that because they are uh, not declared inside the primary constructor and they are only used you only interact with them with uh, the deposit and withdraw uh, and uh, calculate balance function so we don't use them outside you don't have them also declared in the primary constructor it knows that you should make them private because you interact them only with the functions and now we have this underline because it's private so we cannot change this balance now from outside the class we can only interact them again using the functions. So I'm going to delete this and uh, now see you in the next video. So let's delete this. So actually I'm going to let it there because uh, it's uh, good to see. So now it's time to start a discussion about inheritance. So what is inheritance? Inheritance is the concept in the Kotlin programming uh, context with which you can create a class using another class. So in other words, you can get all the functions and properties that a, f that a class already has in your new class. And in addition to do getting all the functions and properties in, uh, in your new class, you can add some new functions, some new properties which are specific to this new class, but they aren't for the... Also, this, the class from which you are inheriting is called the base class, the parent class, or the super class. And you might be wondering, why is this uh, useful? Why you, you'll want to do this? Let's say that you have uh, a very big class which performs a very hard uh, task and has a lot of functions and code, and, but you want to create a new class which is slightly different from this class. 
what you can do is you can get all that code copied in the new class and then you can add your uh, new functions or new your new behavior to this class but that is not uh, uh, recommended because you have duplicated code what you can do instead is you can inherit all the functions and properties which this big class already has and in your new class you can add the new functionality the new behavior which is specific to this new class but it's not for the base class so in this way you, you can uh, you, you, you avoid the duplicated code and you increase the code reusability and uh, for that I'm going to show you an, an example and I'm going to create two classes one is going to be called car and uh, one is going to be plane so we create here a class we go down here we type class I'm going to call it car it's going to have uh, some properties the first one is going to be called name this is going to be the brand name of the car the second one is going to be color also a string engines the number of engines that this car has it's going to be an integer and val uh, this is going to be doors so it's gonna store the number of doors all right we put curly braces because I'm gonna add some uh, functions to this class two function actually fun move and uh, fun stop and here we're gonna say print line quotation marks dollar sign the name of the car is moving similarly down here in the stop we're gonna say the car has stopped car has has and we're gonna create a, another class called plane, which is gonna have also val name. It's gonna be a string, a val color, also a string, val engines, an integer, and the val doors, an int. Put curly braces and we define those two functions. I'm going to copy those and I'm going to paste it here. So now, what we did here is that we created two classes. They both, both have uh, uh, properties for the primary constructors and uh, but as you probably already noticed, we have the same uh, properties. We have the name here, we have the name there, we have the color there, we have the color here, the color there, the engines also we have here and there. And we also have those functions which are almost uh, actually are the same so we have what I said uh, at the beginning duplicated code so it doesn't make sense to put this code here another another way to do this is to create a base class a generic class called vehicle which is uh, and usually you create the generic class when you know that uh, several classes are gonna share uh, those uh, properties and those behaviors so a car and a plane both are vehicles so we can put here instead of declaring the the name and the color inside the uh, our uh, inside our classes car and plane you can put this in a, in a vehicle, vehicle uh, class in a base class and we can inherit those properties in our classes instead of declaring them uh, inside our uh, car and uh, plane class so we can put here val name it's gonna be a string and uh, val color also a string now I can copy those two let's put curly braces here and I can paste it paste it here so now I can delete those uh, those uh, two functions from uh, our classes and what we can do now is we can inherit those properties so we can delete those uh, properties that we have here we can uh, we will, as you'll see you'll need to declare them as parameters but uh, they are not uh, they're not going to be as properties any 
they're not going to be as properties here now what we can do is that we can inherit this shared uh, those shared uh, functions and those shared properties because both the car and the plane have a, a function to move have a function to stop the baby they both share uh, a name they, they both share a color so they both share those properties and uh, functions but uh, as we did it previously is to put them inside the the, the, the classes would so not it's not good because we have a duplicated code and in this way we put this code here and now we can inherit this code so we can have this code directly you can uh, you can have this code uh, being uh, uh, being accessed inside the car and plane without declaring them in our classes so to inherit from a class first you need to mark the class from which you want to inherit as open because by default they are they you cannot inherit from a class so if i and to inherit from a class we go at the enclosing parentheses of our primary constructor we put colon and we type the name of the class from which we want to inherit and in this case is going to be vehicle now if you hover over here it says that this type has a constructor and thus must be initialized here and, and next it says this type is final so it cannot be inherited from and that means that we cannot inherit from this class unless we mark this class with the open keyword in front of uh, it so we need to put here open and now if we hover over here now we don't have uh, that error we only have this error which says this type has a constructor and thus must be initialized here and that basically mean means that it says hey i'm trying to use this vehicle uh, class i'm trying to but in order to use it i need, i need to initialize this vehicle uh, class so we need to pass some values to the constructor the primary constructor that is defined here you need to pass some values to the name and to color and to do that we define here name we type name actually that let's press ctrl z let's put a space and we type name we put uh, comma then we type uh, color and notice that we don't have the var or the val keyword in front of them that is because they those uh, those parameters that we have here because they are parameters because they don't have the var or the var keyword they they uh, they 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 have to be declared only as parameters because the properties are uh, going to be declared and they are declared by the primary constructor of the base class from which we are inheriting from <laughs> and because of that we don't uh, we, we don't we don't need to declare the property again here as you can see if i put the var keyword we have an error says name has a, anyway what well, that means that we cannot have the property declared here because the property is uh, already declared inside the base class inside the vehicle class from which we are inheriting from what we can do here is define the parameters and uh, the value that is passed to those parameters to the primary constructor of the class cars are going to be passed to the to the vehicle uh, primary constructor so here we put the primary constructor so we put two parentheses and we type name and this name is this one from here so we type name then we put comma because we need to pass a value for the second one for the color and we type color and this color is this color here so we type color now if uh, you go up here let's say for let's look first as the actually let's also inherit uh, from uh, inherit inherit uh, also one in on the plane uh, class so we put colon also here we type vehicle and now uh, we need to also to define here the parameters the name and the color so we type name and uh, as I'm timing, you can see that IntelliJ is giving us some hints. So if I type here color, it says that color string. So it's very helpful. Put colon. We pass those values to the primary constructor of the base class. So we type name, color, and now if I go up here and I create some instances of our uh, car and plane class. So we type here val car. Let's put equals. 
this type car let's choose for the name uh, BMV and uh, for the color let's say red for the engines one for the doors four now I'm gonna create also an object with our plane so let's press ctrl alt l to format the code val plane equals plane so our class we type here uh, for the name uh, Boeing for the color let's say oh, white and blue and um, for the engines 4 and for the doors let's say also 4 now if I go down here and I type here car dot if you look here you see, that you see that we have the function stop and the function move but we didn't declare them here we deleted them uh, previously but because we are inheriting from the vehicle class because when you are inheriting the properties and the functions from the class from which you are inheriting from are part of the new class so they the the move function and the stop function they are now part of our car class similar the same in the same uh, is, uh, the same here the, the 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 move and stop are uh, are part of the class plane so if i type here car dot move and car dot stop and then plane dot move and plane so look i then now i can call them like they are uh, declared inside the our uh, car and plane but they are not there but they, because we are inheriting they are part of uh, the class so you can think of uh, you can think of this thing that we have here as a single entity so it acts like a single entity so now if you run this code we get in the output BMW is moving BMW has stopped Boeing is moving Boeing has stopped and uh, this uh, we get this auto because as I said those functions are part of our classes and uh, they are using the name so in this case the name that is passed to the car this name that we have here BMW is passed to the to the primary constructor of the base class and then it's used here so it's calling the move and say BMW is moving so in the same way for the for the plane we get the same output it gets the value that is passed here Boeing and then it outputs Boeing is moving and Boeing has stopped but we can do even more we can override those functions inside our class so we can create a version which is inside the base class from which you are inheriting we can create a version of this function which is specific to the car or which is specific to the plane and I'm gonna look at that uh, so now I'm going to override the move function from our base class vehicle inside our plane class because I want to make the move function specific to the plane class. So I want to provide I want to provide an, an implementation of the move class which is specific to a plane. So how a sp how a plane is moving? A plane is moving by flying. So I'm not satisfied with only this generic function which says the name of the vehicle is moving. And to override the function, you first need to mark mark the function similar to to the class we need to mark it with the open keyword so we type open because Kotlin wants to make things explicit so we put open and now we can uh, we can uh, we can override that function inside our plane class so we go to, to, to override the function we go to code generate and here we have vehicles and hash code to string and we go to override methods and you, we, you have those equals hash code and to string and those are here because every class that you create in Kotlin is implicitly inheriting from the any class but we're gonna look at uh, that on more, more on that uh, later because we're gonna look at that in a different video and we have our function move and stop so the 
the, the IDE is telling us that the, those are the functions which can be overridden inside our plane class from our uh, vehicle base class. So we choose move, we press OK, and uh, you have this uh, super that move. We're gonna see immediately what is this, and you can also override it by just uh, typing the keyword override and you can override the function. So you can type here override. And while uh, I typing, you see that we have this override fun, move, stop, or and have also those. So we choose move, and now we have the same thing. Now, super that move means that call the function. So super means call something from our base class. In this case, call the move function from our base class. So we're gonna let that here, but in addition to that, we're gonna add a new function. So we're gonna type here fun flying because the plane is flying and uh, we're just gonna have a simple print line which is gonna say put quotation marks let's bring this down a little bit the plane is flying so now I'm gonna call this function flying inside our uh, move function, which was overridden. So we type flying, flying. Now, if we run this code, look what happens. If you look in the output, you get BMW is moving, BMW has stopped, and then you get the, the plane is flying, and then you get Boeing is moving and Boeing has stopped. So what what has happened here now? Because we were when this function move is called here on uh, our object plane created. Now it's using our own implementation of the move uh, function. And uh, after that, so it's using our own implementation, it's calling the flying function that we created here because a plane uh, is moving in a specific way, it's flying. And then it's calling super.move. And super.move is uh, calling the function from the base class. So it's calling the function from here. So by doing this, we made our function specific. We make, uh, we make the f we made the function move specific. We make the function move unique to the plane uh, class because the plane is moving in a specific way and you can do the same thing uh, for the, the car class so uh, now you may be wondering why uh, why I didn't declare the inside our uh, base class the engines because they are also present in, the, in both uh, classes because when you create a generic class you should uh, only include the commonly used functions commonly used and shared functions and the properties. So uh, all, uh, all vehicles have a name and a color, but not, not all vehicles have engines. So this is why I put the engines here. So in addition to the name and the color, which all vehicles have, we added some new f properties which are specific to a car. Similar here. In uh, addition to the name and the color, which all vehicles have, and we inherited that from our class, we added also engines and doors, which uh, those things are, in addition, they are specific to a plane. And uh, more, we also override the move function because we're not satisfied with the with a simple move function from our uh, base class to include, the, to provide our own implementation of how a plane is moving. So. You can see that by using an uh, inheritance and adding new properties, adding new function, you can uh, create more uh, specific classes. You can uh, inherit. Uh, you can also inherit from the car class to create a more specific class. You can create a Tesla uh, uh, class and so on. So this is what inheritance is, and uh, see you in the next video. So I thought that's a good idea to show you another example with inheritance, and I'm gonna go down here. And I'm going to define a class, I'm going to type the keyword class, and I'm going to call it view. And this view is going to represent a view in uh, which is used in Android. And uh, a view in Android is just a rectangular area on the screen, and it's responsible for drawing and event handling. But you're going to 
mimic as i said uh, what a view is in a, in a android i'm not going to create a, a view like the one that is in use uh, like the one that's used in android and we define the primary constructor but we're going to not uh, define we're not going to define any properties to the primary constructor and this view is going to have a simple uh, function called draw and it's going to be responsible for drawing this view on the screen so we type draw and uh, we create a function and we're going to add a simple, a simple print line here which is going to say drawing the view so we put here quotation marks drawing the view and uh, we're going to mark this uh, class as open because I want to inherit from it and we're also going to mark the function open because I'm going to override that function in the in the next class and uh, because this is a, a generic view and is going to have this draw function only this function what you can do let's say that I want to I don't want to create a simple uh, a simple view which is just a rectangular area on the screen but I want to create something more specific let's say that I want to create a button in that case instead uh, of uh, creating the button the button uh, from zero because this view in android has a lot of functions and uh, properties which are responsible for creating the view for uh, uh, handling the events and so on so uh, because here you have only a simple function but uh, the real view has hundreds of functions and instead of creating uh, our button from zero we can just inherit from the view and we can inherit all the functionality that the view already provides to create a generic view and we can add some unique characteristics characteristics which are specific to a button and in th in this in this uh, way we increase the code reusability and it's more easy for us to to create the button than rather than creating the button from zero because the view already provides all the tools that you need to create the generic view only we are going to inherit all that uh, behavior all that properties but I'm gonna but we're gonna change it a little bit so this is what we're gonna do with uh, inheritance so we create a new class called button so we define the primary constructor and here you can define now some properties which are specific to a button not not just to a generic view which is a rectangular area on the screen so we put val text and this is gonna be a string so our, bu our button will have a, a text which can be login or sign up and uh, also it's going to have uh, orientation because it's going to be uh, on, on a place on the screen on a specific place on the screen and uh, this is going to be a string of course you just only mimic, only mimic the uh, view and button which are, uh, are uh, used in android this is why we have so many uh, we have so little properties and only a, a simple function function in our view draw and we put uh, here colon to inherit from our view because I want to inherit all that functionality, all that uh, 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 properties that a view provides. But I want to just to change it a little bit to make it more specific. I want to make a button. And uh, of course, as I said, this is just uh, uh, an example we don't have. But in a real uh, in a real app, this will have uh, hundreds or thousands of lines of code. And we can inherit all of that behavior or that functionality in our uh, new new view which is a button but we can override some functions and you can provide some uh, you can create a more specific view than a generic view so here we need to define the primary constructor and put uh, curly braces now i want to override the draw functions so that when the draw when the draw function is called i want to not drawing just a generic view but to draw um, a button of course as i said this is just an imaginary example so we type override fun draw and instead of calling the super uh, function which is inside our uh, our base class view or parent class view we're gonna type here print line and we're gonna put the text drawing the button of course and now what we did here we created a generic view as i said and again this 
can have what, hundreds of maybe thousands of lines of code and functions and different functions, different properties. But we oh, we inherited from the view class and we added some new functionality. So instead of just drawing a generic view, now of course we just add a simple print line here. But here we can have the code which is going to be responsible for drawing a, spe a button. So it's going to be more specific than a simple generic view. So we can put here, uh, here is the code for creating the button. So I'm going to put uh, a comment there. And let's say that um, now I want to create a, run, a round button. So instead of creating again all that functionality which uh, which is present in the view, and then uh, create and then uh, use and then creating all the functionality which is uh, inside the button the button class, we can make this button uh, open, and we can inherit all the functionality that the button provides, and we're gonna add something new, something unique to this class that we're going to create. And this class is going to be a round button. So we type here round button. And uh, here we need to define the text because we're going to inherit from the, for the, from the class button orientation. And notice that I don't use the var or the val keyword here because they, they, they're going to be only parameters because the properties, the actual properties are going to be, are going to be um, ultimately uh, declared in the button class and uh, one thing which is going to be specific to a round button that you're going to create is going to be corners so we type val corners it's going to be an integer because uh, the, co the corners basically here we're going to pass a value which is going to in our major example this is going to re receive a value which can be um, in degrees so how many degrees do you want to how many degrees do you want to make uh, the buttons by how many de degrees you want to make the button round so you can pass here 20 or 30 anyway so we put colon here and we inherit now from our button class right and here we need to pass the text the orientation and uh, that's all and we put curly braces. Now let's override the draw function in our round button because when that function is called, now I want to add some specific code, some new functionality which is specific to a round button. So it's not gonna uh, draw uh, a, just a button, but it's gonna draw a round button. So we, of course, we're just gonna add a simple print line there, but um, in a real app, you can put here the actual code which, which is gonna draw the round button. So we put here print line, and we put drawing the round button. Now let's create some uh, instances. Let's create some objects with those classes, and we type here val view. So we're gonna create our generic view. We define the parameter constructor. We don't have to pass any values there because we didn't define any properties inside our view. Then we create a button. So we put here val button equals button. And here we need to pass some values. So I'm going to pass here the text, let's say login, the orientation, let's say. Uh, it's going to be a text here, so we put here, let's say, center. Next, we create a new a new object, but this is going to be now a round, bo round button. So we put here round button equals round button. And we pass the text here, round button. Actually, let's pass the text uh, sign up. And uh, for the orientation, let's put uh, center also. And oh, you need to pass also value from, for the corners. Let's put, uh, let's say, 30 degrees to be in our uh, imaginary example. Now, let's call the, func the function draw on uh, all of our uh, objects that we create. So we type view dot draw, then we put button dot draw and 
round button dot draw now if you just press control z if you run this code So we get in the output, drawing the view, then we get drawing the button, drawing the view again, drawing the round button. And let's uh, think about why we have this uh, output. So first, we, s we see that we have drawing the view, which is uh, the function inside our view that we created here. So it's from the generic view, so it's drawing the view. Then we have drawing the button. So here, when this line of code is uh, Red it says drawing the button. So we have uh, we have our uh, we have our code which is you know which is it's just a print line. But uh, so is, this is drawing the the button. Then it's calling the super uh, function. So it's calling the function inside the view, which it says drawing the view. Next, when uh, this line of code uh, is red, so round that round button that draw. Now it's calling the draw function which is inside the round button so instead of just now calling the because now we, we are he inheriting from the button class now uh, we override this function here and it's it's uh, using our implementation for creating a round button it's uh, executing this line of code and then it's calling the super implementation which is drawing the button you can actually remove this if you want because you let's say that uh, uh, calling the code inside uh, from the button is not uh, gonna affect our uh, logic so if i delete this now if you run this code now we have uh, drawing the view drawing the button and we have drawing the view drawing the round button so now it's not calling here the super so it's not co it's not calling the code which is inside the first the button because we are inheriting first from the button but, but the button is also inheriting from the view so it's calling first this then it's calling draw which is inside here and we had the drawing the view but now we only have drawing the round button because here now it's using our own implementation of the draw so we have drawing the round button so by this just by by making our uh, view because as i said in the real app this view is can have hundreds of maybe thousands of line of code of different functions and properties so you don't want to create all of that from zero when i want only to let's say i want to create a button i can't inherit i can inherit from the view which already provides all the functions and properties and logic to create a generic view but i can override some function which are responsible let's say for like this draw and uh, i can ex i can uh, define some logic and when uh, all of that functionality is called is gonna not draw only a generic view but it's gonna draw a button so by inheriting from the view we increase uh, we increase code, the code reusability and uh, this is very very powerful because let's say that uh, like in our example you want to you don't you're not satisfied with a simple button which is used in android and you want to create a, a round button so instead of creating all of that logic from zero you can just inherit from a sim uh, simple button you can have override some functions and uh, when uh, when you execute that code now it's going to execute the code with the implementation with the additional implementation uh, the, with the additional code which is which is going to generate a round button and it's just not just a simple button so this is our uh, this is our discussion about uh, inheritance i hope that this clarifies some things and uh, see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about seal classes so often you want to represent only a fixed set of possibilities so a web request can either succeed or it can fail a user can be a standard user or a pro user and in those cases you may be thinking now that we can use enum classes but enum classes have some limitations and let's see why uh, you should use instead seal class so let's type main i'm gonna create an enum class here call it uh, result 
and uh, let's put curly braces let's type here success and uh, error now the problem with this is that we cannot m encode more information here so let's say that I want to 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 define here a non resolvable error and a resolvable error and uh, I cannot do that here so if I type here x dot exception I can do, I cannot do that because uh, uh, the 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 types that we define here cannot have uh, properties so you cannot define uh, this here and for that we need to use seal classes and to use the seal class we just type seal class I'm gonna call it result it's gonna have a parameter called val message it's gonna be of type string and you can define uh, your uh, classes which are gonna inherit from the seal class either outside the seal class so you can type here class let's say success and uh, let's type here uh, me message of type string and we can inherit from the seal class so you can type here result message or you can copy this and you can define it inside the enum class so you can have it as an SC class so I'm gonna type another class here called uh, error I'm going to define the parameter here. Actually, not that, that is the parameter message. And I'm going to define the parameter here. Message. I'm going to inherit from the result. You know, from the results class. I'm going to pass that parameter here to the parent class. Now, I'm going to define a function down here called get data fun, get data, and it's going to have uh, a parameter called uh, result gonna be of type result and here we're gonna define a when statement so we type when and to type result and now is the interesting part now if you hover over this underline over when it says when expression must be exhaustive add necessary is error comma is success branches or else branch instead so in other words, what is saying here by uh, to to have the when uh, statement exhaustive is is what it's saying. In other words, is that it needs to cover all the po possibilities. So both possibilities that we have here, and you can type yourself this, or you can uh, click on here, click on this uh, right bulb, and you can click here add the remaining branches. And as you can see, it's added the remaining branch. So you add is result that error and is result the success and those are exhaustive those are the only two possibilities which are which are possible so here i'm going to type result uh, let's define a function inside the uh, seal class so i'm going to type here fun show uh, message it's going to have a print line which is going to say result dollar sign message so, and now I'm gonna put that show message and also here result dot show message and now this is uh, this is uh, exhausted because now it, we co we covered all the possibilities which which are uh, inside the uh, which are uh, which are, uh, are as a consequence of the fact that we our classes are uh, 
inheriting from the seal class so if I add here a, an uh, else branch so if I put here else as you can, as you, you'll see this is gonna be redundant because we covered all the possibilities and the compilers know this and this can be very useful in some scenarios so if I put curly braces as you can see this is gray out because it's redundant because it knows that we covered all the possibilities and the possibilities are only those two result that error and result that success so if I type here now val success let's type success equals result it should be a two yes there equals uh, result dot success let's type success here let's press ctrl d let's call this uh, error result dot let's change this to error so this is how you create instances of the nested classes let's call this failed now let's type here get data down here get data and let's let's pass success and let's run our code now as you'll see the message result success So we get result success in the output. So if I change now this to error, you'll see that it says result error because it's, it's executing this branch. So if I run this, we get result failed. Now the interesting part here is if I add here another uh, uh, possibility. So if I type here class progress and I type message string inheriting from result let's type let's pass the message parameter to the super class to the parent class now what what we have because our class is a sealed class what we have here is that the when is underlined and it's trying to say something to us it's saying that when expression must be exhaustive as necessary is progress so it knows that there is another possibility for uh, for our re result uh, in which it, we, it can be therefore you need to add that possibility otherwise I'm gonna show you this error and if you try to compile this code I'm gonna throw an error so what what you can do here is can, we can type here is result to make it exhaustive so to cover all the possibility result that progress let's put the arrow result that show message and now if I create here another val let's so call this uh, progress equals to result that progress and let's define for the parameter progress here now if I change this to progress now you'll see the output result progress so we get result progress because now this branch is true but if I let's if I delete all of those look look what happens if I click here where you have those on un, uh, this underline it says add else branch so when expression must be exhausted so it means that it, it needs to cover all the possibility possibilities add necessary is error is progress and is success so if you click here on more actions and if you click here on add remaining branches it it knows that those are all the possibilities on which uh, our result can be and it automatically generated the the check for us and we only just need to type here result that show message and that's all and with enums you, you don't have this uh, auto generated uh, code for you because uh, result that show message let's type here and I'm gonna explain immediately 
So with with uh, an enum, if you add another, uh, so if you have uh, the an enum class, I can delete the code now here because. But I'm gonna keep the code as it is, and because all the subclasses of a seal class are known by the compiler. The compiler can fill all the possible cases automatically for you. So if I declare this uh, error class as a seal class and I declare two classes inside here called, let's say, class resolvable error, so, or recoverable error. And uh, it's going to have a parameter called exception. It's going to be of type exception. This one. And we're going to extend from our error seal class. Not this one. This one. And we're going to pass the message parameter. And I'm going to declare another class. Non-recoverable. And it's going to have an exception. So this is more powerful than uh, Enums because you can uh, have all those properties and you can you can um, have subtypes and and uh, all of this and with enums we cannot do this so let's extend from error let's pass the message and now we need to delete this because we cannot instantiate uh, the sealed uh, class so let's delete this now if I delete this now from here look what happens I have an underline. And it says, add. It says when expression must be exhaustive, so it must cover all possible cases that uh, that exist for this uh, cell class. As necessary, it's not recoverable or it's recoverable branches. So if I click on this and I click on this bulb, and I click here add remaining branches. As you can see, it adds all the possible cases, so all the possible cases that we define inside our seal class for us automatically. And we just type here result dot show message. Again here, result dot show message. And you cannot uh, have this behavior with the non class, so this is why uh, seal classes are more powerful because you can have uh, subclasses, you can have uh, more information on the classes so you can have exceptions passed to them and so on so this is our discussion about seal classes and uh, see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about abstract classes and to show you what abstract classes are i'm going to use the code that we had uh, in our discussion about uh, inheritance but i'm going to change it a little bit so i'm going to delete first this class plane because you don't need this class and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna delete these instances that we have here, and uh, I'm gonna declare this as a var, and this also as a var, so they're gonna be now properties. I'm gonna delete the properties that we have here, and uh, now we have uh, this here, so I'm gonna delete this too. Let's delete this. Let's delete this. Now, what are abstract classes? Um, abstract classes are very similar to interfaces. Uh, the only difference is that in abstract classes you can declare properties which can have uh, a value. And uh, in, uh, in interfaces you can't. Actually you can, but you, you need to provide an, an access modifier. And uh, to declare an abstract class, we go in front of the class that we I want to make it abstract and we type the abstract keyword. Let's put the class keyword. And now our, our class is abstract. And uh, with an abstract class, you cannot create instances. Abstract classes are created only to be inherited from uh, uh, by other classes. And now if I try to create an instance with this abstract class, so like, let's type val vehicle. And uh, we type vehicle here. And you put the parentheses to call the, co the constructor. You have an error here and it says cannot create an instance of an abstract class. So you cannot create an object with an abstract class. An abstract class can only be inherited by another class. And abstract classes usually are used like interfaces when you want to provide 
uh, what you need what needs to be done but you don't provide how it's going to be done so you can you need abstract classes are used when you define uh, f functions without the body and the code the body and the code is uh, it's uh, implemented it's provided by the class by the class which inherits from the abstract class so they are uh, as i said similar very similar to interfaces the only difference is that in abstract classes you can have properties so you can have here a val text and you can assign here some text in uh, in an interface you cannot do this let's type some text so this is the difference and uh, also um, you i should say that uh, you can uh, implement many as many interfaces as you want uh, in a class but you can only inherit from a single class I, this uh, i forgot to say when i talked about uh, interfaces now if i want to make uh, to, if i want to if i to make uh, now our functions abstract we just type the keyword abstract in front of them and now uh, they are abstracts and we do, we're going to do the same for uh, our stop function but now we have this underline because as i said abstract functions like interfaces or uh, the functions which are defined in the interfaces cannot have a body so we need to delete this uh, you need to delete the body, you need to delete the curly braces because the actual body, the actual logic and the code is going to be provided by the class which uh, inherits from the abstract class. Now, to inherit from an abstract class, we go here, we put colon and we type the name of uh, the abstract class from which you want to inherit, vehicle. Now, if you go out here, now we have this red bar which says so we need to call the constructor here all right actually i think i can delete this but you still you still need to call this uh, constructor here even though we don't have any any parameters uh, any even though we, we didn't even define the constructor here now uh, we need because like the interface the abstract class if you inherit from an abstract class and if that abstract abstract class has some abstract abstract functions defined in it you need to implement those uh, functions inside your class and you go here when you have this underline if you, when you click on this uh, red bulb and it says implement members or uh, make car uh, car abstract and we click on implement members we select our two functions we click ok and now we have uh, our functions implemented inside uh, our class. So this is what uh, abstract classes are. And they are, as I said, very similar to interfaces. But the only difference is that you can uh, define properties inside uh, an abstract class. And you can provide a value to that uh, property. And uh, here, because we, we, we have uh, inherited from our abstract class, here you can provide the actual implementation of the functions. So, as you can see, we have this to do, which says not yet implemented. So they are uh, they are very similar to interfaces. So I'm gonna end this video now and see you in the next video. But before uh, I end the video, I thought that it's a good idea to uh, to say to, to you where abstract classes and interfaces are uh, used. Uh, interfaces are used in many many places, but uh, abstract classes are particularly used when uh, and also interfaces are used when you have some APIs and those APIs want to just to define the functions and the API is going to generate the actual code for uh, for those functions. So you can have a, let's say a database and you can provide the, the name of the functions which are responsible for creating the database for uh, getting getting data from the database but you don't provide uh, the actual code which is going to select that data from the database and return the data you just you just declare your functions as as, as uh, abstract and uh, the api is going to generate all that code which is responsible for uh, returning the data and uh, from the, in other words the api is going to do all the hard work you just you you, you just define the the functions if you have uh, if you let's say if you have a property define an abstract class and the abstract functions or uh, interfaces and the api is going to do the hard work of uh, uh, based on what your function is doing by reading the name of the function is going to generate uh, all uh, that code which you you you've ha you've had to generate if you do, if you don't have uh, if you'll not be for the api to generate that for you 
So this is where uh, uh, interfaces uh, and uh, Astra classes are uh, sometimes uh, used. And uh, interfaces also are used in uh, event handling. And that is uh, when, in, when um, uh, the you need to write code to, to respond to respond to respond to graphical using using an interface uh, uh, movement. So I'm gonna end the video now. See you next. So now it's time to start a discussion about data classes. But in order to understand what data classes are, we first need to understand what is the difference between structure equality versus referential equality. And to illustrate the difference, I'm gonna declare two variables. The first one is gonna be a val. It's gonna be called name one. And we're going to assign the value Alex to it. So it's going to be of type string. Now I'm going to press Ctrl D to duplicate that line of code. And to declare the second variable, which is going to be called name2. And it's also going to have uh, the value Alex. Now I'm going to add the, the println here to output something to the console. And here we're going to type name1 equals equals name2. So the equals2 operator is doing what is called is checking for structure e equality because it's checking to see if the content of the variable name one is the same with the content of the variable name two. So in other words, it's checking to see if they have the same value and it's they have because both have Alex assigned to them. So now if I run this code, because this is a Boolean expression, this is going to return true or false and we're going to see in the console true. But uh, if I change this to Alexandro, now the variable name two has a different value, so this is going to return false because they are not structurally equal. Their content is different; they have different values. Now we get false, and this is called the uh, structure equality. The next uh, type of equality is called referential equality, and the referential equality is used when you want to check if two variables or two objects are the same. So what uh, the referential uh, equality operator is doing is checking to see if the uh, two, as I said, variables or uh, objects are the same. So if I type here name uh, one and to use the, the referential equality operator, we put three equals sign here. And if I type here name one equals name one, so is name one equals to itself, that is going to be true. So you're going to see true on the console outputted. So we have true. But if I change name one equals 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 to name two, that is going to return false because they are distinct objects in memory. They are different uh, variables. They are uh, not the same. There is the name one name one variable is not the same variable as name two. So we're going to have false here. So we have false. So this is the difference between a structural versus referential equality. So now I'm going to close this. I'm going to close the console. And uh, having this in mind, uh, we're going to start a discussion about data classes. So let's go down here and let's create our uh, user class because I want to compare two user objects to see if they are structurally equal. So we type user, let's uh, define the primary constructor and let's define three properties for the primary constructor. The first name, the last name and the age. Which is going to be an integer. Now, if I want to check if two user objects are uh, structurally equal, let's first create those objects. So let's delete this code. Let's type val user1 equals. Now let's create our object and let's pass some values to the properties of the constructor. Let's pass here Alex. For the last name, uh, let's put Dobin. And for the age 23. Now let's press Ctrl D to duplicate that line of code and to create the second user object. Let's give a different name to this user 2. Now we go down here. Let's press Ctrl Alt L to format the code. We typed our println because I want to check to see if our users uh, objects are equal, if they are structurally equal. So we type here user 1 equals equals, so the equals to operator user 2. Now if you run this code, what do you think you're going to see in the output? What you'll see in the output is actually that you'll get, we get false. 
and uh, you may be wondering why because if you think about it, they are structurally equal they have the same values for the properties but they are uh, distinct uh, objects but uh, we, we said previously that the equals equals uh, two equals operator is checking for uh, structural equality so why get false here this is because previously the equals to operator is uh, uh, you, it was checking to see if the uh, two strings are structurally equal and the uh, equals to operator is actually a function which is defined inside the any class and the string class what uh, actually was doing when we call the equals to operator it was using its own um, implementation of the equals method so uh, every class that we create in uh, Kotlin it's using it's implicitly inheriting from the any class and because every class that we create it's implicitly inheriting from the any class uh, every class is also going to use the functions which are inside the any class so if you don't override uh, those functions inside your class to provide your own implementation like the string class did for our strings then it's going to use the implicit uh, the is going to use the function which inside which are inside the any class and uh, if you type here user one that and we have uh, equals to string and hash code those three those three functions we are particularly interested in, and the particular we are interested inside the equals they perform uh, when you don't implement in inside your own class those uh, functions again particularly on the equals class the equals class performs only a referential equality so it only checks to see if those two users are the same users and if they're not it's going ret to return uh, false so this is why you get false here because it's uh, calling the function the function which is inside any class so what you have implicitly is something like this so for any class that you, you use or for any class that you declare you have implicitly inherited from the any class and because of that you have those uh, three functions which are uh, defined and if you don't override them to provide your own implementation then it's going to use uh, the code that's inside there so actually if you press control here and if you click it takes us inside the any class so it's clear that this function the equals function is inside the any class so be, because we don't have any functions here so we need to override that function inside our class and we need to provide our own implementation we need to define our own code to determine if uh, two user are uh, when are, when two users are structurally equal this is what we're going to define inside our class so um, let's delete this let's pull the curly braces and actually i'm going to bring an image to show you how the kotlin hierarchy actually looks so this is the image and at the top as you can see we have the any class and then we have our boolean class our string class and then we have our user class and all of those classes that we have here the boolean the string the number they are inheriting from the any class they are um, using the the functions which are defined inside the any class and they uh, override the, they are overriding those methods inside them and they are providing their own implementation for uh, those uh, functions and this is what we need to do also here as you can see they all uh, inherit from the any class implicitly so we need to override them to provide our own implementation for the equals and for the next two because we're going to look at also at the as you saw there you we're going to look also at hash code because uh, equals and hash, hash code are very linked together and also at the two string uh, function so we need to override those uh, inside our class so this is what we're going to do so we we'll go inside our user class and here we need to override the equals function when we type override and while i'm typing you can see that we have three suggestions here and we select the user uh, function because this is the one that we are interested in and as you can see here this uh, function is part of the any class so we press enter we delete the super return and the first thing that we need to check is to see if the current uh, instance the current object that on which this uh, equals uh, function is called it's comparing uh, with itself so we need to check if the the if the object is the same uh, as the object that we are comparing with and to do that we type here if this so if this current object this current instance equals equals so three equals we check for referential equality to see if they are uh, the same equals other so we type other 
And if that is the case, the, if the, we, co we are comparing the same uh, object, so you have user1 equals user1, then we're gonna return true, because that means that uh, we are comparing uh, with uh, the same uh, object. If that is not true, then the, the next thing that we need to check, we, we, we're gonna go down here. So if not, you're not comparing with, uh, it's not comparing with itself, then we need to check if uh, the other, so the object which is passed as an argument to this uh, function, which is called on uh, another object, we need to check if other, so the argument is user, because we, we can, uh, we need to check explicitly to see if this object which is passed as an argument to our uh, equals function is a user uh, object because we don't want to check for a different object we need we need to, to see if this is a user object so only if the um, object which is passed as an argument to the equals function is uh, a user object then we're gonna return true so here we need to type now we need to determine we need to define our logic for what it means for two users to be equal and uh, it's up to you how you define this implementation i'm gonna type here only return so i'm gonna my logic is if they have the same uh, first name the same last name and the same age we're gonna uh, say that they are equal we have uh, the same user of course that in a real app you can have a more uh, complex implementation so we type here return this so this current instance that first name so and then we put two equals other so if so the other is because we check here explicitly to see if this is an user the others also because co this condition is gonna only pass if uh, the other argument is an user so we type other because we have access to the first name and the last name and the age if other that first name so this is our uh, first condition and this that this that uh, last name so gonna check for the all uh, for our three properties equals equals other so other is a uh, user object because we determine that here that last name and this dot age equals equals age so this entire expression that is that we have here is gonna return through only uh, if all the, our three conditions are true. If this that first name is equal to other that first name, so the, to, with the object that is passed as an argument to our equals, and if this that last name is equal to other that last name, and if this that age is, age is equal to the um, other that age, let's put here. Then and only then we're gonna have uh, true here, so it's gonna return true. Otherwise, if w one of those condition fails, it's gonna return false. And down here we need to re if uh, other let's say doesn't pass, so if other is n is not a user, we're gonna return false. So in that case, we're gonna return false. Now if I run this code, look what happens. So previously we had uh, false, and now we have true here and uh, this is because now it's using the equals uh, function which is inside our uh, user class so it's using our own implementation so it's checked here to see if uh, uh, our uh, uh, if first name is equal to other that first name so it's checking uh, so it's using our logic inside the the, the equals uh, function so this is why you get uh, true and uh, you can also now if you press if you hold control here as you can see now it's taking us inside the equals uh, method that we defined here it's not taking it inside the any uh, class this is because now it's using our own implementation so first we check to see if we are uh, dealing with the same uh, object then you're gonna return through you're not gonna go any any uh, not gonna go down and if uh, is, this is false you're gonna come up here we're gonna check to see if other the object which is passed or equals function is a user uh, instance it's a user object then we're gonna check to see if uh, our uh, current object that we are calling on this equals uh, function is equal uh, we check to see for the first name if they are if they, if it's the same we check to see if the last name is the same and we check to see if the age is also the same then in that case we're gonna return true 
and we're gonna say that they are structurally equal so we're gonna see through in the output else if other is not a user so if you pass uh, to the function argument a different uh, parameter a different argument here let's say you pass an integer then it's gonna return uh, false here we're gonna come down here so now if you look here you may be wondering how this syntax works so we have those signs but it's calling the equals function so you can also put that equals if it makes uh, more sense and if we put that equals user too so uh, now you can see that so, but uh, if you hover over here it says replace with the two equals so it's the same thing as having that equals and uh, passing uh, that argument here which is user too so again we are invoking uh, the equals method on the user one object let's press ctrl z and we are passing our user two objects and we are using our logic that we define here to determine if they are equal and we can replace this back to to equals or if it makes more uh, uh, visual sense to put the to use the equals you can use equals it's the same thing so we put user to here so as you can see we are uh, calling uh, the function so this means this object so this object that define here this if uh, when we're saying this that first name it, we, we mean this object so if this that first name it's equal with uh, other other that first name it's then we are calling this object that is passed here as an argument so um, next we will look at, we're gonna look at the next two functions because as I said the, the equals and hash code are uh, very linked together and we're gonna also look at the the two string function and uh, now if I change the first name for the user 2 to John and, and if I run this code it will get false in the output because when it will come uh, inside this if it will check to see if this that first name equals to other that first name and because uh, we're using the end operator and all the condition have to be true this is going to return false so I get false in the output and um, but if I change it back to Alex we'll have true so the objects are structurally equal based on the logic that we defined uh, here inside our equals uh, function and uh, as I said you also I'm gonna also look at equals and hash code because they are very linked together and uh, the rule is when, whenever you override equals you also need to override the the hash code and if two objects are comparing equal so if they are equal based on the equals method that we implemented they also have to have the same hash code and um, I'm not going to go into that but um, this is because they are uh, the hash code is used for performance reasons in collections but uh, we're not going to go now into that uh, we can just type here uh, override and uh, here we just type return zero and this uh, this is not going to affect our equality at all as I said this hash code uh, it will make uh, it m makes more sense to implement the hash code in a different way in uh, collections because they are used um, for performance reasons particularly with uh, hash set and hash maps but uh, for now uh, for our uh, simple class uh, because we don't use this class inside uh, any collections we don't need because uh, we don't uh, don't have to think about that per the performance reasons to of the hash code and uh, just if you want to just uh, just return zero here like I return and uh, yeah because it would work fine it's not, it's not gonna affect uh, at all our uh, equality but remember that rule but uh, that uh, if you override the uh, equals you also have to override the hash code and uh, if two objects are comparing equal they more must have the same hash code this is true as I said particularly in collections not uh, now because we're not using this code inside collection and we can also override the two string method and this two string method is used to return the string representation of the class so we also type here override and we have our two string uh, function I I said method a few times but uh, they are functions not uh, methods methods is a different thing in Java and uh, let's delete this function let's type it again so if you can see 
So this is going to return the string representation of uh, the class. So we need to to return here the values that that are passed to our to our first name and last name and age. And uh, if you don't do that, if you add the print line here and you type user one, let's press Control D and user two, you're going to see just uh, some. Uh, you're gonna see the user and you're gonna see some uh, numbers, but we're not gonna see the string representation of the, those two users. So you're not gonna see Alex, uh, the name and the age. So you see this, uh, those two. But um, to avoid that, because this is also use useful, because previously when we want to um, output in the console the values of the properties, we had to call those properties and uh, to add multiple print uh, lines. But with the two string. Uh, function we can just type here uh, return and we type here user we put uh, parenthesis and here we type first name we put equals we put dollar sign Let's put a single quotation mark, dollar sign, first name. Let's put a quotation mark here, a single quotation mark. Last name equals dollar sign, last name. Let's put inside the single quotation marks this. Comma and age, we put also equals dollar sign age. Now, if you run this code again, now it's gonna use it's gonna when when uh, we are typing user one and user two, it's gonna use the two string function that we defined inside the user class, and it's gonna return the string representation of uh, that uh, specific object. So if you run this code. We get user and get first name Alex, last name Dobin, age 23, and we get for the second user, first name Alex, last name Dobin, age 22. So now we get the string representation of this class, and this is uh, more beautiful because you don't have to al to always type that user one, user one that age, user one that uh, last name, the first name, and so on, and for the second object too, because now it's using the st two string function with uh, our own implementation inside here. So this is how you can use the toString function, and this is also how you can use the hash code. But th as I said, hash code uh, is uh, it's a different uh, discussion which you're gonna have uh, when we're gonna talk about collections. For now, just type return zero here, and everything could all fine. And if you think about, there is uh, a lot of code just to compare uh, two two objects. We have uh, almost uh, 38 line of code just to to determine if two objects, two user objects are equal and uh, also have to override this, uh, not necessarily, but we also override this hash code and the two strings. So there is a lot of code just to do this uh, simple thing to compare it if two user objects are equal. And because Kotlin is about, it's about conciseness, we don't actually need to do all of this stuff, but I, th I, thought, I thought that it is uh, Okay, to explain to you what you will need to do in the past in order to understand what now uh, Kotlin is doing better, respectively data classes. So you don't need to type yourself all of this code that you have here. You can just, so if I delete all of this code, let's copy it first and then delete it. So if I delete all of this code, also the, and now if I run this, now we get false and we get uh, those uh, we get user and this text because now we ha don't have an implementation of the equals of the two string of the hash code and um, if you think as I said it's a lot of code to implement all of that cat and uh, in Kotlin you can just type the data keyword in front of the class and all of that code not specifically the same logic but all of that code that we type there is going to be generated automatically for you so the equals method is going to be generated, the hash code and the two string. And uh, the properties which are going to be included in, inside the implementation of the equals 
of the inside the of the hash code and inside of the two string are going to be all the properties defined inside the property constructor so all the properties defined inside the prop inside the primary constructors are going to be used inside the implementation of the equals of the hash code and the two string so just by putting here the data keyword all of that code all of that logic is going to be implemented uh, for us so if you run this code now so look at this how concise is compared to what we had previously just one line of code and if you, if you run our code with the data keyword now as you can see we have true and we have uh, user first name alex last name so you have the same output as previously and just by putting data keyword all of that was the, all of this code so let's press control z all of this code not specifically exactly this code but all of this code all of the implementation of the equals of the hash code and to was generated automatically for us just by uh, just by putting the data keyword in front of our class and uh, if you don't want to have a property included in the implementation of the of the equals or of the, of the hash code or of the the two string you can just omit it from here and you decide you declare it inside the inside the, the class so if i put let's say here uh, so if i delete this because uh, data classes cannot have uh, parameters and i declare it inside the class inside the data class var age and it will assign a value because we cannot let uh, the property uninitialized let's delete this now and if you run this now that uh, property is going to be excluded from the implementation of the equals the hash code and of uh, the two string so we have here true but we have uh, first name alex last name domain so now the implementation for the equals only includes those properties the first name and the last name and also for the two, two string function we have only the first name and the last name the age is excluded but let's put this back so this is what data classes are they are generating Autom automatically for you the implementation of the equals the hash code the two string also for the copy function and for the component function but we're gonna look at the copy copy function in a separate video and they generate all of that uh, code that we saw pre previously that we talked about automatically for you by just putting the data keyword you put the properties inside the primary constructor and all of that implementation is going to be generated for you for all the properties defined inside the primary constructor and just that just by one line of code all of that logic is generated automatically so this is what data classes are see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about interfaces so what are interfaces interfaces um, are you used when you want to have a commonly used behavior shared among different classes but you don't uh, want to provide the actual code that goes inside the class uh, which is going to implement that interface but you just want to define the the name of the function and the parameter of the function the actual code that uh, goes inside the, the functions that you define in, in inside the interface uh, they are particular to each object that implements that specific interface so let's say that you have uh, let's say that you have um, some classes let's say that you have a class car a class uh, which is uh, which represents uh, a truck and you have a class which represents represents a plane you know that uh, all of those three objects have uh, in, co in common the same uh, behavior of starting the engine let's say and you don't know how each particular class is gonna start the engine but you know that each uh, class is gonna have in common this function which is gonna start the engine again you don't care about uh, the particular how each particular object is gonna uh, what code goes inside or, or what uh, uh, logic goes inside the start, start engine function for uh, each of uh, those particular objects but you care only about the fact that they they share the same uh, behavior they they all start the engine but how they start the engine is uh, particular to each class and uh, this is what uh, we do with interfaces we only define uh, the what so what 
what we define in the interface only the 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 what and the what represents the uh, what uh, those uh, classes are going to have in common so you know that they are uh, going to have a function called start engine but you don't don't know how each object uh, how each class is going to implement uh, that uh, logic and to that to to, to for that I'm going to use an interface so we define what needs to be done but no, we don't define how it's going to be done so to declare an interface we go down here at the enclosing curly brace of uh, the main function and we type interface and while I'm typing you see that we have this uh, suggestion we type we press enter or we can type uh, the entire word if you want so interface and I'm going to call this interface engine and the name of the interface uh, should be with uh, a capital letter should start a capital letter it should be in Pascal case if it has multiple words and uh, interfaces cannot have constructors because they cannot be instantiated you cannot create uh, you cannot create an object with uh, an interface interfaces are used only they are created only to be implemented by classes they cannot be instantiated so we need to put curly braces and inside the the body inside the curly braces we define what needs to be done so we define only the function we define we, de we type the name of the function I'm gonna call it start engine but we don't define the actual code for the function so we put parentheses here you can define parameters if you want but we don't put curly braces and we define our logic here because we only care what about what needs to be done so we only care that each class uh, needs to start the engine how is gonna start the engine it's up to the each particular class so we go down here we type class and I'm gonna create a class called car and it's gonna have a, a val name which is gonna be a string and uh, a val color which is also gonna be a string and now to implement the interface we put colon and we type engine and as you can see we have this uh, engine we have this I for interface here so we press enter then we put curly braces to define the body of the class and now we have this underline here and this underline is here to tell us that we need to in now we need to implement the we need to implement this function because the the interface and the class have a contract it's like a contract and the contract says that if you implement an interface you need to you must implement uh, you must override the, the 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 function so you need to implement the function this is we, this is why we have his, uh, here an underline so if I click on this uh, underline or if I hover over there and I click on the light on the red bulb you see that it says implement members so click on implement and we have our uh, uh, start engine function we click OK and now our functions was overrided here and uh, we have this to do which is not yet implemented and this is there to to tell us that this method uh, this function is not yet implemented so we need to define the actual uh, logic here and let's create two other classes let's um, call this class track and it's also going to have a name a val it's going to be a string and the color also a string and we're going to also implement the interface so we're going to put colon engine then we put curl base now we need to implement because I said there is a contract between the interface and the class and the contract says that you need to implement the function so we implement the function here and we create another class called plane and uh, it's also gonna have a val name it's gonna be a string and uh, a val color also a string and here we put colon and we're gonna also implement the interf interface inside the plane class and we put colon engine our interface then curly braces and now we have the underline because again we there is the contract now between the interface and the class and that says that we need to implement this function inside our plane uh, class and we have those to do and those to do are uh, here to tell us that we need to uh, we need to we need to provide some logic to the to the actual function so let's delete those and let's put some code here 
So let's delete this. And uh, let's add the print uh, line here, which is gonna output some text to the console. And we're gonna have the text, the car is starting the engine. And uh, I'm gonna copy this because now I'm gonna put here some text. I'm gonna say the truck is starting the engine. And here is gonna say the plane is starting the engine. Now, what uh, what we have done here, and uh, what we did here is that we know that each uh, class, respectively, our car, our truck, and our plane, they all gonna start the engine. So they all gonna share this start engine uh, behavior. They all all gonna have this functionality. What we don't know is how each class, how each uh, how each object is gonna start the engine, because they uh, they uh, start the engine in a different way. The engine of uh, of a car is different from an engine of a truck or from a lane. So we know that uh, each uh, each is gonna know that each class or uh, each object is gonna start the engine, but we don't know how they're gonna start the engine. So here inside the actual uh, inside the the function, we, we type the text: the car is starting the engine. The truck is starting the engine and the plane is starting the engine. So they differed in how they start the engine, but you know that they go all gonna they all gonna start the engine. So this is what interfaces allows us to do. You can define an interface if you know that uh, mul multiple uh, related or unrelated uh, classes or objects are gonna have a function shared between them. But you don't know how each particular class or object is gonna is gonna uh, how is gonna how is gonna have the actual code uh, how is gonna write the actual code for that uh, that behavior. So you don't you don't care about the how you only care about the what. So we know that in this case they all start the engine, but they they start the engine in a different way. And uh, you can have here uh, another class, let's say that. Uh, uh, a person which creates another uh, another class and the, the class is gonna co be called Tesla and in that case again you can implement the interface because you know that uh, the Tesla is also gonna start the engine you, you don't know how it's gonna start the engine but you know that uh, it's, it's gonna start the engine and how it's gonna start the engine is uh, specific to a Tesla car so this is what interfaces allow us to do we can define uh, some uh, shared uh, behavior between uh, unrelated or related uh, classes and that the actual code you don't define any code inside the interface you can put you actually can define here a property but uh, uh, usually you just define uh, the the function the function name some parameters and the actual code goes inside the class which implements that uh, interface and let's let's actually create here a class uh, tesla so we put here uh, Let's uh, put this a little bit up. So we put here class Tesla is gonna have also a val name. It's gonna be a string and a val color. And this is also gonna be a string. So now we can implement our engine interface. So we don't know how Tesla is gonna start the engine, but we know that it's gonna start the engine. So we, we implement our interface, we put colon, the name of the interface. And now we need to implement the start engine. So we click on that. And we have not yet implemented. So let's put our print line here. I'm gonna press Ctrl V. And here's gonna say Tesla is starting the engine. So this is what uh, interfaces are. And uh, see you in the next video. Because I'm gonna end in video now. So here it should say uh, Tesla is starting the engine, not uh, the Tesla. So I corrected that. So I thought that it's a good idea to show you a practical example using Android Studio where interfaces are used because the, 
when I first learned about interfaces and abstract classes, I found them very confusing because they are very, um, very abstract, and uh, you don't uh, see when when you somebody teaches uh, you those concepts, you don't see how where, where and where you're gonna use those uh, those uh, concepts, interfaces, and abstract classes. And for that, I'm gonna open Android Studio to show you a practical example using interfaces. And uh, also I'm going to use Android Studio to show you a practical example where we're going to use um, abstract classes. So I open Android Studio, don't need to, it, it looks similar to our IntelliJ ID because it's IntelliJ ID, just that it's, uh, it's Android Studio. So we, put, we click on my application. And here we have uh, this thing called main activity. We don't need to worry about uh, this because, uh, as I said, uh, I just want to show you where interfaces are used in Android Studio to get uh, to get uh, an idea about where uh, they are used. Because as I said they are very abstract. And I already I already set uh, set up some code. So in uh, this this thing called activity that main this is where uh, we put our uh, UI this is where we put our buttons this is where we put our uh, list views uh, this is where we put uh, generally our uh, UI so as you can see we have two buttons here and they have an ID again I'm not gonna go into this but if you click here on design you see that we have a, log a login button and a sign up button so this is the UI part of our uh, app. Now I'm gonna click on this main activity and this is the part where we're gonna put our code. And now I'm gonna link those UI buttons. So let's go to code. So this is the code for creating those buttons. And I'm gonna link those buttons because they have this ID here, login button. So you have here uh, Android ID. And if you come from Android Studio, you already know all of this. I'm gonna link those uh, UI buttons with some objects buttons uh, by typing some code. So I'm gonna define up here a latent var called the login button, and it's gonna be of type button. So this is a class button. Then I'm gonna define another latent because I'm not gonna initialize it right there. So latent again sign up button and it's gonna be also of type button so types like we have types for uh, for our numbers or for our just that this is a class and this this class is a button object and now we need to link those those objects that we created here with those buttons that we have here those UI buttons so to link those login button and sign up button and to do that, to go down here, and I'm gonna, gonna go, I'm gonna do this in the longer way. And here we type login button. Again, you don't need to understand all of this. This is just to illustrate uh, how interfaces work. I'm gonna put equals, and now I'm gonna type find view by ID. And this function find view by ID is gonna link our button object that we created here with our UI button that we have uh, that we have created here. And it's gonna be linked by its ID, by this ID that we have here, login button. So if you go here, here you type R. So R is this thing which, uh, again, don't need to understand all of this. R is, is used to, to get that ID to link our uh, button object with our button UI. So if you put R dot ID dot, and we have our, uh, our two IDs. So we, we choose login button. So now, we have linked our UI button with our button object. So we linked the UI, in other words, with the code. Now let's link uh, also the sign up button. So we type here sign up button equals find view by ID. You, you also type R dot ID dot sign up button. Again, you don't need to type this code because probably you, you don't even have Android Studio. This is just to illustrate something. Now, to illustrate how interfaces work, let's say that I want to, let's say that I want to 
to do something when this login button is clicked and I want to do also something when this sign up button is clicked and, it, and here interferences come into action. What we can do is we can say login button dot and there is a function called set on click listener and this function what is doing is basically se setting a listener on our UI button so that when you click on that button the, a function called on click is going to be executed and uh, the code that is uh, going to be in that function is particular to each uh, to each button so you you you're going to set the interface so you type set on click listener and here you type also this illustrates uh, the object also this by, by this example we also illustrate how the anonymous class is also you type object and now we're gonna inherit us actually gonna implement our interface on click listener and this on click listener interface has a, a function called on click and here we put curly braces and press enter and now here we have this underline and if you click on it you have this red bulb because it wants us to implement to implement that on click uh, function so we're gonna implement that and it says to do not yet implement it and I'm gonna do the same thing for the for the sign up button so I'm gonna copy this I'm gonna paste it down here and I'm gonna change it to sign up button so now each individual each individual button has us on has its own on click listener interface and the code which is going to be executed inside the on click method because this function is going to be triggered when you click on the button is particular to each button so this button is going to log in the user this button you're going to put here the code to sign up the user but you're not going to do that you're just going to we're going to uh, show some uh, text on our uh, emulator so we type here to show the text toast that make text here we need to pass the context so don't worry about all of this main that activity here we need to pass uh, how how long this uh, is gonna show on the screen so we choose uh, short and we put that show to show this on the No, actually here we need to pass uh, the text so what text is going to be shown on the screen so here we're going to say login uh, button clicked and uh, now here we need to pass how long it's going to show so you type toast that short so it's going to be show, shown uh, for a short time and then we need to call sh the show function to show this on the screen and I'm going to press uh, control uh, C to copy this and I'm gonna paste inside our on click function in our uh, interface that we have here for the sign up button and this is gonna say that uh, sign up button was clicked so sign up button clicked now in Android Studio we have uh, what is called an emulator and this is basically a virtual uh, phone and we can run uh, we can run our code and we can and test our code and we're gonna see on on that emulator those buttons and when you're gonna click on those buttons this uh, code that we define here for for uh, those buttons because we linked them so we linked those two buttons that have here the login button the sign up button so this is their UI uh, code this is their XML code you we've linked them through code here and when we click on them the code in each particular object is going to be executed so now if you run our code go up here and uh, I'm going to create now the virtual phone to see our buttons and I'm going to click on them to see how it works I'm going to close those now it's connecting to the emulator and this is our uh, virtual virtual phone so this is uh, the, the virtual phones and he, here we have our uh, UI that we created here so this is what the users 
see so this uh, the what the user see and this is what we see this is the this is what happens under the covers and now if i click on this login button look what happens it says login button click so it executes this on click function inside the login button if i click on the sign up button it says sign up button click because it's executing the on click function and the code inside the on click function for the sign up button and uh, they are uh, as i said uh, linked by the by the id so this is what happens under the covers this is what the user see now this is uh, where interfaces can be used because if you think about you, you can have multiple uh, uis uh, different uis text views uh, lists uh, or uh, uh, items individual items in a list which can be clicked and for all of those you know that always go all all of them are going to have a on click function all 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 have this shared uh, functionality to respond to to a click you don't know how uh, that uh, is gonna how that that on click function is gonna uh, execute or what, or what code that on click function is gonna have for each particular uh, ui uh, uh, ui but you know that each 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 one is gonna have a one click uh, function what is gonna go inside the one click function for each for each particular uh, uh, UI it's up to that uh, specific uh, UI so it's up to a button it's up to a text view so, and so on so this is uh, where interfaces are, are used because we know that they're going to have a shared functionality of one click but we don't know how that functionality is going to be implemented by each particular UI in our case we, do, we know that a login button and a sign up button both both are going to have a, a one click both are going are gonna to respond to click events but you don't know what they're gonna do so this is why you define the interface and the developers who write code gonna implement that interface and you're gonna write the actual implementation for that function which is specific to that uh, object so this is our discussion and if you find this confusing uh, particularly if you find confusing the, the uh, if because i touch a little bit on android studio in our discussion don't be because uh, I just wanted to show you a practical example where uh, interfaces are used using Android Studio. So let's click again on login button. We get our toast, the login button clicked, sign up button clicked. And I can create another button which can be used for, uh, I don't know, if you forgot the password and you, you're going to implement the on click listener, you're going to override, uh, you're going to override the on click function, you're going to write some code to to send uh, to send to help help the user to recover its uh, password and so on so we can see how interfaces can be used practically in this uh, with this example so this is our discussion see you in the next video all right so now it's time to start our discussion about delegation but first i'm going to add the main function here now what is delegation delegation means giving power given authority from one instance from one class to another class and delegation is uh, usually used in, in scenarios where inheritance starts to break. So when inheritance starts to break, when you want, let's say, for whatever reason, to inherit from two classes. In that case, you can't use inheritance because with inheritance, you can you inherit just from only one class. But with delegation, you can plug in multiple uh, implementation of classes in your own class. And let's see how we can do that. So I'm going to create first an interface called uh, A. And it's going to have a function called print. Then I'm going to create another interface called B. And it's going to have a function print too. Then I'm going to create a class. So I'm going to type here class. And it's going to be called first delegate. And it's going to implement the, fun the interface A here. And I'm going to press Ctrl O to override the function print here. And I'm going to create another class called second delegate. And it's going to implement the interface B. So I'm going to press Ctrl O to override the, the function print 2. Now I'm going to create up here a class called app. So class app. 
Now, let's say that I want here to inherit from the first delegate and from the second delegate. So and from the second delegate. And if I type here first delegate, I put parentheses, opening parentheses, closing parentheses. If I put curly braces, uh, now I have an underline because I should mark this as open. So mark this as open and also this uh, as open because I want to show you that. So now, if I want to inherit from the second uh, class called from the second delegate, because let's say that I want to use the, the print to function in my class for whatever reason, I can't because I can't only inherit from one class. So if I hover over here, over this underline, it says only, only one class may appear in a super type list. So another other words, saying that we can only inherit from one class and that is all. We cannot inherit from multiple, multiple classes. Now, with delegation, we can plug in multiple implementations in our own class. So what I can do here, I can say, hey, implement the interface A. So I'm going to inherit from the interface A. But you're going to say use for the interface A the implementation of the first delegate class. So this is what we're saying here. A and the keyword by first delegate, we're saying, hey, use for the interface A the implementation which is provided by the first delegate class. And that will work. Then I'm going to put a comma here and I'm going to say use also for the class B. So I'm going to type for the interface B. So we're, we're going to type B and we're going to use the by keyword. So I'm going to type here by second delegate. So we're saying use for the interface B the second delegate implementation and it's going to use that and it's going to be um, happy with that. So you're going to see that we get no error. And now I can override here both the print function and also the print to function. So if I press control O, now I can override also the print to. And this is inherently very powerful because we can plug in here multiple as many implementations as you want in your uh, class. So this is and uh, if you think about uh, com uh, in contrast with the in inheritance, this is very powerful because here you can plug in as many implementations as you want, and uh, this is very powerful. So this is how you can use uh, delegation in Kotlin. And next we're gonna see how you can use delegation with properties. So to use delegation with properties, first I'm gonna paste some code here. So I'm gonna paste this code here, and what we're having here is a class format delegate, which is inheriting from the read and write property, and it's overriding the get value and the set value. So we are overriding the setter and the getter inside our class, and we provide our own implementation. So whenever you you use the setter to set a value or the getter to get a value, we we are overriding those functions and we provide our own implementation. Next, I'm going to create here up here a class, but first I'm going to delete the code and the interface that we have here because we don't need this code. So I'm going to delete this code and I'm going to create another class. And this class is going to be called user. I'm going to put curly braces and I'm going to define the properties inside the class. So I'm going to type here var first name. So what we are doing now is we're creating a property first. It's called first name. And now I'm going to use the by keyword. So I'm going to say by format delegate. So what we're saying now is use the use the the we use the code which is inside the format delegate whenever you set the value or get the value of the first name. I'm going to put a parenthesis here. Next I'm going to type another var last name and I'm going to type here again by and I'm going to type format delegate. So format delegate and we put parenthesis. So not now what is going to happen is that whenever you set the first name property or we get the name the first name property is going to use our implementation that we provided here this is what we're going to do and the same it will be true for the last name because we are using the delegation here on properties so i'm going to create here a user so i'm going to type here val user i'm going to type equals to user and i'm going to type here with and i'm going to type user this is the scope function, I'm going to put curly, curly braces and I'm going to type here first name equals Alex and the last name equals uh, Dobinka. Now if I output those values in the console, look what happens. So if I type here print line user that first name 
and print line. Let's actually use again uh, the width uh, scope function. Type here width. Let's pass here user curly braces print line first name and print line last name. Now if you run this code you're gonna see that it's using the overriding uh, functions that we provide in our format delegate. So we have in uppercase letters like we defined here we're gonna when we, whenever we set the value gonna be set it with uh, it's gonna change the value to lowercase letters so we get Alex and Obinka in lowercase uh, letters. So this is how you can use uh, delegation on uh, properties and uh, see you in the next video.